Cupcakes and Chaos, Frosted Misfortunes, Book One, written by Lisa Seifert, narrated by Trista Shea. Chapter One. The nonstop doorbell dinging and knocking on the front door woke me out of my peaceful slumber. I slowly peeled myself off my mother's new aesthetically gorgeous, but not meant to be slept in couch that I'd fallen asleep on while watching yet another murder-she-baked movie marathon on the Hallmark Mystery Channel last night. I rolled my head from side to side, attempting to stretch the kinks out of my neck. The couch was so pretty, I thought for sure it would be more comfortable. Oh, how I missed my beautiful king-sized memory foam mattress and perfect ergonomic pillow back in San Diego with my luxurious 600 thread count sheets. I blinked my eyes open and held my hand up to block the light, trying to adjust to the bright morning sunlight. Taking a big inhale, I stood up, yawned, and stretched myself awake. The pounding at the front door was getting more intense. What was so urgent this early on a Saturday morning? My alarm hadn't even gone off. And then I saw it. The dead alarm clock. I hadn't been home in over ten years, so I totally forgot the master light in the TV room was connected to the outlets on that side of the room. I must have killed the alarm clock when I turned off the lights. I ran to the front door and threw it open, ready to tell whomever was there that I didn't have time to deal with them. I've been trying to call you all morning. Did you oversleep? You're late, said Ruby, stating the obvious. Ruby, my best friend, was someone who never suffered from insomnia nor a bad hair day. Her thick chestnut locks cascaded around her perfect heart-shaped face. She polished her look with a faux fur mauve scarf and matching hat and gloves. What time is it? I asked. An hour past when you were supposed to be at the festival? She said. Gwendolyn called my mother, who then called me. And I tried to call you, and now I'm here. My previous adrenaline rush instantly morphed into electric bolts of panic. I brushed my teeth and got dressed at warp speed. I smoothed out my new baker's outfit, pristinely dry-cleaned and smelling of lavender, and was about to put on my makeup before Ruby stopped me. Put it on in the car. I'll drive you to the festival, she said. Great idea! But can you drive me to Frosted? Everything for today is already loaded in the cupcake delivery truck that's parked in the alley out back behind the bakery. I need to drive that to the festival, I said, throwing my makeup bag into my purse. We both descended the stairs two at a time, and I hopped into my Uggs as we ran out the door. We piled into her massively huge SUV, which I was just now realizing matched her scarf and hat. That was a real commitment to a signature personal branding color. I still had a small window of time before the contest registration started. If I were late to check in this morning, I could kiss my job at the bakery goodbye, which wasn't a big deal, except it was the only bakery in town. Francine would surely fire me if I didn't make it there on the dot. Today's baking contest was being sponsored by the national publication Desserts Inc. magazine, and the winner of today's bake-off contest was guaranteed a spot on next month's cover. That was all Francine kept talking about since I met her. She even spent all of yesterday at the spa, getting herself picture-perfect for a close-up. Ruby drove me over to the alley behind Frosted in record time. I gave myself a mental high-five for having the foresight to pack up the cupcake delivery truck last night before I closed up the shop. Everything I needed for today's bake-off contest was in the back. I triple-checked it myself. I so owe you, I said, practically leaping out of Ruby's car before she even came to a complete stop. It's my job as the Watson to your Sherlock, she said, shooing me out of the car. I'll find you at the festival later. I only had 10 minutes to get to a location that normally took 20 minutes without traffic. The festival was being held on the wharf, 
which was beautiful, but not close to the town center where Frosted was located. Plus, parking would be a challenge at the festival in general, and because I had no idea what the zoning rules were for setting up at the wharf. Driving an oversized food truck was not for the faint of heart. I only had this job for a couple weeks now, and I still wasn't used to driving such a behemoth vehicle. Normally a super slow, overly cautious driver, time was not on my side, so I floored it and hoped for the best. Luckily, the roads were deserted. For the first time ever, I saw red and blue lights in my rearview mirror. Yes, I was going a few. All right, maybe a lot of miles over the speed limit. But in my defense, there was absolutely no one else on the highway. And today was a make-it-or-break-it cupcake career day. Step out of the vehicle. Keep your hands where I can see them. Yes, a speeding ticket really sucked, but it was almost 10 o'clock, so if this went quickly, I could still make it in time. Everything went slower than normal in Clover Creek, including festival contest registrations. I gave a small plea to the universe that the cop pulling me over was a friend from high school, or someone else I knew who would let me off with a firm warning. I quickly jumped out of the gas-guzzling cupcake delivery truck, hoping for the quickest ticket delivery in history. My reflection in the car window showed me holding my hands up, awaiting my fate. It wasn't particularly cold for a blustery winter morning in Clover Creek, but at this angle, the wind flew straight up my shirt and chilled me, like one of those deliciously cold scoops of ice cream that Claire, Frosted's biggest and only other dessert competitor, was probably doling out to contest voters right now at the bake-off. The snow crunched under the cop's feet, getting louder as he came closer. I waited until he was right behind me before trying to plead my case. Officer, if you let me off with only a warning, I promise never to speed again, I said with the most sincere and helpless damsel in distress voice I could muster. That's original. Never heard that one before, he said in a way that indicated he was not at all interested in letting me off with just a verbal reproach. A light breeze of patchouli wafted towards me as I turned around, catching me off guard. It smelled like I was on a date, a really hot date. Only men hoping to score were aftershave or cologne that smelled like that. Or maybe it was me. Musky sandalwood scents on men were my weakness. I slowly looked up at the officer standing in front of me. Call me unimaginative, but I expected to see a chubby middle-aged cop when I turned around. Instead, standing in front of me was a cross between Adonis and Hercules. No way anyone could ever mistake this guy for an out-of-shape anything. Even though he was wearing the uniform, carrying the stick, and driving the car, He did not look at all like any cop I ever met. He was more like a stripper for hire heading to a bachelorette party. That he did resemble. I waited a beat, but he kept all of his clothes on. Not a stripper. Even with his bulky winter coat, his broad muscular delts came out loud and clear through the tapered V his shoulders created. His unbuttoned coat revealed a brawny barrel chest, leading to what I could only imagine were chiseled abs of steel. His badge read, Officer Lockwood. Like a crazy person, I immediately tested out my first name with Lockwood as my last name, to see how it sounded. Ava Lockwood. I willed myself to stop staring, but my eyes were on permanent surveillance. There was an electric current in the air pulling me closer. I inched towards him, unable to put the brakes on. Whatever he was selling, I was more than eager to buy. He put his hands on his hips, right above his holster. There was a small bandage sticking out from his side. I couldn't tell if it was a brace or a super large band-aid of some sort. He was going for intimidation, but all I saw were washboard-covered abs attached to a pair of sturdy, well-built legs. 
he was as close to an aesthetically perfect copy of the David statue as I've ever seen. No wedding ring on the left hand. Always a positive sign. He bent over, putting his face where his waist was. See something interesting? We might as well have been in the Caribbean for how hot my cheeks burned at that moment. I was wondering how you got that injury. Was it in the line of duty? Geez, that was lame. A brief smile passed his lips, which meant he knew I was not looking at his bandage, nor admiring it in any way. He cleared his throat and resumed his tough guy demeanor. Bullet wound. Just a graze from last month's bank robbery, he said. It's fine. He pulled his jacket further down to cover it up. What was wrong with my brain? I swore off all men after being left at the altar only a month ago. Did sleep deprivation make you boy crazy? Focus, Decker. You need to get to the bake-off contest. Soon. Very, very soon. You must be very brave and rise above wasting time on traffic control, I said, trying to appeal to his male ego. He responded with a deadpan expression and completely ignored me. License and registration. I really had to work on my flirting skills. In my defense, I'd been dating Ben for the last ten years. The last time I flirted with anyone new was in high school. And those were boys, not men. I reached into the glove box and my purse on the passenger side and handed the items back to him with shaking hands, wondering how long this would take. Ava Decker, he said, reading my name off my license. Want to tell me why you were going 70 to 50 mile an hour zone? What's the big hurry on a Saturday morning? Yes, I'm really sorry about that. I said, pressing my hands to my chest, to help demonstrate my deep desire to convince him to let me go. I'm running late for the delicious desserts bake-off contest down by the wharf this morning. Normally, I never exceed the speed limit. Was it too early to ask again about getting a warning? Preferably a verbal one? Wow, that's some sweet tooth you have, he said. Great although it wasn't entirely false. I could totally see myself doing that if the situation called for it, like I did right after being left at the altar just a few weeks ago. I started to point to the cupcake truck signage to prove I wasn't just a sugar-addicted crazed woman racing through town from one sugar event to the next, but the truck was a solid baby blue color. Francine's brother gave her this truck as a birthday gift last week, so she could expand and sell her cupcakes in different areas of Blueberry Bay once the warmer summer months arrived. But since it was only February, getting a logo painted on the truck wasn't high on the winter priority list of tasks for the shop. I like sugar just as much as the next person, but I'm not rushing there to eat. I'm one of the Bake Off contestants. Or, I mean, I work for one of them. I said... You're a baker, huh? He asked. I could have sworn I saw a glint in his eye when I said that. It was the same look of excitement I had whenever anyone mentioned pastries, chocolate, ice cream, or anything sugar-based. I found a fellow sweet tooth aficionado. Yes, would you like a sample? I asked, hoping that would butter him up enough to let me go. I motioned towards the back of the truck, which was filled with some of my special chocolate bourbon pecan pie and Bavarian cream-filled cupcakes for today's bake-off competition. No one could eat one of those and still want to give me a ticket. Is that a bribe? He asked, raising an eyebrow and cracking the slightest beginning of a smile. Maybe we could call it evidence. Like... Exhibit A to prove that I really am a baker and totally running late to the world's most important baking contest of my life. Otherwise, I would have never and will never speed again in my life. If you let me off with a verbal warning kind of evidence? I asked. 
I walked towards the back of the truck. Stay right there, ma'am, he said, taking the keys from me. I'll open the door. Wow, did he just ma'am me? I wasn't looking my best today, but I was barely pushing 30, not 80. In addition to making me boy crazy, sleep deprivation also rendered me delusional, because I could have sworn there was a spark between us earlier. Albeit a small, possibly nano-level spark, but definitely not a Mrs. Robinson ma'am type of situation. I was only 29, and he couldn't have been much younger than that. After he opened the door, I heard a sharp intake of breath. Oh no, did all the cupcakes topple over in my crazy haste to get to the wharf? I had no idea how this monster vehicle operated under different driving conditions. There were a few potholes in the road on the way out here, and the alley wasn't exactly smooth pavement central. Hands behind your head, interlace your fingers. He said, in a super serious, no longer flighty flirty voice. What? I asked, unable to think of anything more coherent or intelligent to say. You're under arrest, he said. Officer, this isn't what it looks like, I said, remembering Francine's crazy idea to bribe the judges with cash. She had a huge wad in a big package that she tried to pawn off on me the other day. I told her no, but she must have snuck it into the back of the truck. A huge packet of cash looked weird to anyone. Right, and I'm not really a cop. It just looks like I am, he said. But I can explain. That's not mine. It's my boss's, I said. She put it in there last night. The dead body. That's hers? He asked. What? I demanded. Did he just say, dead body? Did sleep deprivation also jumble up words in your brain? I peered around the corner and there she was. Francine Donovan, with her beloved custom-made cake-cutting knife, plunged into her back. The word frosted was engraved on the handle. The air caught in my lungs. My heart immediately sunk into my chest and a cascade of tears streamed down my cheeks. Not that she was ever for a single moment nice to me, but this was nothing less than horrible. Who would do such a thing? I asked, silently sobbing my eyes out, until I felt a cold pair of metal rings being tightened around my wrists. Chapter 2 Normally I'd call my parents to bail me out, but they were on the other side of the world enjoying a three-month cruise that was originally my honeymoon plans until my groom ghosted me at the altar. Ruby would soon regret her initial joy at my return home to Clover Creek. She had to stop whatever she was doing to save me yet again today. A good three hours passed by the time she got there. I caught a glimpse of a blotchy, mascara-streaked face staring back at me. Some super-fancy, talented lawyer and one of Ruby's insurance firm clients just happened to be at the festival with her that morning. He got me released within an hour of his arrival. If I owed her big time before for getting me up this morning, I owed her double that now for getting me out of jail. Maybe it would have been better if I just slept through the entire festival. The three of us sat in a holding room together waiting for my official release papers before we could leave. Thank you so much for getting me out of there, I said to the lawyer, shaking his hand. You're welcome. I'm happy to reciprocate. Ruby has helped our firm out of a jam more times than I can count. She's quite the master financial guru, he said with a warm smile. He pulled out a yellow legal pad in his pen. That was a pretty impressive compliment. I knew Ruby was smart, but we never really talked about work-related stuff, so I honestly had no idea what she did every day, much less all the heroic customer rescues she was quietly performing. What was your name again? I asked. He was quite handsome for a lawyer, and despite knowing better, I caught myself checking out his wedding ring finger. 
Where were all these good-looking, career-focused men when I was growing up here? Maybe I wouldn't have left if there were more of them then. Charles Longfellow, partner at Fulton, Thompson & Associates. He handed me his card. Thanks to both of you for getting me out, but I swear I didn't kill her. I insisted. It would really help me to prepare your defense if you told me everything now. And I can assure you that everything you say remains strictly between us, client-attorney confidentiality. He said. Of course she didn't kill anyone, Ruby said, coming to my defense. Then she leaned in and whispered. You didn't, right? You can tell me. I promise I won't judge you. If you even knew half of the things I've done since you've moved away. She gave me a knowing wink. Oh my gosh, no! I practically screamed. Now I became curious to know what Ruby was up to during the last decade. Do you have any idea who might have wanted to kill your boss? He asked, pulling out his pen and legal pad. Any other leads we could give to the police would be very useful. Practically everyone who knew her. Francine's personality was like acid. It stung and left its mark so you tried to avoid her at all costs. Who didn't? I said. I told him about the fight I walked in on the day before between her and Claire, the ice cream shop owner across the street, but couldn't think of anyone else specifically. Do you know what they were fighting over? He asked. Francine and Claire were arguing over a missing cookbook. Francine accused Claire of stealing it, but Claire owns an ice cream shop and we don't make ice cream, so I'm not sure what use Claire would have for our recipe book. I said. Was it valuable? Like a rare collector's item, or did it hold trade secrets? He asked. Those were very good legal questions. When I overheard them arguing about it, I just assumed Claire took it out of petty revenge. I don't think so, I said. If Francine had a recipe book of any kind, I've never seen it. In fact, she was actually a terrible baker. She confessed that when she was caught between bakers before, she simply went to other bakery shops in Bangor, bought up all of their cupcakes and passed them off as her own. So the joke was on Claire or whoever took the book. It was probably useless. Are there any other friends or employees that might have stolen this recipe book? He asked. I'm her only employee. Claire was Francine's only friend. Or at least she was, until Francine stole her boyfriend. That pretty much ended their friendship. I said. That's what I heard through the rumor mill. The whole boyfriend stealing debacle took place the month before, when I was still in San Diego. Apparently, January was a bad romance month for lots of people. What about the boyfriend? Do you think he could have done it? He asked. Was he the jealous type? Were the two of them not getting along? Niles was such a nice guy. I couldn't even believe the stories I'd heard about him dumping Claire for her best friend Francine. They were super busy planning the wedding and Francine always made such a huge event of showing off her massively large diamond and fawning all over Niles whenever they were together, I said. Secretly, I think she was hoping that Claire could see them from her ice cream shop down the street, or that someone would flash a picture or video of them and post it. The first question we always ask in insurance investigations is who stood to benefit the most from Francine's death, announced Ruby. The boyfriend or husband is always the first person they suspect, said Charles. I'm sure the police are looking into him. The only thing I knew about the Clover Creek Police Department was that it was pretty tiny. Our entire town consisted of only about 5,000 residents. I would have been surprised if that were large enough to warrant keeping a detective on staff. His family owns pretty much all of the commercial real estate in Clover Creek. They're loaded. Even if Niles did acquire the bakery, it would only be a tiny blip in his portfolio, said Ruby. 
Of course, another incredibly good-looking eligible bachelor with a solid future career under him. Seriously, where were all of these men when I lived here? Maybe our town wasn't so small. Her brother, Grant, is her only living relative that I know of, and he would have inherited the bakery, but he's just like Niles. Grant owns a super successful luxury car dealership, like those ones with the fancy horse emblems on them, I said. I had no clue about cars, but I knew that just one car from his lot cost more than I made in an entire year. He was always flush with cash. I would know. He stuffed a 50 into the tip jar every time he came to the bakery. We were missing something here. I wished I'd paid more attention to Francine's life. I was so focused on continuing to wallow in my own San Diego-induced self-pity that I barely took the time to get to know anyone. When was the last time you saw Francine? He asked. You mean other than today? I asked. When was the last time you saw her alive? He asked, rephrasing his question. Right after her brother left the bakery yesterday around 9 a.m., she took off for the spa in Bangor to get ready for today's baking contest, I said. And when were you last in the back of the cupcake truck, where the body was found? He asked. Getting right to the point. I liked this lawyer. He seemed very capable and right on top of everything. I closed up the shop on my own yesterday around five, loaded up the cupcake truck with supplies and ingredients right after that, and went home. I didn't go into the back of the truck again until about ten minutes before Officer Lockwood pulled me over. I was running late this morning, so I just got into the truck and drove away as soon as Ruby dropped me off there. I said, According to the police, there were no fingerprints on the murder weapon, and the coroner estimates the time of death at around 9 a.m. this morning. Do you have an alibi for then? Asked Charles. I was sleeping at my parents' house, I said. So your parents will vouch for that, he asked. They could if they weren't on my honeymoon, I said. He gave me a weird look. It's a long story. They're on a cruise ship somewhere in the Mediterranean right now, so no, no one can verify my alibi. In all the mystery shows I'd watched, not having an alibi was actually a good thing. Only the guilty devise an ironclad alibi ahead of time. That's okay, he said, looking back over his notes. We have enough other suspects to cast reasonable doubt. If this goes to trial, which I seriously doubt, it will be based on the circumstantial evidence they have right now. So I should try solving the murder myself, right? I asked. That wasn't what I said, replied Charles. Once on Murder, She Baked, the main character was accused of killing another baker because she was found with the body before she had time to call the police. Naturally, everyone assumed she was the killer, so she had to solve the murder herself. It felt like that was where this was leading. In fact, I fell asleep right in the middle of watching that exact episode last night. If that weren't a sign, I didn't know what was. I had pretty much every single episode of Monk, Psych, Castle, and Murder, She Wrote committed to memory, along with all the new mystery movies on the Hallmark Movies and Mystery Channel. Let's let the police handle this, said Ruby, always the voice of reason. We're dealing with a real killer here, not a fictional one on one of your TV shows. No offense, Ava, but I just don't want you getting hurt. Oh, yes, of course, I said without really meaning it. When it came to movie night, Ruby always opted for romantic comedies or anything with a wedding in it. I may have missed my calling as a pastry chef, but she totally missed hers as a wedding planner. When we graduated high school, we each chose sensible, safe paths. I became a CPA and joined an accounting firm, while Ruby earned her CFA and joined her family's insurance business. Another police officer came in with my stuff to let me know that I was now free to go. Charles looked over the release papers while I went through my belongings to make sure everything was there. 
It looks like they're retaining the cupcake truck and keys as evidence, said Charles. Thank God. If I never saw that truck again, it would be too soon. We headed out of the police station, where it was even colder now than this morning. What should I do with the keys to Frosted? Just give them to her brother, Grant? I asked Charles. I didn't want to be accused of trying to steal the bakery. Poor Grant. He argued with Francine all the time, but that was probably normal for siblings. As an only child, I would have loved to have a big brother. He was probably taking this the hardest. Or at least, as hard as her fiancé, Niles. Who's the landlord? He asked. Francine inherited the building from her grandmother, I said. That much I knew, because it was usually the main crux of their arguments. Fighting over what to do with the land. Grant wanted her to sell it, but Francine was super close to her grandmother, who made Francine promise she would never sell it. You forgot something before you left, called out a strong, deep voice from the police station behind us. I knew that voice. I turned around to find Officer Lockwood coming down the stairs with a cardboard box in his hand. Like a true knight in shining armor, Charles stepped forward, blocking Officer Lockwood's path and handing him his business card. If you'd like to speak to my client, you can make an appointment with our office. She's already given her statement to the police, said Charles. Not necessary. I'm only here to return your cat. We examined her and there's no evidence on her, so we doubt she's the murderer. He said with the same flirty grin from before. He tried to hand me the cardboard box with holes in it. I threw my hands up in the air. I don't own a cat, I said, not wanting to touch the box. I could barely take care of myself these days, much less another living being. Plus, I was unemployed. How could I afford kitty kibble on a salary of zero? My parents weren't really the pet-loving type, so we never had any pets growing up. I wasn't even allowed to get a fish. I wouldn't have the first clue what to do with a cat. But it was in the truck, your cupcake truck, said Officer Lockwood, as if that explained everything. The cupcake truck belongs to Francine. Was this some type of weird police interrogation to get me to slip up and reveal something? And I can assure you Francine hated animals, along with most people. Aw, she's so cute! Ruby cooed at the cat from outside the holes, poking her fingers in and making baby sounds at it. Do you want to come home with us? She asked. No, she doesn't want to come home with us. She's someone else's cat, I said. Hmm, that's interesting. Officer Lockwood lifted up the pet carrier and looked inside quizzically at the cat, as if it would give him a clue to its identity. All right, so your official statement is that you do not own this cat? He asked. He popped open the top, and a cute little ruddy head popped out. Green almond-shaped eyes stared back at me, a little scared but also very curious. That's right. I crossed my arms for extra emphasis. The cat let out the world's tiniest little meow, and my heart started melting. Okay, he said. A cute little kitten paw reached out towards me when he came closer, but Officer Lockwood pushed her back down and closed the top of the box. He turned and headed back toward the door. Wait! What will happen to the cat? I asked, running up the stairs after him. It's likely just a stray that was hungry and cold, smelled the cupcakes, jumped into the truck during the murder, and then got stuck there until the police discovered him, said Charles. Can't you scan her microchip to find her owner? I asked. No microchip. Animal Control said she's only seven weeks old, and standard protocol is to destroy any animals too young to be adopted out said Officer Lockwood with a nonchalant shrug. Ruby and I both let out a horrified gasp. I told them I thought the cat was yours, but I guess since it's not, I'll have to turn it over to them, he said. 
You know what? I'm not wearing my glasses. That is totally my cat. I said, already reaching out for the cardboard box. What was I doing? I didn't even want a cat. Why did he say they would kill it? Officer Lockwood gave me a wink and a smile. Well, I always enjoy reuniting families back together. Have a nice day. I think he just tricked you into adopting that cat, said Ruby. He so did. I pulled her out and tucked her into my coat where it was warmer. She instantly snuggled into my neck and licked my face. Well, you know what you have to do next, said Ruby. What? I asked. Give her a name, she said. Since it's obviously your pet and all. My girlfriend is sort of a pet detective. I bet she could track down her owner, Charles said, snapping a photo with his phone. My heart instantly plummeted to my stomach. I only held the cat for a few seconds, but the thought of losing her was devastating. You're really a full-service lawyer, huh? I asked. Charles chuckled. She's really my girlfriend, and a genius when it comes to pets. Seeing how you didn't seem very excited about getting stuck with the cat, I thought she could try to track down her original owner. Well, I've reconsidered it, and now I think I'll keep her. No need to track down her original owner, I said, squeezing the kitten even closer to me. Even if that owner is a murderer? asked Charles. Especially if the owner is a murderer? I said, kissing the kitten. What if he hurts the kitten since she's the only witness? I asked. Even as I said those words, I knew they were crazy. But I couldn't lose this little furry ball of cuteness. Well, technically you're a suspected murderer, said Charles. I drew a sharp intake of breath. Ruby intervened. I think what Charles meant to say was his number one priority is solving your case, and if finding the original owner helps to shed some light on the case, then that's what we should do. Charles shrugged. Yes, what Ruby said. That's a very lucky cat to survive winter temperatures in a truck overnight. She's lucky we had unusually warm weather last night. You, my little furry friend, are the world's luckiest cat, I said, looking into her almond eyes. Then I realized the perfect name for her. Lucky. I opened the box for her to crawl back in, but she took one look and burrowed further into my coat. So I left her where she was. A few minutes later, we were at the grocery store, buying a litter box, kitty litter, and some cat food. Chapter 3 I dreamed that I was sleeping with a super soft fur scarf wrapped around me, but I woke up and realized it was just a kitten stretched out across my neck. I picked up my phone to check the time. It was almost 9 a.m. I guessed she was not a morning person either, which was perfect. We could sleep in together. For a brief moment, I panicked and worried about being late to open Frosted. Until I remembered. Did yesterday really even happen? If it weren't for the kitten draped across my neck, I might have worried that I hallucinated the entire day. I really had to look into curing this insomnia problem if I ever found another job. I nudged the kitten a little and she instantly started purring, slowly blinking her cute little eyes open and letting out an adorable little kitty yawn. She was so small and tiny that my only thoughts were protecting her and keeping her safe. I never considered myself a pet person, but maybe I was. I kind of loved this little person already. Was this the feline equivalent of puppy love? I was super late to meet up with Ruby. I fed Lucky and left her in the TV room to be safe. I cleared out as many knickknacks from there as I could after she demolished my mother's precious moments figurines by walking across the ledge. I dreaded that discovery when they returned from their cruise. All right, I'm heading out to run some errands and then I'll be back this afternoon, I said. Wow, was I really talking to a cat? The drive from my place to Ruby's was about 15 minutes. 
Ruby greeted me at her door with her normal dose of irresistible charm and her infectious, bubbly attitude. It was a huge part of the reason I loved being around her. A bright, sunny disposition did wonders when you were contemplating jail for the rest of your life for a murder you didn't commit. Finally, she said, opening her new glass double doors wider for me to enter. It was a dramatic change from the rustic wooden door that was lying in her yard, unceremoniously discarded, with various bathroom cabinets and fixtures. I was about to come over and check on you. Again, you were supposed to be here over an hour ago for a morning run. Sorry about that, I said, kicking the snow off my boots before walking in. Another mystery marathon movie night? She asked, even though she already knew the answer. That, and I was a little preoccupied with my new status. Being the prime suspect in a murder investigation? I said. I did have to polish my crime-solving skills now that I needed to unravel this murder and clear my name. You're innocent, and the police will arrest the real murderer any day now. In the meantime, you can enjoy one of my famous green spirulina breakfast smoothies, she said. Oh, right. No one innocent ever went to jail for a crime they didn't commit, I said. Ruby shot me a disapproving look. Let's focus on the positive. People can surprise you. Like my kitchen, for instance. The contractor finished earlier than anticipated. Come look at it. I followed her into the kitchen, which was a shrine to all things marble and silver. There was a huge chef's table island complete with six broilers, a heating pad in the middle, and an overhead silver hood. She had an extra large Vitamix blender on one side, with a cornucopia of produce section greens on the other. Your kitchen looks fabulous, I said, taking a seat in one of the white padded high chairs on the other side of the island. I hadn't been here since the contractor started working on it. Are they bringing the fridge later today? No, it's right here, she said, walking over to one of the white paneled walls and giving it a small push until it popped out and revealed the interior of a massively large fridge. The new style is to hide everything. So the fridge, the cabinets, the pantry, and the drawers are all white push-in panels with no chunky handles. She demonstrated by opening a few more white rectangular panels on the wall behind her. That's so fancy, I said. It should be for the half million it costs for the remodel, she said. Five hundred thousand wouldn't get you much back in San Diego, but in Clover Creek, you could afford a whole mansion at that price. I guessed business was going well at Hardison Insurance. Listlessly wallowing in my self-pity these last couple weeks, I forgot to ask about how her life as the new CEO of her dad's insurance brokerage firm was going. Unlike me, she never left town after high school. She attended University of Maine right up the street and then joined her father's insurance firm. He retired earlier this year and handed the reins to Ruby. Wouldn't it have been cheaper just to buy a brand new house? I asked. I wish. When I inherited this place from my grandmother, she put a special clause in the lease that only a Hardison could own, rent, or live in it. Hence squashing any landlord or sales dreams I might have had, she said. But she never said anything about remodeling it. Ruby's grandmother was all about the family legacy. She was incredibly proud of the Hardison family tree, and even made me an honorary Hardison. So, in theory, I could buy this place from Ruby. But after all the wedding bills Ben left me owing, I'd be lucky to afford some more kitty kibble, now that I had another mouth to feed. Fortunately, I could continue house-sitting my parents' home while they enjoyed my non-refundable cruise around the world. It was the dream honeymoon that Ben insisted we go on after promising he would pay me back, but never did. It was the same house I grew up in, and a lot like Ruby's inherited house from her grandmother. An older colonial style with light-colored brick on the outside, and hardwood floors and crown molding on the inside. It was also the home of the world's largest knick-knack collection ever. My mother was obsessed with covering every blank or open space with some sort of decoration, picture frame, trophy, or plant. Watching the inevitable kitty destruction 
left in Lucky's exploratory wake throughout the house. I hoped my mother was busy restocking her inventory with new trinkets during her travels. A clean, simple, modern look like the new interior Ruby had in mind would have horrified my mother. Hopefully Ruby was already preparing herself for the onslaught of housewarming knick-knack wall decorations my mother was sure to bring over. Ruby was like her second daughter, and all decker women required a gazillion knick-knacks, according to my mother. Well, it looks fabulous. I can't wait to see when it's all done, I said. Yes, it's going to be great, just like your new life back here in Clover Creek. The police will find the real murderer, and you'll land a new, even better pastry chef job somewhere else, she said, handing me a newly poured green smoothie. Plus, we should so celebrate your new little fur baby. Eating healthy green smoothies wasn't really my thing. Normally, I was more of a drive through McDonald's breakfast burrito and hash brown type of girl. A box of donut holes, chocolate croissants, or Nutella crepes were other delicious alternatives. Carbs were my friend. But considering Ruby's newly acquired set of six-pack abs and ripped muscular everything since I last saw her, I figured I'd give her green liquid thing a try. Yes, here's to Lucky, the luckiest cat in the world, I said, clicking smoothie glasses with her. Eating healthy was not on my priority list or any other kind of list. My food-related lists mostly consisted of cupcakes, brownies, cheesecakes, muffins, lava cakes, cookies, ice cream, and the occasional chocolate fondue, especially on my birthday. And that was exactly what my taste buds were used to and expecting. So when the bitter sting of Ruby's garden-infused green smoothie hit my tongue, there was an instant gag reflex that I had to suppress. Not sure what I was expecting it to taste like, but this was not it. It tasted like the dregs came from a lawnmower. Do you love it? Asked Ruby, tossing back her own glass in three more big gulps. I blinked back some tears of nausea and cleared my throat. <clears throat> yes, just going to savor it. I held the glass close to my chest in a mock show of affection. Awesome! Don't worry, I know yesterday was just awful, but everything will work out, I promise, she said. Ruby came over and enveloped me in one of her endearing but suffocating bear hugs. Yup, it will, I said, hugging her back. Because I intended to solve the murder and bring the real killer to justice. I loved Maine and I always intended to move back home, but on my own terms. Not because I was too embarrassed to show my face in San Diego, or because I was ordered not to leave town by the police as their prime murderer suspect. This is really all Ben's fault, she said. I wasn't sure who despised him more, my parents or Ruby. I was so done crying over him. How do you figure? I asked. I hadn't seen or talked to him since the night before the wedding that never happened. If Ben hadn't ghosted you at the altar, then you wouldn't have moved back home, surrounded by cupcakes every day at Frosted, which you ate to console yourself, and you wouldn't have been there to get the new job when it opened up. And if you never worked there, then you never would have been driving that cupcake truck with the dead body inside. That was one way to look at it. My love of cupcakes put me in the right place at the right time to land a job at the bakery. I only started working at Frosted a couple weeks ago. Francine and my predecessor at Frosted were arguing in front of everyone at the cupcake shop one morning while I was there. After some choice words from Francine, the head baker quit on the spot, even though a huge order was due that night. Luckily, Francine accepted my offer to fill in, and I helped her complete the order and remained there ever since. I'm pretty sure the only person we should be blaming is the actual killer. And thank you for finding that amazing hot lawyer and getting me out of jail so quickly, I said. How is it you're not dating him? He was so Ruby's type. Nice, tall, good-looking, smart, and a great job. All right, maybe that was almost every girl's type. I know, right? 
Apparently he's taken. But what about Officer McHotty with the kitty cat delivery box? I was saved by a knock at the door. That's probably the plumber, she said. I actually have to get going. I'm supposed to meet Grant at Frosted this morning to return the keys to him, I said. Wait, I'll go with you. This'll be really quick, she said. She flipped her perfect chestnut hair over her shoulders after shrugging her stylish winter jacket and Uggs on. Despite doing a one-hour run outside earlier this morning, Ruby looked like she just had a professional blowout and visited a Hollywood makeup artist. Meanwhile, I still had a huge crease in the side of my face from falling asleep on the edge of the couch last night during another mystery movie marathon on the Hallmark Mystery Channel. I gave her a thumbs up and waited until she was out the door before tossing the rest of my green chunky soup down her fancy-looking garbage disposal. Six-pack abs were totally overrated, and in this winter tundra, who could see them anyway? It was only 9.30 a.m., if I left now, I'd still have time to run by the deli to grab a cheesy egg sandwich and some hash browns before I had to meet Grant at Frosted. The guilt over dumping her smoothie down the drain forced me to wash and dry all her Vitamix smoothie appliances. I also put away the produce and wiped down the counters. Ruby, the fridge door is ajar, called out a man's voice when I closed the fridge door. Who's there? I asked. Did Ruby have a new boyfriend I didn't know about? I am Bixby, your smart refrigerator, the voice responded. Whoa, her fridge answered me. Sorry, Bixby, I'll fix that, I replied. Did I just apologize to a kitchen appliance? First time talking to cats, and now I'm apologizing to appliances. I closed the fridge door twice, just to be extra sure. Ruby popped her head back into the kitchen. Hey, do you care if I stay with you at your parents' place? The plumber is turning off the water for the next couple days to replace the pipes. She asked. Yes, of course. Like you have to ask. Stay as long as you want. I said. I could use the company, but hopefully the Vitamix blender in all its ingredients would stay safely ensconced with Bixby. Chapter 4 Ruby couldn't come with me after all. She got tied up with another contractor, which was perfect. I could already taste those golden, crispy hash browns. I left my car at Ruby's and walked to Frosted. We planned to meet back at her place after I finished my meeting with Grant. Frosted was only a ten-minute walk from Ruby's front door. The Hardisons and the Duckers were both founding families of Clover Creek almost a hundred years ago. But the Hardisons were businessmen who lived closer to the center of town, and the Duckers were farmers, so we lived a little further out. We hadn't farmed for decades, but my mother preferred the quiet countryside. The serene and peaceful tree-lined walk was the polar opposite of the loud, rambunctious oceanfront beach bungalow Ben and I shared in San Diego. The huge, spacious yards, covered with a fresh layer of newly fallen white snow, made it almost magical compared to the crowded, yard-free concrete neighborhoods I got used to in Southern California, a place where real estate is too precious to waste on greenery of any kind. Despite my initial sadness for the complete lack of sandy white beaches and palm trees, the thought of living back in Clover Creek started to grow on me. I even began to enjoy the crisp winter air that woke me up better than any cup of coffee ever could. Frosted was right in the center of the town square, which was the closest that Clover Creek came to having a downtown area. But instead of resembling a bustling city center, it looked more like a scene out of the 1950s TV show, Leave it to Beaver, complete with a beautiful, ornately decorated gazebo and a wishing fountain in the center. Good morning, ladies! I called out to what could only be described as the real grandmothers of Clover Creek. They called themselves the Clover Leafs. I blamed our close proximity to Canada for the grammatical error resembling maple leaves instead of leaves. Aside from the improper use of the word leaves, everything else about them was perfect. Their perfectly coiffed hair, 
their impeccably applied makeup that would rival any millennial beauty vlogger channel, their amazingly trendy and stylish clothes, despite their advanced years, their immaculate manicures hiding under their designer gloves, and the expensive jewelry dripping off them. They were what we called old money in Maine, and all were descendants from the Maine Lobster Dynasty, the state's primary export and a huge cash cow. From what I knew about them growing up, they ran this town, at least the social side of things. They hosted pretty much all the major town events, functions, charities, and festivals. And they knew everything about everyone. By now, they would have heard about Francine's murder. Gwendolyn was the one who called Ruby's mother to get me up for the bake-off contest yesterday. Oh, Ava, you poor dear, said Gwendolyn, the top leaf in the clover leaf food chain. She came over and hugged me. I heard you were found with the body, and now they think you're the murderer. I didn't kill her, I said, which was obviously what she wanted to know. Half of their faces said they believed me, and the other half looked like they weren't so sure. I probably have to get used to that. It was the same look I'd soon be getting all around town for the foreseeable future. Of course you didn't, she said, clasping her hands together. Don't worry, dear. I'm sure the truth will come out. It always does. What was I doing? This group knew everything. If anyone knew who might have wanted to kill Francine, they would. Did you know Francine well? I only started working for her two weeks ago, I said, waiting for the deluge of information I knew she was dying to share. Her grandmother used to be one of the Cloverleafs, She's actually named after her, Gwendolyn said. They were very close, seeing how Francine's mother left her when she was just a kid. I didn't know that Francine and Grant grew up without a mother. That's so sad, I said. Not that it excused Francine's rude behavior to everyone she met, but it did shine the light on why she was the way she was. Oh, not Grant. Francine's father married Grant's mother right after Francine's mom disappeared, she said. Francine went to live with her grandmother and rarely saw her father anymore. Double whammy. Your mother deserts you and then your father forgets all about you in favor of a new family? How did I not know that? I guessed it was probably old news by now. Francine was almost 40 years old. She spoke fondly of her grandmother all the time, but I figured that was only because they were really close, not because she didn't have any other positive family memories. But it seems like she and Grant were really close, I asked. She leaned in and whispered. That was only recently, after Francine's grandmother died last month and left her at the bakery. Before that, Grant never really showed much interest in Francine. I stared back and gave her a confused look. But he seemed so nice, I said. Every time he came into the shop, he always asked me how things were going at the bakery, bought a ton of cupcakes, and dropped nothing less than a 50 in the tip jar. He came into the shop every single day since I moved back. I thought they were really close, and more importantly, that he was the greatest brother ever. He owned a luxury sports car dealership, and every morning... He bought a huge spread of cupcakes that he took back to the dealership for his staff and customers. Family can be weird that way, she said. Speaking of family, did you know that your grandmother, Betty Lou, was a clover leaf? Really? I had no idea, I said. We weren't wealthy or from any kind of old money that I knew of. So I wasn't sure how my dad's mother could have qualified as an inclusionary member of the elite Cloverleafs. Unless Grandma Betty inherited a ton of money that was now gone. I never actually knew Grandma Betty. She passed away right after I was born. Leave it to the men to fail at passing on their family legacy. Betty Lou Decker was a very dear friend of mine, and she was very excited when you were born. That was true. My father never talked about his family or even his own parents. Like me, my dad was an only child, 
and his dad passed away when he was pretty young. I knew practically nothing about the Deckers, except that we still lived on the same farmland they originally settled when they first came to Maine. I'd love to hear more about her sometime, I said to Gwendolyn. Befriending the Cloverleafs was a smart move if I really had to solve this murder. They could not only replace the last ten years that I'd missed in Clover Creek, but apparently all the decades before that. Plus, I'd love to learn more about the Decker family history. Of course, dear. Now, have you given any more thought about whom you'll ask to attend the Cupid's Arrow dance next weekend? She asked, looking up at me expectantly. Ugh, I forgot that Gwendolyn also reveled in her unofficial role as town matchmaker. The rumor was that she was looking for a new project. I totally walked right into that. I appreciated the concern for my dating life, but it was pretty non-existent and I liked it that way. I shrugged my shoulders and flipped my palms up in the air. I thought I might clear my name as a murderer first, I said. My only plans for next weekend are to curl up on the couch with a good movie and a mug of hot cocoa. Gwendolyn flipped her leathered glove into the air with a dismissive motion. Nonsense! You will do no such thing under my watch, and I'll have you know that there are at least ten single men that I know of in Clover Creek who've been dying to date you ever since you came back, and we will be happy to vet each and every one of them before setting up a proper introduction. Ten? I sincerely doubted that, since I was pretty sure everyone was avoiding me like the plague since finding out I was dumped at the altar. But it was sweet of her to say so. I was super worried that the Clover Leafs would be a stereotypical, super clicky group of mean older women, but they seemed extra nice. When I was a kid, I didn't pay much attention to them, especially since I didn't know that Grandma Betty was once one of them. Groups of them were always coming in and out of Frosted just to treat themselves or one of their great-grandchildren. Thanks, but somehow I always tend to pick Mr. Wrong, I said. And apparently the wrong job, and the wrong time to be late for work. The last thing I needed was to add a romantic disaster to the mix. I still hadn't completely lived down the previous one. That's why you have us. We'll make sure you're never left at the altar again, she said while her cloverleaf entourage nodded their heads in unanimous agreement. Ouch! I was sure they meant well, but if that was the new bar for setting me up on future dates, I had to pass. Thanks, that's really sweet of you, and I'll think about it, I said, since they didn't look like they would take no for an answer. I waved goodbye and swiftly turned my attention to fishing the bakery keys out of my purse to hand them over to Grant. My phone was beeping like crazy while I was talking to Gwendolyn. There were two texts from Grant, saying he would be late, and finally a third, telling me he had to reschedule. My rush to get to Frosted seemed to be temporarily shelved. There was a message from Ruby, thanking me for cleaning the Vitamix blender, and reassuring me that she'd bring it with her to my place. I looked across the street at Claire's ice cream shop. Maybe I could counteract those greenies with some mint chocolate chip ice cream cookies. I could take a small sip of this spirulina smoothie and then wash it down with the ice cream cookie. The last text was from Ben, saying, I don't know what happened. Can we talk? My first instinct was to throw the phone across the street, right into the town square fountain. Before I remembered, it was a perfectly good new phone that didn't deserve my bitter, jilted bride wrath. Plus, hadn't I already wasted enough money on this man? My second instinct was to respond with some snarky choice words, telling him he was the world's biggest coward for sending his mother to the church to let me know he wasn't coming. But I remembered I was better than that, and I blocked his number right after I hit the delete button. If I didn't need an ice cream cookie before, I definitely needed one now. Chapter 5 By the time Ruby, the Vitamix Blender, and I returned to my parents' house, it was time to leave for the vet. Ruby dropped her stuff off in the guest room, 
while I stored my ice cream cookie stash in the freezer. She met me in the TV room where I was hanging out with Lucky. I was putting away the blankets and pillows I used for a makeshift bed last night. Aww, did the little guy sleep with you all night? Asked Ruby, picking the cat up. How do you know he's not a she? I asked. Technically, I knew boy cats existed, but I always thought of cats as feminine and girly. Just a feeling. Why? Do you think our little person is a she? She asked. Officer Lockwood called Lucky a her, I said, giving the cat a little chin nuzzle while Ruby was holding her. You mean Officer McHottie, who you should totally date? She asked. Ha, huh, as if. I've never read the police code of conduct book, but I expect dating murder investigation suspects is probably frowned upon, I said. Besides, I'm not dating ever again. You cannot let one bad man ruin your future happiness. They don't all suck, she said. Someone sounds like they're in love. Spill it. Who are you dating? I asked, trying to take the attention off me. Plus, if I learned anything from my Francine experience, it was that I needed to focus more on other people's lives instead of just my own. No one yet, but there's this guy at work that I really like, she said, getting visibly flustered. Can CEOs date their employees? I asked. I wasn't an HR expert, but it didn't sound ethical. I was pretty sure it could be a sexual harassment suit waiting to happen. That's a hard no. So at this point, it's more of an intense work flirtation. He stays late at the office with me all the time, and we order takeout and eat together and hang out in my office. It's all on the up and up, she said. Well, maybe he'll find a new job somewhere, and then you can date each other, I replied. Hardison Insurance was Ruby's family firm, so leaving for her wasn't an option. She shrugged her shoulders. Maybe. The kitten squirmed out of Ruby's arms and immediately returned to me, crawling into my lap. Well, it's pretty obvious that he's already picked his person, she said, going into the kitchen to set up her Vitamix blender. I involuntarily cringed at the thought of another spirulina drink after tomorrow's run. I wasn't too big on running, so sleeping in this morning might have been my subconscious self-defense mechanism to avoid it. There would be no escape tomorrow. What are you talking about? I asked, picking up the kitten and cradling her to my chest while I followed Ruby into the kitchen. You're so his favorite, she said. I doubt it. I've never even owned a pet in my life, I said. Plus, don't cats hate people and prefer to be alone? As if on cue, the cat started nuzzling its face against mine and purring. Oh, yeah, he so hates you, said Ruby, putting her vegetables in the fridge. Looks like he's dying to get away. Maybe she was a defective cat. Raised by puppies, so she thought she was a dog? I still had no clue where she came from, much less what kind of cat she was. But I did spend some time watching my cat from hell while Ruby finished up packing at her place. They were far more complex than I gave them credit for. I added, buy a cat tree to my to-do list for the week. I don't even know how to take care of a cat. Probably letting him sleep in all day is irresponsible kitty parenting, I said, looking at the clock on the stove. We had to leave soon to make it to the bed on time. The more fascinating part was that I managed to sleep straight through without waking up once. Maybe being arrested for murder was the cure for my insomnia. That or the kitten neck scarf. Yes, you should definitely get him registered for kitty kindergarten so he doesn't fall behind in school. He'll never get into Harvard at this rate, said Ruby with a smile. Ruby was the same as me. She didn't hate animals, but her parents were more into the aesthetics of a perfectly manicured lawn and elaborate interior design, so they wouldn't dare let a pet trample all over either of them. Neither of us were pet people. Ha ha, very funny, 
But seriously, who's going to take care of her all day? I asked. Did kittens need constant supervision? Did she need the outdoors like a dog does to play once in a while? Would she enjoy watching TV with me? Would she like some new kitty friends to play with? He's a cat. He'll take care of himself, she said. If nothing else, I couldn't wait for the vet to finally settle the gender question. Before we piled into Ruby's car, I popped the trunk and checked inside. What are you doing? she asked. You're not putting the cat in the trunk, are you? No, don't be silly. I'm just looking for dead bodies, I said. She gave me a funny look but didn't respond. I checked the back seat of the car, too, before getting in. A few minutes later, we pulled up in front of what looked like a big red shoe. I'd never been to a veterinarian's office before, but this didn't look normal. Are you sure we're at the right place? I asked. Ruby looked down at the GPS on her phone and nodded yes. The entire red building was designed to be an exact replica of the nursery rhyme, i.e., the old woman who lived in a shoe. But instead of too many children, pets were featured in the windows. All the bay windows in the front had cute fluffy cats and dogs staring back at us. Walking around to the curved door entrance at the back of the heel, the shoelaces were big gray faux ropes that zigzagged up the front with faux white lace around the top. The side of the shoe read, Clover Creek Veterinary. I checked the cat carrier, also known as the cardboard box Officer Lockwood used to deliver the kitten to me. She seemed okay, looking out the holes, curious of her surroundings, but never uttering a single mew. I wrapped my arms around the box, trying to keep her warm. I placed a small blanket inside there, but it was about 30 degrees today, and that's only if you were standing in the sun. We were instantly enveloped in toasty warmth as soon as we walked through the door. The little bell above the door chimed to life when we opened and closed it. The reception desk was crowded with vet techs dressed in scrubs and four-legged furry creatures roaming about. There were four cats hanging out in the various cat trees and tunnels that lined the reception desk. I also counted three small weenie dogs wandering around. Hi, I'm Ava Decker. I have an appointment for Lucky, I said to the main receptionist as I lifted the box. Sure, the vet will be right out, she said. This is quite a building you have here, I said. She smiled proudly and shared a historical pamphlet with me all about the Big Red Shoe. It's the last stop on the Blueberry Bay Historical Tour. It was originally built in the early 1900s as an orphanage and designed to look like the nursery rhyme to make it more inviting to children, she said. But I'm from here and I've never seen it, I said. I was pretty oblivious to all things pet-related, but I still think I would have remembered a big red shoe building. The original shoe was destroyed in a fire almost 50 years ago. The vet rebuilt it to match the original, but retrofitted it for a veterinary office, she said. There was so much I didn't know about Clover Creek. I made a mental note to sign up for the historical tour next month. That is, if I wasn't doing time for murder. A few minutes later, a short octogenarian came out to greet us and introduced himself as a vet. He gave me a warm smile and gently shook my hand before leading us back to an exam room. This was my first time in a vet's office, and the stainless steel table and sterile white countertops were intimidating. The vet was super gentle and caring while he poked, prodded, and inspected the tiny kitten. Any chance you can tell us if it's a he or a she? I asked. After what seemed like forever, he handed the kitten back to me and announced, Congratulations, it's a perfectly healthy one and a half pound baby boy. Ha! said Ruby. I knew it! Just what I needed, another man in my life. He's about eight weeks old, so you'll want to keep him warm. It's hard for smaller kittens to regulate their temperature without another for body heat. Do you have his shot records? The vet asked. I shook my head no. 
We don't know anything about him except that he's a stray. A stray? I don't think so, said the vet, looking surprised. This is at least a $4,000 Abyssinian kitten. Abba what? $4,000? I asked, taking a second look at the kitten. He was super cute and lovable, but geez, I could buy a car for that much money. Abyssinian, think of those Egyptian kitten statues at the pyramids. Abbeys are the oldest cat breed in the world and quite expensive, since there are so few of them nowadays, he said. And this little guy is Cat Fancier's Association show quality. I had no idea what the Fancy Cat Association was, but this little guy was worth more than me. Why would someone abandon the Ferrari of kittens? I asked. The vet shrugged his shoulders. I'm a vet, not a detective. I'll give him his first set of shots, a microchip, and then you'll need to bring him back again in four weeks for his last round of shots, flea medicine, and neutering. Ruby looked down at the kitten. Well, hello there, Mr. Designer Kitty. Should we call you Fancy? She asked, petting the side of his face. You don't like Lucky? I asked. Now that I knew she was a he, I could name him something more manly. Considering his net worth, maybe I should give him a rich person's name, like Maximus, Sterling, or Reginald. None of those sounded right. After the vet, we headed to the fancy cat store, the pampered paw, to buy more things I couldn't afford for the cat. I stocked up on cat toys, catnip, a cat tree, and a kitty heating pad for his bed. I also bought him a proper cat carrier and transferred him from his cardboard box to his new plush one. Did you want to embroider the collar with his name? Asked the pampered paw cashier. We have a machine on site that can do it in a few minutes. Yes, please print it with Lucky. I looked down at the kitten through the carrier vent holes. Hey, Lucky, are you good with your original name? I called out. Or at least the original name that I gave him. Knowing how expensive he was... It was totally possible the person who lost him didn't intend to. He immediately perked up and pawed at me. I took that as a kitty yes for the name Lucky. Hopefully finding the real murderer would be just as easy as this. Chapter 6 I had the house to myself that afternoon. Ruby spent our entire lunch at the Little Dog Diner, giving me a pep talk about how finding a new job right away would take my mind off the investigation. She already overflowed my inbox with links to ones that she thought I'd like. I loved knowing that she cared. I knew she meant well. She was deathly afraid I would spiral into a self-absorbed state of depression again without a job to keep me occupied. I loved spending time with Ruby, but I was relieved when she finally took off for Hardison Insurance to attend some afternoon meetings. I promised her I'd look at the job links she sent, but technically I never specified when. I needed my days free to investigate this murder. The first step to figuring the whole thing out was to talk to people who knew more than I did, and the best way I knew of to start a conversation was with free cupcakes. Everyone loved free desserts, which was the best part about being a pastry chef. My work brought a smile to people's faces. My CPA forensic accounting findings, not so much. I did not miss my old life, my old job, and definitely not my old boyfriend. Clover Creek future prospects were beginning to look up. It was times like this I did what I knew best, bake stuffed cupcakes. Baking brought comfort, calmed my mind, and gave me a sense of accomplishment in a short amount of time. I threw on some of my favorite tunes, pulled the heated cat bed into the kitchen so Lucky could hang out with me, and went to work. I needed to whip up three batches. One, a batch for Officer Lockwood to find out any progress in the murder investigation. Two, a batch for Ruby's office so I could meet her mystery man. And three, a condolences batch for Grant when I finally saw him and returned the keys to Frosted. The secret to making stuffed cupcakes 
was to ensure they were fully cooled off before stuffing or frosting them. Otherwise, your stuffing could overwhelm the cupcakes and make them all watery. And forget about frosting a warm cupcake. You'll end up with a melted glob of goo running down the sides. I took all the baked cupcakes straight out of the oven and put them into the freezer to cool. I then proceeded to create the best part, which was the stuffing for each. Grant was a hardcore amaretto apple pie streusel guy. I knew that from the extra orders he always kept in his car for himself. The best apple streusel was made from fresh but tartly flavored apples. I chopped up some Granny Smiths, mixed in some sugar, flour, and butter, and brought it to a low simmer on the stovetop. After it came to a low boil, I transferred the gooey contents into a ceramic bowl and dropped those in the freezer to cool. Next was Officer Lockwood. Judging by his bodybuilder physique, and the fact that I never saw him step foot inside Frosted or Claire's Creamery for the entire time I'd been here, he probably wasn't big into desserts. But didn't all cops love donuts? All right, that was such a stereotyped cliché. But at the very least, I hoped he'd find the sentiment entertaining. I whipped up my best Bavarian cream cupcake filling. Who could resist a Boston cream pie cupcake with chocolate frosting? Third on the list was Ruby. She was easy. Ruby was a turtle cheesecake girl through and through. I set aside extra caramel sauce that I knew she liked for dipping. Once they were all done, I began coring out the middles and replacing each batch with their respective fillings before decorating them with frosting. All the cupcakes were done, and it was finally time to go. I threw on my fluffy down jacket and Uggs. I felt little kitty claws scratching my legs above the boots. I reached down and gave him a face rub. He seemed to like those best. I'll see you later, little guy, I said, placing him in the TV room. I only made it two steps before I felt little kitty arms wrapped around my boot, and Lucky was sitting on top of my foot. I'll be right back, I said, turning the TV on for him. I switched it to the Hallmark Channel. That seemed like good wholesome entertainment for a tiny baby kitten. I gently pried him off my boot and placed him on the couch. Bye-bye. This time, I made it three steps before the kitten appendage reattached himself to my leg. I guessed separation anxiety didn't just occur in dogs. There was a low-level howling of meows when I tried to gently shake him off. Did someone want to join me on my errands? I asked. I wasn't sure what I was expecting as a response, but he hooked his nails into my pants and crawled his way to the top of them. He dove headfirst into my jacket and popped his head back out. Are you sure you're not a dog? I asked. I never heard of a cat liking car rides, and everything the cat whisperer said confirmed that cats liked to remain at home in a safe place. In fact, they despised cars. As if reading my mind, Lucky started to lick my face and nuzzle my neck. All right, fine. You can come with me, but you have to ride in your fancy new cat carrier for safety. The cat whisperer also warned that loose cats in cars tended to run under the brake pedal. After safely zipping Lucky into his carrier with his favorite stuffed animal, a fuzzy clownfish, I seatbelted his carrier into the front passenger seat. I must have sensed he wanted to go places with me, because I specifically bought the cat carrier that doubled as a car seat. Taking a big inhale, I went back to the kitchen to retrieve the cupcakes in my purse and headed back out to the car. I carefully packed each cupcake box in the trunk of my parents' Hyundai Santa Fe and drove as slowly as possible. Not only did I fear another speeding ticket, but I also wanted to ensure the beautifully frosted decorations I worked so hard on remained perfectly presentable. Chapter 7 The police station was just as I remembered it. A small brick building with old-school white street lamps flanking the entrance and a big sign above that read, Clover Creek Police Station. I trotted up the ten steps leading to the front double doors, 
which were followed by another ten steps and another set of double doors. On my first trip here, Officer Lockwood explained that since heat rises, propping up the building as high as possible conserved the warmth during the cold winter months. It sounded like a logical architectural solution, but I wasn't sure if he was actually correct. I imagined the hike up the twenty steep steps was what really kept you warm. There was a sweet old man sitting at the front desk, reading the paper. The desk was so high up, I wondered if he could even see me. I cleared my throat and yelled, Hello, I'm here to see Officer Lockwood. I'm Officer Lockwood. How can I help you? He said, peering over the huge reception desk that occupied an entire wall. I squinted my eyes. At my checkup last year, I still had 20-20 vision. But maybe I needed to make another appointment because this in no way resembled the hot, sexy, hunky cop who looked like a stripper that arrested me. If this was how sleep deprivation affected my vision, then I definitely needed a prescription for Ambien or something stronger. I checked the Cupid's arrow ball poster on the far wall behind him. I could read it clear as day. It was being held at the Leprechaun Logia this Saturday, February 14th, at 8 p.m. Formal attire recommended, but not required. I suddenly felt silly. Was I really flirting with the senior citizen? Was I so lonely and heartbroken that my vivid imagination could conjure up a gorgeous man in uniform? Hi, I brought you some stuffed cupcakes, I said, flipping open the top and revealing the cupcake tops, which I decorated with tiny guns, handcuffs, police hats, and batons. There was no reason not to be cordial. Aren't those cute? he said, picking one up. And who might you be? Wow, old and senile. Poor guy. I'm Ava Decker. You arrested me yesterday for speeding, I said. Technically, I was arrested on suspicion of murder, but I couldn't bear to say that out loud. If I did, it would make it true. But if I kept it to myself, it might go away. Kind of like my feelings for Ben. Ava Decker. That sounds familiar, but I'm sorry to say you got the wrong guy. I haven't been out on patrol in decades. I only watch the front desk to get away from the missus, if you know what I mean. He said, flashing his wedding ring. Not that I don't love her, but men and women weren't meant to be together 24-7, no matter what the retirement brochures say. Not on patrol? Did I imagine the whole week? Was I still hallucinating from sleep deprivation? His uniform had the words Lockwood clearly printed on the front label. So it had to be him. Then I wasn't arrested for speeding? I asked, slowly backing out of the jail while desperately hoping this was just a super extended long dream that I would awaken from any minute. Francine was still alive terrorizing customers, and about to yell at me for being late, and I wasn't really arrested for murdering her. We dropped the speeding charges in light of the murder charges, Miss Decker, said a loud voice looming behind me. Turning, I saw the original Officer Lockwood from last week, with the name Lockwood on his uniform, too. I was half relieved that he wasn't a complete figment of my imagination, but also half disappointed that Francine wasn't dead, and I was not being arrested for it. You're both names Lockwood? I asked, turning from the front desk senior citizen already working on his second cupcake to the taller officer Lockwood, whose physique looked like he ate nothing but raw meat and protein powder. Well, I'd hope so, considering he's my grandfather, he said. I'm Wesley Jr. the third, and this is Wesley the first, the original. That explained a lot. Unfortunately, it also meant that this was officially no longer a hallucination. I suppose your father, Wesley II, works here too? I asked, half joking but also expecting to hear a yes. Yes, he's the chief of police. 
he proudly replied. How fascinating! A cop family! I never met an entire family of cops except on TV shows. I took another look at the sweet old man now digging into cupcake number three. Was that what Wesley III would look like when he retired? That's so sweet, I said with a smile and a huge sigh of relief that I didn't actually hit on Lockwood Super Senior. Not as sweet as these cupcakes. These are better than those green spirulina drinks you try to get me to swallow every day, said Grandpa Lockwood, pointing to his grandson and sticking his tongue out in a gagging face. I knew exactly how he felt. Maybe Lockwood III and Ruby were kindred spirits. I brought them over to thank you for pawning off Lucky on me, I said. Lucky was the only silver lining to this whole ordeal. Lucky? he asked, looking confused. I'll tell you who's lucky. I am, his grandfather interjected. It's lucky that you saved me from that green stuff my grandson keeps trying to get me to chug down every day. Is that Bavarian cream inside? He held up his third half-eaten cupcake and showed it to us. Yes, it is, and I'm glad you like them, I said to his grandfather, before turning to Lockwood Jr. and saying, Lucky is the kitten you dropped off. I held up his little kitty bag that was tucked behind me. Good name. How very Clover Creekish of you, he said, alluding to the fact that everything in town was named after luck, fortune, or something Irish. I was actually here to see if you found any more suspects in Francine's murder, I admitted. Other than you? he asked. A hug? Yes, of course, I rolled my eyes in response. According to the coroner, Francine was killed between 9 p.m. and midnight, and you're the only one without an alibi for that period, he said. Wasn't it obvious? I was the only one without an alibi because I wasn't the murderer. Whoever killed her was smart enough to cover his or her tracks. Had he never seen a single mystery show? She had to have been placed there after the murder. I was in the cupcake shop until midnight baking a gazillion cupcakes. I loaded up that delivery truck myself and then drove home. There wasn't a chance I loaded my cupcakes and supplies right next to a dead body and didn't notice. I said, Maybe you placed her there after the murder? He asked. What about Claire Umbridge, the ice cream shop owner? I told you she was arguing with Francine and recently lost her boyfriend to her. Did you check her out? I asked, unable to believe nothing new had turned up in this case. I can't reveal anything about an ongoing investigation, but Claire has an iron-tight alibi. She was catering a wedding reception, and they have her time stamped on both social media and by the wedding videographer at the time of the murder, he said. Clover Creek is a small town. She could have snuck out for a few minutes, killed Francine, and then returned to the wedding without anyone being the wiser, I suggested. The best murderers had multiple eyewitnesses to account for their whereabouts and video footage. Did you check her phone, GPS? I don't have probable cause to get a warrant for that type of information, he said. Why are you so certain she's the killer? Well, if she's innocent, she should be happy to comply and provide it without one, I said. On every episode of Aurora Tea Garden, she suggested that. It was the easiest way to confirm. She was where the camera she could have strategically stood in front of said she was. They were literally throwing cupcakes and pushing each other. I was the one who had to clean it all up, so I should know. All I can tell you is she's off the suspect list, unless you have new information to the contrary, he said. What about fingerprints inside the delivery truck? I asked. Or on the door handle? Just yours, he answered. What about Francine's fingerprints? I asked. Francine had me take the cupcake truck to get it super sanitized and cleaned prior to the health inspection visit last week. So for sure my prints were in there, but hers should have been too, if she got murdered in there. 
Not a one, he said. Don't you find that odd? How could someone be murdered in that small amount of space and not leave a single print? She wasn't even wearing gloves. In fact, it was below freezing that night and she didn't have a coat, a scarf or any gloves on her. I said, Tell me one person in all of Maine who would go out in this weather with just a dinner dress and heels on. I closed my eyes and tried to remember any other clues from the truck. If only I could get another look inside. I was swiftly cuffed and carted away just a few seconds after seeing Francine's body inside. I appreciate that you want this solved, but right now, the only viable suspect we have is you, so I really can't share any more details with you, he said. What about the Freedom of Information Act? Doesn't that require you to tell me the answer to everything I ask freely? I inquired. I had no idea what that act meant, but it sounded pretty official. Yes, you can put a request in for public records information after an investigation is completed, and this one is still in progress, he said. This guy had an answer for everything. All right, well, you can't blame me for asking. I hope you enjoy the cupcakes as much as your grandfather did, I said. Cupcakes won't work on me. I haven't eaten processed sugar in over a decade, he said, raising his glass of green sludge. That must have been the spirulina drink Grandpa Lockwood was referring to earlier. Even without mentioning it, I knew that look well. I could even smell the healthy vibes emanating off it. That explained a lot. People with the superhuman ability to turn down sugar weren't like the rest of us. They were on a totally different plane of existence. I couldn't survive a day without sugar. What did you say your name was again? Asked Grandpa Lockwood between cupcake bites. Ava Decker, I replied. Yes. Grandpa Lockwood picked up a paper on his desk. I knew your name sounded familiar. It was written on the will reading invite list. Francine Donovan's will is being read this afternoon at her lawyer's office, Roberts and Roberts. Whoever benefits the most financially from her death will be a prime suspect, said Grandpa Lockwood. It could help clear your name. It was nice to know the cupcakes were working on someone. I knew exactly where the office of Roberts and Roberts was. Francine had me drop papers off there a couple times. The Roberts were a sister and brother team. I never met two people so different. The brother was warm and friendly, and the sister was cold and condescending. Grandpa, you know we're not supposed to reveal information about an ongoing investigation, Junior said in almost a hushed whisper. She was already on the invite list for the reading, said Grandpa Lockwood. No harm done. I hadn't checked my email since I left San Diego. The notice about the will was probably sitting in my inbox. I couldn't imagine why Francine would have included me in her will, except maybe to throw one last insult my way. That seemed to be her favorite pastime since I met her. What time did you say that will reading was? I asked before dashing out the door. Chapter 8 Roberts and Roberts was a small office building near Town Square. It looked like a home renovated into an office. There were two designated spots outside. One said Wendy Roberts and the other said Scott Roberts, her brother. Wendy had a fancy red sports car parked in her spot. It had a small dent in the passenger side, and I knew it was the same car Grant had driven to Frosted the other week. He was super nice about offering me a discount since it was dented, but even then I couldn't afford it. It would have to be completely totaled in order for me to afford it, but it looked like the price was just right for Wendy. The law office had an older colonial-style narrow entrance that led to a small foyer area with four doors radiating out from there. It was a pretty simple setup. One door led to Wendy Roberts' office, another to her brother's office, the third to the bathroom, and the fourth to the conference room. All of the doors were closed, except the one to the conference room, 
so I went inside there. The audience for the will reading was sparse. Grant, Niles, and Claire. Well, if it isn't the murderer herself, said Claire, greeting me at the door. Suddenly I didn't feel so bad that Francine stole Claire's boyfriend away from her. Before I could jump to my own defense, Grant intervened on my behalf. Now, Claire, we don't know that. The police simply said she's a person of interest, like all of us are, said Grant. Thank you, Grant, and I'm so sorry for your loss. I brought you cupcakes, I said, remembering that I left them in the car. Somehow, saying that out loud sounded silly. Getting a box of cupcakes seemed paltry in comparison to losing your only sister. That was very thoughtful of you. Did you make these at Frosted? He asked, flashing me his Casanova smile. I could see why all the women in town swooned over Grant. He was charming, handsome, and blessed with a killer smile. Oh no, I couldn't bear to go back there after what happened. In fact, here are the keys, I said, handing them over to Grant, who refused to take them. Maybe you should hold on to them for now, he said, closing my fingers around the keys. But why? I'm sure Francine left the cupcake shop to you. Plus, the thought of going back there was too depressing. Who will run it? I can't bake anything to save my life, he said. Cars? I can do anything with them. Cupcake pans? I wouldn't even know where to start. But you could sell the shop like you always wanted to, I said. That was the main crux of all his arguments with Francine. He wanted her to cash out, and she wanted to keep it open. I thought you said I could take it over, asked Claire, snatching the keys out of my hands. You promised. Yikes! Claire's dragon nail scraped my hand and drew blood. Francine was right. It looked like Claire had her sights on buying Francine's cupcake shop all along. I wondered if she did have the missing recipe book they were arguing over before. Maybe killing Francine and taking over her shop with Grant was her plan all along. I couldn't wait to tell Officer Lockwood this tasty morsel of information. It could be all he needed for the GPS warrant. Francine's fiancé, Niles Whitaker, sat quietly in the corner, observing us but not saying anything. He was a good-looking guy with that boy-next-door charm going for him in spades. That bewildered, innocent look, along with his friendly salesman face, probably contributed to his real estate success, notwithstanding the fact that the Whitaker family owned pretty much all of Clover Creek's commercial real estate, including Town Square. They probably even owned the building we were in right now. I went out to the car to grab Grant's apple pie streusel cupcakes. When I returned, I bumped straight into Wendy Roberts, Francine's attorney, and Officer Lockwood. His lips were pursed together in a disapproving smirk, as if it were my fault that his grandfather told me about the reading that I was supposed to attend anyway. The two prior occasions when I had seen Wendy, her hair was spun into a tight French twist, highlighting her white blonde hair and angular bone structure. This time was no exception. It was a sharp contrast to my disheveled mop that I liked to corral into a ponytail. If she hadn't been so short, she could have been a fashion model with her classically good looks. But she was barely five feet, even with the four-inch heels. Seeing me, she looked surprised. It would have been nice to reply back to a single one of my voicemails or emails requesting your appearance for today's will reading, said Wendy. I'm sorry, but I've been checking text messages since everything happened, I said. That and I didn't expect to be included in Francine's will. It's true, said Officer Lockwood. She only found out about the reading recently. Wendy sneezed and Lucky chose that moment to let out an annoyed meow at being kept in the carrier. Did you bring a cat to a will reading? Wendy shot me a final disapproving look. You won't even notice him. He's super quiet, 
I said, unzipping the top just enough to drop some cat treats inside. And I'll leave him in his carrier. I'm highly allergic. Achoo! Wendy added with another sneeze. I didn't really consider how Lucky's presence could affect people with allergies. He was so tiny. How much damage could one and a half pounds worth of kitty really do? Sorry about that. I promise I'll leave him at home for all future will readings. I smiled weakly. Wendy's face remained deadpanned. So much for my swift career as a comedian. Isn't Francine kind of young to have a will? I asked changing the subject since I had zero solutions. Plus, who writes a will before they even turn 40? It wasn't like she had any children she had to ensure were taken care of. Niall's mother insisted that each of them draw one up, as well as a prenup. Who was I to argue with the extra business? She asked. That made sense. From everything I observed, Niles was a big mama's boy. He obeyed whatever she said like a small child. The few conversations I overheard him having with Francine centered on his refusal to approve anything Francine suggested for the wedding without his mother's consent. And that was only when his mother wasn't in tow like a third wheel to every date and conversation they had. You'd think Niles was marrying his mother. I was surprised he came here solo without her. Wendy sneezed again. I tried to redirect her attention from Lucky with small talk. It would also help to be on Wendy's good side, since she was the victim's lawyer. I love the new red car you got. Grant said it was discounted, so you probably got a really good deal with the passenger door dent and everything. I said. Hug, that sounded awful. I did not do well under pressure. There was a reason I excelled at accounting and baking. Sitting behind a desk, quietly minding your own business, and looking at spreadsheets, or hiding in the kitchen far, far away from chatty customers. Thank you for pointing out the dent. Grant is fixing it for free as an early Valentine's Day gift. She replied with a smile. It should be perfectly dent-free by next week. I didn't know you and Grant were dating. That's a great way to get a car discount, I said. What was wrong with my mouth? Wendy made me really nervous for some reason, and Lucky's meowing didn't help. Even prior to the allergy-inducing cat accessory I brought to her office, I could tell she didn't like me. I sensed her judging every imperfect hair I had out of place and my total lack of makeup skills in comparison to her perfectly chiseled features, polished in picture-perfect makeup application. She managed to give me a contemptuous look every time I saw her. They must teach you that in law school. If Wendy's look was slightly unfriendly before, it was now ice cold. Even Officer Lockwood was cringing. She brought cupcakes, Officer Lockwood said, which is what I should have started with. Why didn't I think of that? I pulled open the top of the box revealing my gooey amaretto apple pie streusel cupcakes inside. It was like seeing your favorite pastry again, and Wendy's demeanor went from haughty to hungry in 0 0.2 seconds. Are those the apple pie streusel ones you always give to Grant? She asked, helping herself to one of the cupcakes as she spoke. I missed breakfast and lunch today. Yes, and these are the special amaretto ones. There's no alcohol in them. It gets burned off when I boil them. The liquor simply adds that unique flavor to them, I said. She nodded her head in confirmation, but didn't stop eating. I mouthed the words, thank you, to Officer Lockwood. That guy was so hard to read. Sometimes he was flirty and friendly, giving me a cute kitten, and other times he was arresting me and annoyed that I was pumping his dad for information on the case. Are those my favorite apple pie streusels? Grant asked, taking the box from me. He opened it up, gave an appreciative look, and winked at me. That's exactly what these are. They were supposed to be my surprise winning entry for the dessert ink contest. That never happened, I said. It's a shame. 
I know Francine really wanted to win, and I think these could have done it. Don't you? I picked one out of the box and admired my handiwork before taking a bite. Poor Francine. I wish I had tried to be more of a friend to her when she was alive. Yes, for sure. These are delicious, said Wendy. I handed one to Claire and Niles. Niles took a bite out of his and nodded in agreement. Yes, these taste like prize-winning cupcakes. Francine always talked about what a talented baker you were and how impressed she was with all of your innovative stuffed cupcake ideas, he said, peeling back the wrapper to finish it off. I seriously doubted that. That woman never uttered a single compliment to anyone but herself the entire time I knew her. But I held my tongue and simply smiled, since it was rude to speak ill of the dead, especially since it could also make me look even guiltier in front of Officer Lockwood. How do we know these aren't poisoned? asked Claire. She could have killed Francine with her poisoned cupcakes. Claire pushed hers away. I was clear out of ideas on how to please Claire. If spotting her bill at the grocery store wasn't enough, I had no idea what else to do. I was surprised she and Francine weren't still friends. They were both exactly alike. I grabbed a cupcake and inhaled it, swallowing it whole. If it were poison, would I have just eaten one? I asked, my mouth full. You could have marked certain ones fooling the rest of us into eating the poisoned ones, said Claire. I reached over and took a bite out of each remaining cupcake. Before I could make it to the last one, Wendy swiped it and set it to the side for later. If there was a do-over for the baking contest, maybe I could ask Gwendolyn to add a Wendy to the judging panel. I caught Officer Lockwood stifling a laugh from the corner of my eye. Let's just stick to the agenda for today said Wendy, clearing her throat. We all looked at Claire, who replied, What? Great. Thank you all for joining us today. We're all here because Francine either left you something or wanted you to know something. Except for Officer Lockwood. He's here as part of the ongoing investigation into Francine's murder. He wanted me to remind you all of the Slayer rule before we proceeded, which states that if any of you are found guilty of Francine's murder you automatically forfeit your inheritance, Wendy said, looking directly at me. Actually, it wasn't just Wendy. Everyone was looking at me. I tried to slink down into my chair like a puddle. I couldn't possibly imagine what Francine might want to leave me. She barely knew me. The only thing she ever talked about was herself. And when she did ask me anything, it was only to insult me. The last time she asked me something personally, it was, Hey, Ava, how can I avoid being ghosted at my own wedding like you? It was very confusing. I was sorry she was murdered even though she never once was friendly to me. In fact, I basically worked the last two weeks for free. I hadn't even received my first paycheck yet. Let's get started, shall we? Wendy asked moving to the head of the conference room. She adjusted the seat until it was at its tallest before making a big show of parading the envelope with Francine's thumbprint on the red velvet-colored wax seal. Officer Lockwood took a picture. I never attended a will reading before, but wax seals as evidence of legitimacy seemed a little medieval. I felt like an e-signed document could have sufficed. Pulling out a gold letter opener, she split the top of the wax-sealed manila envelope she was holding and pulled out a single document. This is the will and final wishes of Francine Donovan. To my dearest Niles Whitaker, I leave the truth, which is that I never loved you. I only meant to steal you away from Claire to prove to her that you were unfaithful. I call it tough love. I'm sure that Claire has a different name for it, but I did it as her friend. I hope there are no hard feelings. I was planning to tell you eventually, but if you're reading this, then you know that I didn't get the chance for whatever reason. I just want to make it abundantly clear that none of my possessions, belongings, holdings, or property were ever intended, 
nor should they be signed over to you, my pseudo-fiancé. With friends like that, who needed enemies? That was possibly the most misguided act of friendship I'd ever witnessed. Claire and Niles both exchanged surprised looks. Niles bolted upright and said, Are you serious? Those were her exact words, he asked. I'm afraid so, said Wendy, who now seemed to be holding her breath. Ouch, I knew Francine was heartless, but this was beyond awful. The flawed logic in her actions only made it that much worse. I never observed any sparks between her and Niles, but I assumed they were just a private couple that didn't enjoy PDA. Humph, Niles snorted. This is a joke. I want that engagement ring back immediately. That was my great-grandmother's. It's a Whitaker family heirloom. There was no engagement ring on her finger when we found her body, said Officer Lockwood. Even better. Well, I didn't kill her, but I might have if I'd known this was all a little game to her, Niall said, before rushing out the door and making sure to slam it shut when he left. Wendy cleared her throat and continued. <clears throat> to my oldest and most treasured friend, Claire Umbridge, I leave this valuable life lesson. Men cannot be trusted under any circumstances. They are extremely fickle unreliable and undeserving of our loyalty or love. Please know that I only stole Niles to prove a point to you so that you can be smarter in life. To my darling brother Grant, wait! screamed Claire, jumping out of her seat. That's it? She left me nothing else? Her oldest and most treasured friend? I received nothing more than some lame angsty teenage love advice from a complete and total imbecile? Wendy shrugged her shoulders. That's it. Your name isn't mentioned again. Claire shoved Niles' chair out of the way and beelined it to Wendy with her hand outstretched. That can't be right. Let me see it, she said. Officer Lockwood cut Claire off before she could reach Wendy. I don't want to arrest you, but I will, said Officer Lockwood. Wasn't that the truth? The guy loved to arrest women. Well, to whom did she leave her shop and house? Asked Claire. I was about to get to that before you so rudely cut me off, said Wendy. Do you want to hear the rest or do I need to remove you? Asked Officer Lockwood, pointing back to Claire's seat. Claire answered him by taking her seat and crossing her arms. As I was saying... To my darling brother, Grant Donovan, I leave my share of your car shop to you, as it always should have been. You are now the sole owner of both the building, the business, and the land upon which it sits. I only refuse to sell my half to you out of childish spite. Since I can no longer enjoy how much it annoys you, you can have it all. I also leave you all of my cash, stocks and bonds, and the Clover Creek Savings and Trust including my safety deposit box contents, which includes all of my most expensive jewelry. I'll have all of the papers drawn up for you tomorrow to sign, Wendy said with a smile to Grant. Grant simply nodded in response and motioned for her to continue. To my valued and most trusted employee, Ava Decker, I leave Frosted, the business, the building, and the land, under one condition— you cannot rename it, nor can you ever stop selling cupcakes, just like my grandmother did when she first opened Frosted 50 years ago. I also leave my house and all of its contents to you. I'm embarrassed for you as an adult to continue living at your parents' house. Also, your atrocious clothes could use a serious upgrade. You're nowhere near as thin as me, but maybe seeing an entire closet of thin clothes will actually motivate you to slim down. It's also the most likely reason your fiancé left you at the altar, so something to think about. Oh. My. God. Said Claire, slowly enunciating each syllable for emphasis, which kind of echoed my thoughts. She didn't even like you. She complained about you all the time. Ava is such a nincompoop. Ava doesn't know her whisk from her spatula. 
Ava is totally incompetent. Ava is so annoying. Ava is such a nitwit. Did I say that one already because she said it often enough? How is it Ava is not dead from sheer stupidity? Ava won't stop kissing up to the clover leaves like she expects to have a chance of winning their approval. And on and on and on, said Claire. There is no way she left you both her bakery and her house. The insults about your weight and your personal life? Yes, but the rest? Not a chance. I definitely agreed with Claire, but I was also still in shock. And if I were being totally honest, I was also kind of excited at the prospect of inheriting Frosted. One of my bakery dreams seemed to be coming true for once. I thought I'd have to go to pastry school, work a low-level job at odd hours for years before finally opening my own place and getting to create and share my favorite dessert, stuffed cupcakes. The addition of Francine's house was like icing on the cake. That behemoth was a grand estate. Just like Ruby, once her grandmother entered a nursing home, Francine gutted and rebuilt the entire thing into a modern mansion. When I dropped off her dry cleaning a couple times before, I got lost between her huge empress-style glass double doors and her master bedroom closet. There wasn't a single appliance that didn't talk to me. The modern smart home gadgets in there could have made Ruby salivate with jealousy. I can assure you that it was exactly what Francine wanted. We drew up the papers together and had them notarized. Plus, as you saw, the will was sealed until today. I know you were expecting more, but Francine truly felt that her friendship was the greatest gift she could give you, said Wendy. It was quite obvious that friendship was the least of all the gifts Claire wanted. Claire turned to Grant. Do something! You're her brother! You have to contest the will! That house and Frosted belong to you! Grant held up his hands, palms up in defeat. If the will is a true reflection of what Francine wanted, then we must respect her wishes. She always spoke very highly of Ava whenever I talked to her. She did? Claire and I both asked in incredulous unison. She did mention leaving Frosted to you a few times to me too, but said it was because she wanted to do something else with her life. She only kept it open out of guilt because her grandmother took care of her, said Grant. And I have no interest in contesting Francine's will. I already inherited the main Donovan estate when my father died. I don't need a second house. I never had any interest in the family cupcake business. I only wanted Francine to be happy. Claire flicked the back of Grant's head. You're an even bigger idiot than Ava is. Why didn't you talk Francine out of this? I can't believe this. I'm out of here. And with that, the second opening and slamming of the conference room door occurred. Chapter 9 Grant gave me his keys to Frosted seeing how Claire took off with mine. Wendy told me to return in the morning to sign the paperwork, which still felt surreal to me. Can I give you a ride to Frosted? I was hoping to check it out, unless you have something to hide, he said, using my words against me. Wasn't that the first place you looked after you found the body? I asked. The first place any respectable TV detective went was to the victim's house and office. Everything requires a court order and the judge is out until tomorrow, he said. Yes, it was still the weekend, but I thought this was important. He doesn't make exceptions for a murder? I asked. He's at an ashram silent retreat all weekend. Left all his electronics at home. No way to reach him. Grant was out of town too. But if you let me in as the new owner, I won't need that search warrant, he said pointing to me with a smile. At least the flirty version was back. I liked that Officer Lockwood version more than the arresting one. Sure, but you don't have to drive me the five blocks to get to Frosted. I can drive myself, I said to Officer Lockwood. I was planning to go there anyway and grab some of the stuff I left behind. By stuff, I meant cash. I wanted to raid the petty cash drawer. 
after I learned that Ben maxed out all of my credit cards, I'd been living off fumes until payday at the bakery. The thought of calling my parents for money yet again was too humiliating. I'd endured enough embarrassment. Officer Lockwood would find me even more suspicious when he saw me pulling cash from the bakery as my first act as the new owner. So I had to wait until he was preoccupied. Great, I'll meet you there. It'll give us a chance to talk, he said. By talk, he meant a chance for him to interrogate me. If I weren't their top suspect already, this definitely solidified my position as numero uno. Before I could object again, he was already in his car and down the block. The five-block drive from Wendy's office to Frosted took all of one minute on a Sunday afternoon. He was already waiting for me at the door when I parked my car. You were sure you had no idea that Francine planned to leave you everything? He asked, wasting no time with pleasantries. Not a clue, I said, unlocking the door and flipping on the lights. Holy moly, what did you do? He asked, seeing the shambles before us. The entire place was trashed. Chairs broken, tables overturned, dishes smashed to pieces, and glass everywhere around the dessert case. For the first time ever, I was more than happy to have a police escort with me. I didn't do any of this, I said. Stay here, he ordered, pulling out his gun and checking the entire bakery. Looks like whoever did this is gone, he said. The word liar was graffitied all over the walls and windows. Is anything missing? he asked. I headed to the barista station, which looked straight into the back where Officer Lockwood was standing. Frosted used to be a diner, so the counter in the front had bar stools and an open window slot that overlooked the baking area at the back. I had a perfect view of the pristinely untouched kitchen. All of the graffiti and damage were concentrated on the front. I did a quick inventory, including the cash register and the petty cash box, which were both untouched. The cash register was emptied out every night, but the vandal didn't even try opening that. There wasn't much stored on site except baking supplies, which were still locked up in the cabinet. Whoever did this had zero interest in stealing anything. Their sole mission was the destruction of the front customer area. It looked like a tsunami blew through here. A really angry pink and cream colored one. All of the elaborate interior decorators ornately placed curtains, frills, lace and flower boxes were overturned and dumped unceremoniously in piles. Frosted was pretty large for a cupcake shop. It had two tops, four tops, and a large community table in the center, as well as private booths and a fishbowl conference room in the back for hosting private events or groups. All of the table's beautifully stained glass tops were shattered into tiny pieces. The glass display cupcake and pastry cases were also now tiny shards of glass on the floor. Everywhere I walked, glass crunched under my feet. Lucky was meowing to get out, but that would be impossible without some kitty combat boots. Sorry, little guy, it's not safe. It was Claire. She took my keys right before you got there. You have to get that warrant for a GPS now, I said. I'll look into it. You'll need to come down to the station in the morning and fill out a police report to file with the insurance company, he said. Make sure to snap some photos with your phone for the report. Aren't you going to dust for prints? I asked. Was he really leaving just like that? I didn't feel safe anymore. Was this message for me or for Francine? Someone's seen one too many episodes of CSI. This is a public bakery cafe. There would be way too many prints to process, he said. None of the door locks looked tampered with and the alarm system was disabled. You should spend your afternoon finding a locksmith to get new keys and an alarm company to change the code. What about the old baker whose job I replaced? She never turned in her key, and I don't think Francine changed the alarm codes. Plus, she left in an awful angry hurry. I'll check it out, 
he said before he left. Chapter 10 The nice thing about small towns was that everything was close by. I couldn't find a locksmith, but I was already listed as a user with the alarm company. Francine added me right away after I was hired. I'd like to say it was my honest-looking face, but it probably had more to do with the fact that it was 30 below outside, and I was designated the official opener and closer for the cupcake shop, so she could come and go whenever she wanted. Ruby's office, Hardison Insurance, was on the other side of the town square fountain, which completely obstructed my view of that side of the street. I texted her to see if she wanted to meet up for dinner, but she was still at the office. With cupcakes in one hand and Lucky slung over my shoulder, I practically ran down the street. I was dying to tell Ruby about inheriting Frosted in Francine's house. It was all just awful and awesome at the same time. I had to tell someone. I pushed through the circular revolving doors and entered the opulent lobby. The last time I was here was in high school, and it was more of a small cottage back then. It looks like business was booming under Ruby's direction. The words Hardison Insurance were emblazoned in big shiny gold letters above the all-black marble interior. Hi, I'm Ava Decker, here to see Ruby Hardison, I said to the receptionist, who must have been hired from a male modeling agency. Leave it to Ruby to put men in traditionally female roles. He was in the midst of putting on his coat and leaving, which made sense. It was already 6.30. I was surprised to find Ruby still there. Do you have an appointment? He asked in an equally buttery smooth voice to match his supermodel looks. No, I'm her best friend. It's an ongoing open-ended type of appointment, I said. He dialed me upstairs and then waved me on through to the elevators, which were also new. I could have sworn this was a one-story building before. She's on the penthouse level, he said. I'm leaving for the night. Did you need anything before I go? No, but thanks for asking. Have a nice night, I said as I walked past him. I entered the super sleek silver elevator with glass windows that overlooked the lobby and hit P. If Ruby couldn't go to New York... I guessed she could reconstruct her family's firm to look like a midtown high-rise. The elevators opened abruptly after I entered. Apparently, the penthouse level in Clover Creek only got you to the fourth floor. But it was still very impressive. Ruby's high heels clacked on the floor as she crossed over to meet me. I have major, major news. Like you need to be sitting down before I tell you it's that big, I said. They found the real killer? asked Ruby. No, I said, thinking it would have been nicer than inheriting a bakery or a mansion. I told her all about Grandpa Lockwood, the will reading and the inheritance letter, as well as the vandalism. That's crazy town! Did you just make that all up? I literally saw you today at lunch, she said. I looked behind me. Are my pants on fire? Did you call Charles to make sure it's all in the up and up? She asked. Oh, right. Why didn't I think of that? Probably because I never inherited anything in my life. Good point. I'll do that now. Here, these are for you. I handed her the cupcake box and pulled out my phone and texted Charles. Please tell me these are turtle pecan caramels? She asked. What else would they be? I said. Looking up, I stared at the massive glass chandelier stretching from the penthouse level over the lobby. I might have brought something fancier if I knew I was coming to the Clover Creek version of Rockefeller Plaza. I whistled in appreciation. I was so busy telling her all of my news that I didn't even notice all of the opulence surrounding me. Like I said, business has really picked up in the last year. Do you like the changes? She asked. Come on, I'll take you on a tour. There was a loud meowing from the cat carrier and some scratching at the zipper. Dropping Lucky's bag to the floor, I unzipped it, and he sprang out like a bouncy ball. 
Lucky, come see where your Aunt Ruby works. Like a dog, he ran around the entire office floor, sniffing all the statues, the desks, the plants, and meowing at the birds flying by the windows. Each floor was small, but due to the high ceilings and open floor plan, they all looked large and spacious. The second and third floors were filled with cubicles and small offices lining the windows. The fourth floor contained the C-suite, where Ruby and the other executives sat. Instead of more cubicles in the middle, there was a large collection of artwork, statues, and a massive conference room with a round table in the center. Is Mr. A Late Night take out dinner here? I whispered, curious to see who her latest crush was. It's almost seven o'clock. Everyone left hours ago, she said. What about your officer McHotty? My phone rang, saving me from another romance interrogation. It was Charles. I quickly brought him up to speed and he confirmed that he knew Wendy and would reach out to her in the morning to look over the papers for me. Also, I have some good news. My girlfriend was able to track down the cat's breeder, Natalia Sabine. The cat comes from Champion Cat Shell Bloodlines, and apparently each kitten is worth four grand, he said, confirming what the vet told us before. Oh no, now I had to give Lucky back, or pay for him. Do you think I could sell Frosted or Francine's house to pay for Lucky? I asked. $4,000 was a crazy amount to pay for a cat, but at this point, I was ready to pay anything to keep him. As if on cue, he did a little kitty somersault into my leg. Actually, Natalia gave the cat to Francine. Not really clear why, but I'll text you her contact information if you want to reach out to her. I've already given her information to the police to look into, he said. His text came through right after he hung up. Natalia was located in Bangor, which explained why I never met her or saw her in Frosted. I hoped she didn't ask to have Lucky back. I knew I had to call her, but maybe I'd postpone that call until later in the week. We should go out and celebrate, said Ruby, grabbing her purse and putting on her jacket before I could stop her. I'm actually pretty tired. Maybe tomorrow, I said. In fact, is it okay if we just grab a pizza on the way home, veg out on the couch to the Hallmark Mystery Channel and skip tomorrow's run? All right, but on one condition, she said. Anything, I said. You are so telling me everything tomorrow about Officer McCauty when I get back from my run, she said. Deal, I said, not even bothering to argue. I wanted to be happy, but it felt too early to be popping open any champagne bottles yet. I was afraid to get too excited in case I ended up spending the rest of my life in prison for murder. That would put a big damper on the whole inheritance of a cupcake shop in a house. Chapter 11 Now that my insomnia was cured, I finally knew what everyone was talking about when they said how fun it was to sleep in. But when the front doorbell rang at 7 a.m., I also discovered how not so much fun it was to be woken up five hours before you planned to. I tried to ignore it, but the doorbell ringing just wouldn't stop. Ruby must have still been out on her run. Even if she forgot her key, she knew where the spare hideaway key was under the porch steps. Apparently, Lucky was a deep sleeper because he never flinched through the entire ordeal. I gently slid him off my neck into the crook of the couch and covered him up with a blanket before shuffling over to the front door. I was ready to yell at whomever was still there, hammering into my doorbell like it was a nail. Instead of a person, a huge spotlight and camera greeted me, shining right on my face. Roll the film now! I heard an annoying, high-pitched voice shriek out. We're live here this morning with the suspected murderer and heiress Ava Decker. After possibly killing her boss, Ava not only inherited the entire business, but also her boss's huge mansion, second only to the larger Donovan estate, where her boss's brother resides. It's odd that your boss didn't leave all of those things to her brother. Any comment, Ava? 
asked the woman, before a big microphone got shoved in front of my mouth. Squinting past the early morning sunrise and the blinding bright camera lights, I spotted the news van with all its wires and satellites fixed to the top. On the side, it read Bangor Channel 5 News. Is this broadcasting nationally? I asked. This would be so very, very bad for defense if it went to trial. It was the very opposite of trying to look innocent. Who would have called the news station all the way up in Bangor? The newscaster brought the mic back to her lips. Isn't that interesting? Our heiress is already worried about publicity and maximizing her influence or reach. Don't worry, Miss Decker. With a story like yours, jilted angry bride, overcome with jealousy and rage, kills her happily engaged boss, it will be syndicated nationwide, possibly even internationally. Is that why you killed your boss? To gain worldwide fame and exposure? I was still half awake, but cognizant enough to realize this was not going well. For me. I recognized her from the local news channel. She had her own TV segment. Ten Minutes with Tessa. She was famous for finding scandalous stories and sensationalizing them. I was guilty of watching her one too many times for that very reason. Maybe karma was paying me back for enjoying those stories. Or could it be a sign that my bad luck streak wasn't over yet? I didn't kill! I started to reply, but before I could finish, the camera lights cut out. Hey, what happened? asked Tessa looking behind her at the van, which was now being towed away. Your van is in a loading zone, and this is private property. So unless you have permission to film here, which I know for a fact you do not, I suggest you leave before I have to arrest you, said a voice I recognized all too well. Go now, he said, pointing to the street. Officer Lockwood came over and shielded me from Tessa with his body. The public deserves to know the truth. Keep it rolling, demanded Tessa to the cameraman. He shrugged his shoulders. I can't. The camera was hooked up to the main power in the van. It's dead now, he said, holding up the power plug. I can also arrest you for trespassing, he said, in that same take-charge voice he used when he arrested me. Lowering his voice two octaves? seemed like his prep tone for pulling out the cuffs. Tessa groaned and turned to me. I will be back. He can't protect you 24-7. Tessa and her cameraman stomped off down the road, but my hero remained. Thanks, Officer Lockwood. That was very nice of you, I said, opening my front door wide. Did you want to come in? He kicked off his boots and hung his jacket on the hook. I walked him over to the TV room and motioned for him to take a seat on the couch, which woke Lucky up, finally, and he began crawling all over him. Sorry about that, I said, ready to pick Lucky up, but he jumped onto his shoulder before I could. It's okay. All animals find me lovable, he said, petting Lucky, who just purred. It was possible that Lucky wasn't the only one who found him lovable. Wesley Lockwood was built like a sexy linebacker. When he took off his jacket, I could see the muscles bulging out through his tight pullover sweater. Suddenly self-conscious, I felt the tussled mop around my head, made even more crazy by falling asleep on the couch again watching TV. Plus, I was totally devoid of any makeup. I must look awful. I just woke up. So my hair's a wreck and I don't want to scare you without my makeup on, I said. He shrugged his shoulders and smiled. I actually think you look great. You're too pretty for makeup to make any difference. And I'm a guy. I like long hair. I laughed, partly because I was nervous and partly because I hadn't received a compliment from a man since I returned to Clover Creek. Flirty Officer Lockwood was definitely growing on me. Lucky crawled up his sweater, revealing a peek at his washboard abs. My previous giddy schoolgirl feelings were now replaced with guilt for not going on that morning run with Ruby. 
Well, thanks, I said, pulling down my sweater to hide my non-existent abs. Do you have anything new on the case? I just came by to give you a heads up that you're all over social media, but it doesn't look like you have any personal accounts to tag you back to, he said. Lucky popped out of his shirt and crawled up onto the top of his head. He had a thick head of perfectly feathered light brown hair with front bangs that slightly covered his right eye when they fell down. I don't, but I was thinking about starting one for Lucky, I said. After the whole wedding debacle, I deleted my entire online footprint. Thank God for that. Was it too late to change my name? Your lawyer told me that he's show quality status, he said, gently pulling him down from the top of his head and placing him back on the couch. Maybe I could exploit him by making him a big-time kitty influencer, I said. I could even write a book about him. As if sensing my newfound kitty management scheme, Lucky sauntered over and started kneading my socks with his little kitty talons. Officer Lockwood chuckled. Doesn't look like he's too much into that idea. All right, we won't make you a celebrity, I said, picking him up. Do you think the cat breeder might have killed Francine? You know I can't comment on an ongoing investigation, but it doesn't look like she did it, he said. Let me guess, like Claire, there were pictures and social media posts, time stamping her at the time of the murder? I asked, already knowing the answer. He shrugged but added, I used to think it was silly for people to document their entire lives online, but when it comes to a murder alibi... They're actually pretty reliable evidence. I fought the urge to blame this all on Ben again. If it weren't for him, I'd still have a social media presence, complete with Instagram stories time-stamping my entire alibi. I was already planning my visit to Natalia. Even if she didn't kill Francine, maybe she knew something about it. Not that Francine shared anything personal with me, but she never mentioned getting or wanting a cat. In fact... I could have sworn she hated animals. Every time a customer tried to bring one in, she'd ban them for life. Did you want to stay for some breakfast? I asked, which was silly. I couldn't cook anything to save my life, but I did bake excellent breakfast pastries. Are you trying to ask me out on a breakfast date? He asked. Don't be silly. I was simply being friendly and courteous to Clover Creek's local law enforcement. I replied. Now it was my turn to shrug. As if on cue, Ruby came bursting through the back kitchen door from her morning run and screamed out, Wake up! It's time to spill the dirt on Officer McCauty! Oh my gosh! I couldn't decide which was more embarrassing. Standing up in front of an entire church filled with people? Or this? I didn't have time to worry about putting on makeup. My cheeks were now full of rouge. She's talking about someone else, I said as Ruby came into the TV room. She did a double take and her mouth opened into a big O. Ruby, you remember Officer Lockwood? I said. Yes, how are you, Officer? She asked. He nodded at her and said good morning as he stood up before walking into the foyer and putting his coat back on. You don't have to leave so soon. Ruby makes an amazing spirulina smoothie, and I know you like those, I said. I was so mortified, I hoped he'd say no, which thankfully he did by proceeding to slip his boots back on. Thanks, but I promised my grandmother I'd teach a self-defense class to the Clover Leafs this morning. Why would your grandmother be interested in the clover leaves? I asked. She's their leader, he said. Chapter 12 I now understood the power of emotional support animals. I had no other sets of parents in another city far, far away who were willing to let me move back and sponge off them while I remained unemployed. Plus, I was on strict orders not to leave town until the case was solved. On the upside, Ruby felt so bad, she totally let me slide on drinking another spirulina smoothie. 
I consoled myself with some cold leftover pizza for breakfast. Once Ruby went to work, I started working on my own suspect list to investigate today. My first stop was Natalia. I packed up Lucky in his carrier and headed out the door. I'd never seen anyone running errands with their pet cat. Companion dogs, yes. Companion cats, never. But I was brave enough to be the first. If I looked silly, it wasn't like I'd be in Clover Creek long enough for anyone to even notice. Plus, today's first errand involved Lucky. I held my breath as I knocked on Natalia Sabine's door. An older, red-headed woman in her mid-fifties answered the door. There were three kittens that looked exactly like Lucky, peeking out from behind her ankles. Can I help you? She asked, with a heavy Russian accent. She eyed the cat carrier curiously, and me with even more suspicion. I do not know you. Why are you here? Hi, are you Natalia Sabine? I asked. Depends. Who is asking and for what purpose? She said, starting to close the door. My name's Ava Decker, and I think I have one of your kittens. I said, holding up Lucky's cat carrier so she could peek inside. Seeing Lucky up close brought a smile to her face. You gave him to my boss, Francine Donovan, the owner of Frosted. I was hoping we could talk. As soon as I mentioned Francine's name, her smile transformed into an instant frown. I very much hope she will not be joining us, she asked, looking behind me around the street outside. I can pretty much guarantee that's not a possibility, I said, following her inside. Natalia's house was a kitty theme park paradise. There was a huge cat mural on the main wall, resembling a family tree that traced the lineage of each of her litters. I counted five cat trees alone in the long foyer leading to the living room. Cat tunnels ran along the floors, the walls, and even on the ceilings. Did Francine not like the cat? She was so adamant about having a champion sired show cat. He's absolutely flawless. I can assure you there is nothing wrong with him. She said, already on the defensive. Francine had that effect on people. Oh no, Lucky is perfect, I said, unzipping the top and letting him come out to play with his siblings. The other kittens immediately greeted him with little kitty nips and they all started tumbling around together and chasing each other. A yellow lab came bounding out from the back and scooped Lucky up by his nape, carrying him over to his dog bed in the corner. I didn't know you bred dogs too, I said as five fat yellow puppies followed the dog into the dog bed. I do not. They are my sisters. She's staying with me for a few weeks, she said. At least one mystery was solved. Now I understood why Lucky acted more like a dog than a cat. Why are you here? Natalia asked. I guessed she wasn't big on visitors. Francine passed away last week, I said. I heard you were out of town. Again, I couldn't bear to bring myself to say the M word. Yes, at the Cat Fancy Show in California, she said. Anushka won first prize. She pointed to a big cat portrait on the wall and a large golden prize cup that read the exact date that Francine was killed. Not a chance she was the killer. California was at least a seven-hour flight one way. Now I understood why Officer Lockwood dismissed her so quickly. Is that Anushka? I asked, pointing to the mom cat sitting on Natalia's lap. She nodded in response. I had no idea what qualified as being show cat ready versus not, but she was a beautiful cat. The Abyssinians had ticked fur coloring, where it was dark on the tips and light near the roots, giving them sort of a shimmer effect. All of Lucky's siblings and his mom had that regal Egyptian sphinx look. So you're here to return the cat to me? She asked, watching Lucky happily climb all over the yellow lab. He is the offspring of an award-winning cat Anushka. 
Actually, Francine gave the cat to me, so I intend to keep him. I said. Technically, that was a lie, but in theory, if Francine left her house and everything inside it to me, that would have included Lucky. I hope that's okay? I asked for some strange reason. I felt like I was doing something wrong and needed to get someone's, anyone's, approval to keep Lucky. That's really up to the kitten. I believe the cat picks the person, said Natalia. As if on cue, Lucky jumped up on my lap, along with three of his other siblings. They were all rubbing against me and kneading me with their little front paws. If I knew kittens were this cute, I would have gotten one much earlier. Would you like to purchase these other three cats? Asked Natalia, raising her eyebrows. Or maybe a puppy? One of the yellow lab puppies was licking my arm. I don't have $12,000. Nowhere near that, I said, trying not to pet them but failing miserably. Why did they have to be so darned cute and fluffy? The other two were ruddy colored just like Lucky, but the third one was blue. It was a good thing I was broke. I would have totally bought all of these cats and puppies if I had the cash. I give you a special deal. Extra cats and puppy in exchange for Francine's recipe book, she said. Frosted's cupcakes were good, but they weren't that good. This was the second time I heard about this recipe book. Now I wanted to get my hands on it and try out some of the recipes. Maybe it was her grandmother's recipes from when she first opened Frosted. If it's cupcakes you want, I'd be happy to bring some by next week when the bakery is up and running again. Have you ever been to the bakery in Clover Creek? I said. Natalia seemed more like the spirulina-chugging crowd versus the bakery-visiting type, judging by her thin, wiry frame. Natalia laughed at me. You're taking over for Francine? I suppose now that you have the recipe book, you would like to blackmail me too? She asked, looking at me like I was the Wicked Witch of the West. It was the first time I ever received that look from anyone. I was never the school bully or even a mean girl, not in the slightest. I preferred to fly under the radar, keep to myself and remain hidden in the shadows. Blackmail? Why would I want to blackmail you? I asked. Well, what else would you do with the recipe book? Asked Natalia. The old chef left without revealing any of her recipes, but when I joined Frosted a couple weeks ago, I changed the menu so we now have stuffed cupcakes, which are pretty much our best sellers. Everyone loves them. If you tell me your favorite flavor, I can whip something up for you, I said. I wasn't sure if it were a language barrier thing, but maybe the Russian word for cupcakes sounded like the word blackmail? I was awful at languages. I took Latin in college because the boy I had a crush on was enrolled in that course. But otherwise, I knew no other languages. Natalia let out an exasperated sigh. I am very busy. That was obviously my cue to leave. I scooped up Lucky into his bag and made a hasty goodbye. She clearly hadn't killed Francine, but it sounded like this recipe book was some sort of blackmail log. Could that be the reason Francine was murdered? Was that why she was fighting with Claire? Was it about finding the book that morning? Chapter 13 The drive back from Bangor was a good hour without traffic, so I let Lucky out of the bag to roam around the car. I'd never been inside a cat carrier, but they looked pretty stuffy and confining. I found a kitty harness and a super short leash at the pet store in Bangor that allowed some movement but restricted his access to the passenger seat only. He looked much happier to be out and about. Like a dog, he jumped up on the door handle and stared out the window. I bet if it were summertime, he'd have stuck his head out. My phone rang midway through my drive back. I didn't recognize the number, but I was expecting a call from Charles regarding the inheritance paperwork, and another from the window repair guy with an estimate. Hello? I answered. 
What are you doing visiting Natalia Sabine in Bangor? You should be packing, said the surly voice on the other end. Wesley? I asked. Who else would be checking up on you? He asked like it was normal to be stalked by the police. And it's Officer Lockwood. How did you know where I was? I asked. Did he follow me? Why did I call him by his first name? I checked the rear view window, but there were tons of random cars, and I didn't have the first clue how to spot a tail. I wasn't able to get Claire's phone GPS tracking approved, but I did for yours, he said. I supposed that made sense. I was the prime suspect. I had some cat food questions for Natalia. She is Lucky's breeder. Obviously, she would know what he likes to eat best, I said. I was awful at lying. I made a mental note to sign up for an improv class when this was all over. Let me guess. She suggested you feed him cat food? He asked. I know what you're doing and you need to stop. This is a police investigation and you are not. I hung up the phone before he could finish his sentence. My days of taking orders from men were so over. That was the only thing Francine and I had in common. As terrible as she seemed, if I had known a friend like Francine back in San Diego, I never would have been ghosted at the altar. Good morning, Officer Lockwood, I said to the super senior version at the front desk. It is if you have some more of those stuffed cupcakes, he said with a warm, welcoming smile. For the man who helped me out yesterday, I most certainly do, I said placing two big boxes of a dozen stuffed cupcakes each on the counter. Ava Decker, I believe you're my new favorite person, he said, already digging into the top one. What did I do to deserve two boxes? The second box is for Gwendolyn. The Boston cream pie cupcakes are her favorite, so make sure to bring them home for her, I said. You should deliver these yourself he said, pushing the box back towards me. She has a bunch of suitors lined up for you. Very nice, respectable gentlemen callers she'd like to introduce you to. The Cloverleafs are having breakfast down the hall. They just finished up their morning self-defense class. Who would want to date a murder suspect? I asked. I thought matchmaking was the last thing on Gwendolyn's mind these days. I guessed I was wrong. I'm not sure if Gwendolyn shared all the details about you. I think they're just blind dates she wants to set you up on, he said. I leaned into the counter so that only he could hear me. Any updates on the Francine Donovan investigation? I asked, crossing my fingers and hoping that a new suspect had turned up. Well, let's just say you're not the only suspect but it's looking pretty grim. My grandson is much more than just a pretty boy. He'll solve this murder investigation for you, he said, patting my hand. I really liked Grandpa Wesley. He helped me fill out the police report for last night's break-in at Frosted, and then referred me to a handyman for the repairs. He was pretty much the dream grandfather I always wished I had. My grandfather's on both sides of my family, passed away long before I was born. Well, if it isn't my favorite suspect, said Officer Lockwood, joining us. Good afternoon, Officer Lockwood, I said. You can call him Wesley, said his grandfather. She can stick with Officer Lockwood while she's still a suspect, he corrected him. Actually, isn't that confusing with three Officer Wesley Lockwoods all working in the same police station? I asked. Everyone calls me Gramps, my son Chief, and he's Wesley, he said. But once he solves this case, he'll be able to sit for the detective exam, and we'll call him Detective. I didn't know you wanted to be a detective. Is Clover Creek even big enough to warrant needing one? I asked. Funding was just approved this year with the understanding that resources would be shared across all of Blueberry Bay, 
wherever my services are needed, he said. That is, if I'm able to solve this case. Now listen up, Wesley, you're going to solve this case. Not just because you need to make detective, but because I need to maintain a fresh supply of pastries. I've grown quite fond of this young lady's cupcakes, and if she's not here to bake them, how can I enjoy them? He asked, picking up his second one and handing another to his grandson. Here, try one. Despite his dedication to spirulina and all things healthy, Wesley didn't hesitate and immediately bit into it. Yes, these are pretty darn good, said Wesley, licking his lips. Do I detect a hint of almond extract in the filling? That was true. No one ever guessed that. It was my secret ingredient. I hadn't even told Francine about it. Not that she'd ever shown any interest in my baking skills or recipes. You take bullets, you teach self-defense classes, and you're also a part-time pastry chef? I asked. Is there anything you can't do? Not a thing. He was the valedictorian at Clover Creek High, graduated the Naval Academy with honors, and he's also single, interjected his grandfather with a wink at me. You're like Clover Creek royalty, I said with a mock curtsy. Lucky roared at having his cat carrier, which was still attached to my shoulder, tipped over when I leaned down. Did you bring a cat to a police station? Wesley asked, pointing to the carrier. He's a kitten, and yes, of course I brought him with me. He's not supposed to be alone for more than two hours at a time, and I have a lot of errands I need to run today. I replied. I had no idea where I saw it, but someone reputable mentioned that kittens should be supervised at all times to make sure they didn't get into trouble. Wesley cradled his head in his hands and groaned. I have some aspirin in my car, I offered, knowing the real cause of his headache. He seemed like a man who didn't hear the word no very often and was used to having all of his orders followed to a T. Grandpa Lockwood pushed the second box of cupcakes towards me and nodded to the community room down the hall. I grabbed them, gave him a wink, and headed to my right. Where are you going? asked Officer Lockwood. Your grandmother is setting me up on some blind dates, I said. Now it was Wesley's turn to look surprised. You can't date, he said. Did I detect some jealousy? And why is that? I asked. In addition to not being able to leave town, I wasn't allowed to go out either? It's not safe. There's a killer out on the loose, he said, looking flustered. But I thought I was your top suspect, I said, before I went into the community room. Chapter 14 Grandpa Lockwood's handyman was a miracle worker. He offered to fix everything this week and change the locks. It was highly unlikely Claire would return her set to me any time soon. Plus, after the break-in from the other night, I felt like I needed to beef up the deadbolts. The only thing I can't repair are these chairs. Furniture repairs are totally separate, and these look like those fancy ones that Melinda does, he said. The frosted chairs were an eclectic mix of throne style, thick cushioned couches, fluffy egg-shaped privacy cones, hammocks, and fancy velvet bar stools. Melinda must have been their interior decorator Francine was always complaining about. It was hard to keep track. Francine liked to complain about everything so much. I mostly tried to tune it out. The vibrant pink and purple colors were the first thing I noticed about Frosted when I stumbled in. The San Diego showroom-style decor didn't really fit the small-town vibe emanating from the rest of the retail shops in Clover Creek. Some called it tacky, but I found it interesting. Francine missed her calling as an Instagram backdrop creator. Every spot in here was hashtag worthy. Thanks. Do you have any contact information for Melinda? I asked. Francine did zero in the form of bookkeeping or receipt tracking. I found absolutely no records from when she took over the bakery from her grandmother. 
She's across town on Furniture Row. She has a small showroom right at the beginning of the street when you exit the highway, he said. Luckily, I had until the end of the week to come up with his payment. Since I was referred by Grandpa Lockwood, he assumed I was good for the money. The sooner I could sign the inheritance papers, the sooner I could make sure that would happen. I stopped off at home, fed Lucky and called Charles to help speed things up. He promised that he would have everything ready to sign by tomorrow morning. I also gave him an update on Natalia and the missing recipe book. He agreed the recipe book of secrets probably had the killer listed somewhere in it. Or, more likely, the person who took it was the killer. Although, the book was missing before Francine died, so maybe not. Today would have been a perfect day for an ice cream sandwich from Claire's Creamery. But considering our last encounter, it didn't seem like a good idea. Darn her for having not only the best ice cream shop in all of Clover Creek, but also the only one. Scanning the cupboards, I only found spirulina powder, protein powder, matcha powder, and turmeric powder. The fridge didn't prove much better. It contained bone broth, celery, carrots, apples, and other super healthy contents from Ruby's fridge. The freezer held a lot of frozen fish, chicken breasts, and steaks. That all sounded like too much work, and I'd rather starve than cook. Common sense dictated that risking another encounter with Claire wouldn't be very pleasant. But my hunger won out over reason. I packed up Lucky and headed over to her shop. It's not like she could be worse than the reporter from earlier this morning. The most important factor in my poorly thought-out decision was that Claire was an amazing ice cream maker. She was the only person I knew who could keep an ice cream shop packed every day during the middle of a frigid winter in Maine. It was probably owing to all the exotic flavors she created every day. In addition to the basics like strawberry, vanilla, and hazelnut, she changed her specials menu daily. People were afraid to miss out on their favorite specialty flavor if they skipped even a single day without visiting Claire's Creamery. Today's three specials were double salted caramel coffee, lavender honey, and marshmallow cream dreamsicle. I had to wait in line behind ten people before it was finally my turn. Lucky seemed pretty content in his little kitty Bjorn under my jacket. He peeked out for a brief second from the top and then crawled back in and went to sleep. Upon seeing me, Claire let out an exasperated sigh. Ugh, here to gloat? she asked. Just here for one of your fabulous double salted caramel coffee ice cream sandwiches, I said, pointing to the pre-made one in the display corner. That was my go-to at Claire's. It wasn't the healthiest choice, but it did leave my mouth and tummy very happy afterwards. She dropped my sandwich into a paper bag and rang it up on the register. That'll be $5,000, she said nonchalantly. Or you can pay your balance by handing Frosted over to me. I spotted you a 20 at the grocery store last week that you still haven't paid me back for. That should more than cover the ice cream sandwich. I said as I swiped up the sandwich before she had a chance to take it back. The real price for the ice cream sandwiches was a little over $6, if I remembered correctly. I knew I should be more focused on interrogating Claire, but I was starving, so I took a big bite out of the ice cream sandwich before answering her. Once I gulped down a satisfactory bite, I studied her more closely. She did seem genuinely confused, and hiding her true feelings was not a skill she possessed. Lucky took that moment to peek out from under my shirt and swipe a couple licks at the ice cream sandwich. I pulled it away. I read somewhere that cats were lactose intolerant, despite all the cartoons showing them happily lapping up saucers of milk. Is that Francine's ridiculously expensive cat? She asked. You knew that Francine bought a cat? I asked. Francine only had the cat a day before she was killed. I didn't even know she purchased him. She started laughing. Technically, her grandmother bought it. Put a deposit down on the next special show cat breed or something. 
She left it to Francine in her will and called it the Jewel of the Nile, because it's a special Egyptian cat or some other rare breed. Francine thought she was picking up priceless jewelry, not a cat. Even Grant was jealous. He thought Francine inherited the next hundred million dollar Hope Diamond. That explained why she never mentioned a cat. She thought she was getting a super big jewelry inheritance. Seeing Lucky instead must have been a huge shock. Maybe Grant killed Francine, thinking he could steal the priceless jewel from her. Claire was close to Grant. He must have said something to her. Have you spoken to Niall since the reading? It sounds like you were both duped by Francine and her really bizarre way of helping you out. I said, hoping that might get her talking. Why would I talk to Niles? The joke is on Francine. We were broken up anyway. He was incredibly jealous and practically stalked me while we were dating. Why weren't you here earlier? Mother was expecting us. Mother said it should have only taken you ten minutes, not thirty, to drive here. Who is that I hear in the background? Are you with somebody? I thought you said you were alone. And on and on and on, she said. That was interesting. I never got the jealous boyfriend vibe from Niles. I assumed he was just a really attentive and loving boyfriend. Plus, there was so much planning to do for the wedding. I figured that was why he was always around. Was he stalking Francine? I asked. If so, maybe he knew who killed her. Maybe he killed her? Probably. Either him or his busybody mother, she said. But only if his mother allowed him to do it. That guy wouldn't even go to the bathroom without her permission. Do you think he would have hurt Francine if he knew what she was up to? I asked. Who knows? They're both cuckoo and they deserved each other if you ask me. Which you did, so that's my answer, she said. If Niles was that into Francine, maybe he was the one who trashed Frosted. That would make sense with the whole liar graffiti everywhere. Or possibly his mother, whom I did find a little creepy. Did Niles have a key to Frosted? I asked. More confirmation for getting new locks installed and resetting the entire security system. Doubtful. Why? You think he's the one that trashed Frosted the other day? Asked Claire. The police asked me about it. You're the only one with the key besides me. Grant gave me his copy, I said. Here, take them back, she said, pulling out two keys from her apron and handing them over. How do I know you didn't make copies, I asked. How do I know that you didn't murder Francine, she asked. Because I didn't, I said. It doesn't matter. Grant already told me that we're going to get Frosted in the mansion back once you're convicted of murder, she said with a wicked smile. Chapter 15 Clover Creek's Furniture Row was a single block on the south side of Clover Creek, literally on the other side of the tracks. From what I could gather, the north side of Clover Creek contained the middle class, upper crust, the parks, running trails, and town square, whereas the south side of the tracks contained the much less affluent crowd, the warehouses, the abandoned buildings, and the industrial part of town. Furniture Row was here because of all the warehouse buildings. Each store was jam-packed with furniture, paintings, rugs, and other accessories and decorations from wall to wall. I spotted Melinda's interior design space as soon as I exited the highway, just like Grandpa Lockwood's handyman mentioned. Even if it were not there, it would have been hard to miss. There was a big purple diamond heart rotating above the building. I spotted it from the highway. It was lit up and had the word Melinda's blinking in white. In San Diego, this could have been the calling light for a strip club. It was a little tacky, but it did a great job standing out on the furniture strip. I parked the car, put Lucky back in his carrier and headed into her store. I couldn't decide whether he liked the carrier better or being in the kitty Bjorn in my jacket. He seemed a little squirmy at the ice cream shop, but maybe that was only because I wouldn't share my double-salted caramel coffee ice cream sandwich with him. 
the soft purring changed to screeching when I exited the car. Apparently Lucky was like me and did not enjoy cold weather. Don't worry, little guy. I'll use the kitty Bjorn next time so you can hide in the jacket. I said, holding up the carrier. Lucky roared even louder in response. I had no idea what that meant, but the wind chose that moment to pick up, so I rushed inside Melinda's design store. The inside of Melinda's showroom was just as gaudy and over the top as the bright blinking diamond advertising it. This explained a lot about the interior design work done on Frosted. Why Melinda decided to set up shop in Clover Creek instead of somewhere like San Diego, where her skills would have been better appreciated, was beyond me. Well, howdy there. Can I help you out today, sugar? Asked a petite bleached blonde woman. She was wearing a gold sequined top and black jeans and looked like she stepped right out of a John Wayne Western. She completed the look with white suede and fur-covered thigh-high boots and really big hair. She screamed Texas, even without the southern drawl. I'm looking for Melinda. I believe she decorated Frosted, the cupcake bakery over in Town Square, I said, pointing out the door. I had no idea if I were pointing to the north, the east, or the west. I was terrible with directions. You're looking right at her. Did you want something similar for your home? I get requests like that all the time. You wouldn't believe how many people come through that little bakery and come right over here asking me to pull together something even fancier for their homes. She said, lacing her arm through mine and walking me over to a crystal encrusted chair in the corner. She was right. I didn't really believe her, but I appreciated her sales skills. I could probably learn a thing or two from her about running a small business. The style and attitudes in Clover Creek went from conservative to ultra-conservative, whereas Melinda's styles were more along the lines of shocking flamboyant to ultra-flamboyant. She gestured for me to sit down in her office. Melinda's chair was on the opposite side of the mirrored desktop, decked out in rainbow-colored jewels and a faux sheepskin cover. Her desk accessories were also blinged out, including a picture frame of her boudoir photo that didn't leave much to the imagination. I blushed and had to look away. I thought about covering Lucky's innocent little kitty eyes. I was actually hoping to just get, I said before she cut me off. Wait, let me guess, sugar. You're going to get married soon, and you want to make sure your hunky honey pie has the ultimate dream house to come home to? Am I right or am I right? She asked. She was so wrong. I might have to reconsider that whole Melinda as a sales mentor thing. Not exactly, I said, unzipping just the top part of Lucky's carrier so he could peek his head out and look around. Oh, isn't he precious? You know I can make him a matching studded kitty collar to go right along with your new home decor. That way, your cat won't clash with your new furniture and decorations and such. You wouldn't want that, now would you? She asked, reaching over to pet Lucky. Since I had no prior cat experience, maybe she was right. Maybe it was important to ensure that Lucky matched the interior decor frosted for branding purposes. Thanks, that's very full service of you. But I'm here for furniture repair services for Frosted. I inherited Frosted from Francine, and pretty much all the chairs need to be fixed or possibly replaced. I'm not sure which, I said. Like most people, upon hearing Francine's name, her demeanor instantly changed from warm and welcoming to cold and suspicious. Was it too much to hope that just one person in all of Maine might not have been insulted and offended by Francine? Inherited? So someone finally killed that wicked witch of Clover Creek? She asked. I never mentioned that she was murdered, I said. How did she not know that Francine was dead? That woman was utterly abominable. It was only a matter of time before someone did her in and saved the rest of us from her evil reign of terror. Do you know she told lies about me online? 
after all the hard, painstaking work that I did to magically transform her dowdy little outdated bakery into a beautiful modern destination location, she went online and trashed me. That woman is a liar and the world is a better place without her, she said. Melinda made a fake spitting noise and flicked her hair back. Where were you last Friday? I asked. If you're asking if I killed her, then no, but I applaud the person who did. I was out on a blind date with the world's most ill-mannered man. I was so excited because he made reservations at the Golden Bistro, which I've been dying to go to. But do you know he got so drunk he was arrested for disorderly conduct at the restaurant? And I had to get one of those ride shares home. Not that I would have driven with him anyway, but still, she said. I've never been so embarrassed in my life. This was the reason no one should go out on blind dates. I could easily verify her story with Grandpa or Wesley Lockwood. Another morning cupcake delivery should earn me that little tidbit of information. What was his name? I asked. Melinda gave me a funny look. You want to go out with him? Oh no, quite the opposite. I'm new in town, so a girl can never be too safe. If I met this fella, I'd want to make sure I avoided him at all costs. I said. The truth was I was avoiding all men at all costs. After hearing about all of Gwendolyn's potential blind date options, I wasn't really excited about any of them. But to appease her, I told her I'd think it over and get back to her. Sure, us girls need to stick together. His name was Philip Avery, she said. Philip Avery, I repeated, committing it to memory. If it makes you feel any better, Francine bragged about the interior design to me all the time. I think she just did that to try and get a cheaper price from you, I said. Francine's entire approach with the new interior design was to make her shop more social media worthy for fun photos. Her marketing strategy rested upon having customers take photos she hoped would go viral. Winning the Desserts Inc. cover was simply part of her strategy to make Frosted a national franchise. What are you? Her sister? Her cousin or something like that? Why would she leave you Frosted? Asked Melinda. That was the question of the week. Who knew? I was working there right before she died. I really love cupcakes, so maybe she wanted to be sure she entrusted her legacy to someone who would carry on her tradition? I half explained, half asked myself. After mulling over the question ever since the will reading, I couldn't come up with anything new besides being last on her most hated list. Melinda seemed to ponder it before she said, That doesn't sound right. I think I was the person she hated the least, I said. Now that makes more sense. So you want me to repair all of the broken furniture and ruined a car from the break-in the other week? She asked. I never mentioned there was a break-in, nor that the decor was ruined too. I said, suddenly feeling uncomfortable. What if she trashed Frosted and not Niles or Niles' mother? Francine lied to all of them. I knew nothing about owning an interior design business, but I imagined having negative online reviews wasn't helpful for future business. I thought you had, she said. Why else would all the furniture be broken? I suppose that was a logical conclusion. I made a mental note to share my suspicions about Melinda with Officer Lockwood tomorrow. Can you swing by and give me an estimate on how much it would cost to fix and repair everything? I asked, already planning to bring Ruby with me for protection. Lucky made a lousy witness and an even worse sidekick protection companion, no matter how dog-like he was. No one could be intimidated by one and a half pounds of furry cuteness. Too bad Natalia wasn't in the business of breeding security patrol canine dogs instead of champion show cats. Francine might still be alive. How about I make you a little deal? If you're the new owner of Frosted, you can remove all of Francine's lies about how awful my interior decorating was and replace it with all new accolades on how much you love it. You do that, and you can have all the repairs it cost, she said. 
done, I said without giving it much thought. How hard would it be to remove everything? Francine's laptop should be in her house, and once I got the keys to that, I could log into her accounts and simply delete everything and write something nice. Melinda reached out one of her elaborately decorated hands, dripping with jewelry, and offered to shake on it. One of her press-on nails stuck to my palm afterwards. It was a metallic pink polished nail, encrusted with rainbow-colored gems, just like her desk. I think this is yours, I said, daintily handing it back to her. Oopsies, those things are so weighted down with my pretty baubles, they just keep falling off, she said, showing me another empty nail. I keep telling the lady at the nail salon to put more glue on, and she keeps telling me to put less gems and jewelry on. But my nails are also a reflection of my artistic talent, so I cannot possibly have even one less than you see here. I looked down at my own nails, plain and super short. It was easier that way. They fit better into the plastic gloves I had to wear when baking. Melinda agreed to meet me at Frosted on Friday when the handyman was done making his repairs so she could get started on hers. Chapter 16 Taking a big inhale, I pushed through the front doors of Niles family's real estate office. This was the visit I was dreading the most. My plan wasn't to outright accuse him of anything as much as to find out what he knew. Claire said he was a crazy, stalkerish, micromanaging boyfriend who knew Francine's every move. If what Claire said about Niles was true, he had to know who the killer was, assuming he wasn't the killer. Hello, I'm here to see Niles Whitaker, I said to the receptionist at the front. She stood up to greet me as I walked in. What was with real estate offices in suits? Realtors always looked so formal, including their support staff. She had a short, blonde, angular bob, blue eyes, and a smart black pinstriped pantsuit. Her ruffled shirt underneath gave it a feminine touch, along with her rose gold jewelry accessories. Do you have an appointment? I don't see anything in his calendar, she said, looking down at her terminal. No, but I was hoping to talk to him about a really quick personal matter. My name is Ava Decker. I worked at Frosted with his late fiancé, I said. Such a shame what happened to her. She was so pretty, she said. I nodded my head in agreement, not really knowing how to respond to that. Like, if Francine were ugly, it wouldn't have been so bad that she died? Yes, it was quite tragic. Is Niles doing okay? I asked, deciding to press my luck. She seemed like she wanted to talk, and who was I to deny her the right to give me more information? He was devastated when she died. I had to cancel all of his appointments. And after he finally started to feel a little better, the whole will-reading thing happened. He's been taking it pretty hard, but not as hard as his mother. She was just livid, claimed she would get even after she found out about Francine's duplicity. But I kind of feel like there's not really a whole lot you can do to get even with a dead person, she said. How very true. Just being alive made you the winner in that situation. Maybe Niles' mother trashed the bakery? She seemed crazy enough to do it. It was a shock to everyone. I said, the understatement of the year. Niles is out with a client right now. He should be back any minute if you want to wait. She gestured to the plush leather couches on the side. The half-melted snow from my boots squeaked across the marble flooring as I crossed the room to the couch with Lucky safely tucked inside his kitty Bjorn. There were no kitty screaming protests this time when we walked from the car to the building. So it looked like the kitty Bjorn would become a permanent clothing accessory for me. I'd never been in here, not even before I moved to San Diego. The walls were a light blue on the top with white wooden wainscoting. The ceilings were vaulted with simple but classy glass chandeliers hanging overhead. 
The waiting room table was made of glass, with Chanel, Dior, and Prada coffee table lookbooks. There were two huge fancy vases flanking the door, with large floral arrangements brimming from each. This was definitely not the handiwork of Melinda. It was muted elegance and classy decor. Lucky popped his little kitty head out from the top of my jacket. I guessed he was dying to see the office opulence, too. Instead of jumping into my lap, he made a beeline to the receptionist. Oh, it's Reginald! squealed the receptionist, kneeling down to kitty level. Did Francine end up potting him off on you? Lucky immediately jumped into her arms and started purring. Did you just call him Reginald? I asked. That name did seem more fitting for his royal stature and net worth. He looked like a Reginald to me, and Francine didn't bother to name him, she said, nestling against him. He's just the sweetest little guy. How did you meet Reginald? I asked. Maybe the receptionist killed Francine? She could secretly be in love with Niles, and maybe she knew what Francine was up to and confronted her. That was a crazy stretch, but I was willing to believe anything that threw the guilt off me. She told me to take him to animal control, but I couldn't do it, she said, picking up Lucky and kissing him on the head. Then she called me later and told me she changed her mind and was going to give Reginald to her brother. But when I took Reginald to Grant's luxury car dealership, Grant looked at me like I was crazy. He was absolutely furious and punched a wall. I just scooped up the cat and left. That sounded like a normal reaction to getting a cat instead of a priceless piece of jewelry. After I told her what happened, Francine took him back and said she found someone else who wanted the cat, she said. She brought out a piece of string from her desk, and Lucky followed it around like it was kitty gold, running in circles around her and up and down on the couch. You're really good with cats, I said, making a mental note to buy some string for Lucky after this. My mother is a veterinarian, she said. Here in Clover Creek? I asked. I liked the older veterinarian and the big red shoe, but it was always nice to have other options. No, back in San Diego. That's where I'm from, she said. My heart stopped. Did she recognize me? Did I recognize her? That would be crazy. What a terrible coincidence. Although running into someone from San Diego was bound to happen. I took some deep breaths, trying to slow my pulse. There was no way she knew me. And even if she did, what did it matter? My public humiliation was pretty much old news by now. That's pretty far away. How did you end up in Clover Creek? I asked. I just got here a couple weeks ago. I hate to sound childish, but I had a pretty bad breakup with my ex. He was always away on these clandestine business trips and would turn his phone off for long periods of time. And you know what that means, she said, giving me a knowing nod. She was so pretty, I couldn't believe someone like her could have guy problems. Maybe it was San Diego. It could be bad luck for love. Wow, that sucks. How did you confront him? I asked. That was the one thing I regretted. It would have been nice to tell Ben to his face that I deserved better than being told by his mother at church that he changed his mind. But there was also a part of me that was terrified of doing so. I needed some type of closure that I never got. Running away to Clover Creek meant he won, and therefore ruined my life. I called his office, she said with air quotes around the word office. The number was disconnected. The company never existed. So naturally I broke into his apartment, she said. What other choice did he leave you? You had to at that point, I said. Did you ever find out who he was cheating on you with? He had notes all over his apartment about some woman named Brittany, which I wish I never found because now I hate everyone named Brittany. I know it's petty and silly, 
but I can't help it, she said. He denied it, said he was doing research for a job, she said, using the air quotes for the word job. Maybe he's a secret spy for the CIA? I asked. Weirder things had been known to happen. As if. I hope him and his new girlfriend Brittany are happy. When Nona Gwendolyn heard about it, she insisted that I get away from the big city and come spend a couple months out here with her, she said. She pretty much thinks big cities and people from there are the root cause of all that's wrong with the world. Did she say Gwendolyn? Could there be another Gwendolyn? You're a Lockwood? I asked, already knowing the answer. How could there be so many of them? She nodded her head. Yes, Chloe Lockwood. Wow, you guys are everywhere, I said. Like, literally. Everywhere I looked was a Lockwood. They should just rename the town Lockwood Creek. Yes, poor Nona Gwendolyn. She so desperately wanted a girl. But after son number seven, they finally decided to give up, she said. She's been trying to recruit me to take over her position as leader of the Clover Leaves ever since. Seven Lockwood boys? Well, that explained why everyone in this town was named Lockwood. I suppose your father is a cop, too? I asked. No, he's a locksmith. I was actually apprenticing under him right before I moved here, she said. Oh, I get it now. That's how you managed to break into his house? I asked. I didn't blame her. If I thought my boyfriend were cheating on me and I knew how to pick a lock, I doubt I could stop myself. When Nona discovered it, she found me this job instead, she said. Do you want to be a realtor? I asked. It didn't seem so bad. You got to wear cute outfits and see new properties all the time. Real estate is right up there with a career in accounting. Boring. I want to be where the action is. I'm going to open up my own locksmith shop someday, she said. It would be interesting to see who won, Chloe or Gwendolyn. I had my money on Chloe. She seemed pretty feisty and a real go-getter. But Gwendolyn had more experience in getting her own way. It would be very interesting to see who won in the end. Oh, look, you renamed him Lucky, she said, reading his collar. I like that name much better. I'm so glad you ended up with him. He seems really happy. Well, I'm glad that you were there to keep little Lucky safe. Or Reginald back then. Francine wasn't exactly the pet parenting type. Did you still have him the day that Francine, you know, died? I asked. If I could establish a timeline, maybe I could find out how he ended up in the back of the cupcake truck. I watched him while Francine did a spa day in Bangor that day. She was back by dinner time, though. Probably 5 p.m., she said. All right, so Francine was still alive by 5 p.m. that day. They were both at the house. I was still at Frosted baking for the contest, and the truck was parked out back. So the murderer... Francine and Lucky all ended up in the cupcake truck sometime between 5 p.m. and 10 a.m. when I left my apartment the next day. A stiff cold breeze entered the waiting area when Niles opened the door. He looked from Chloe to me to Lucky. What are you doing here? asked Niles with a deep frown of annoyance on his face. So much for a friendly chat. I wanted to check in on you. I felt terrible for you after what happened at the will reading. I swear I had no idea, I said. It looks like he lumped me together with Francine. You didn't deserve what happened to you, I added, when I could see that he was wavering between throwing me out and pushing me out. You're a super stand-up guy and any woman would be lucky to have you. Francine didn't know what she had. His shoulders started to relax and he seemed to let his guard down. Like Gwendolyn said when she doled out dating advice to me, never underestimate the power of stroking the male ego. Thanks for saying that. Why don't you come into my office and we can talk? He said, gesturing towards the staircase. Don't worry. 
I'll watch Reginald. I mean, er, Lucky, said Chloe. I mouthed the word thanks to her and followed Niles up the stairs. If the foyer was beautiful and rich-looking, the interior was even more so. I spotted a Monet hanging in the hallway and more large potted plants, a marble credenza and some statues, on the way to Niles's massively large corner office. There was a long couch and two chairs in a corner, which he invited me over to. Drink? he asked, walking over to the built-in chrome and glass bar in the far wall. It looks like a throwback to a roaring 20s Hollywood movie scene. Only if you have some milk and a steamer back there. I'm more of a hot chocolate and marshmallows kind of girl, I said. I wasn't a complete teetotaler, but since I met Ben at a beach bar, I decided to swear off all drinking and drinking establishments. He poured himself what looked to be a double and threw it back before refilling his drink and sitting down across from me. So much for needing to loosen him up to talk more. He was doing a fine job of that all by himself. This whole thing has been so weird. One minute I hate her for what she did, and the next I'm sad and sorry she's gone. It's all very confusing, and I feel like a big idiot for not knowing she didn't have genuine feelings for me at all. She was just using me to prove a point, he said, raking his hands through his thick, dark hair. I know exactly how you feel. I thought I was in love once, too, but the other person was lying to me the whole time. Like, big time. It's awful and it makes you question your own self-worth. But you can't go down that rabbit hole. She was the problem, not you. There's nothing wrong with being honest about your feelings, loyal to the person you are with, and hopeful about love. You're going to come out of this even better than before, I said, patting his shoulder. That was the pep talk speech Ruby gave me on my failed wedding day. I wasn't sure I believed it quite yet, but I was working on it. Niles was a couple of inches shorter than me, but most men were. At five foot eleven, I pretty much towered over everyone. When I pointed that out to Gwendolyn, she deleted over half the potential names on her list and double-checked the others. What he lacked in the height department... Niles Whitaker definitely made up for in the wealth department. With all the family money, he was a valuable catch for any single woman here or anywhere else. That's the complete opposite of what my mother said. And just so you know, it wasn't like what Francine said in her will. I'm not a cheater. Claire and I were completely broken up. Claire was all over the place and she wanted to date Grant, and then she wanted to get back together with me, and then she wanted to go back to Grant. Francine offered herself up as shoulder to cry on, and one thing led to another and I really thought she cared about me. Mother told me I was stupid and naive, he said with a few tears threatening to fall. Mother also said I'm not allowed to cry over Francine. Please don't tell her about this. He grabbed some napkins off the minibar and wiped his tears away. With a mother like that, Niles was one step away from becoming the next Norman Bates. Pshaw, I said, waving a dismissive hand in the air for emphasis. You know how mothers are. They're always trying to point out your flaws and mistakes because they think it's their job. From what I saw, you're a dreamboat boyfriend and fiancé, and the universe will make sure your next relationship is perfect and lasts forever. Delivering hope felt nice. At the very least, maybe it could counter the words of his toxic mother. She seemed to be the real reason Niles was still single. He didn't look like a killer to me. Not that I ever met one, but he appeared to be one of the good guys, even if a little misdirected in his over-adherence to his mother's guidelines and advice. You really think so? He asked. I know so. Karma will guarantee it, I said with a smile. That was the only explanation I had for why I ended up inheriting Frosted and Francine's house. For what it's worth, I don't think you murdered Francine, he said. Who knew Niles Whitaker would be on my side? Thanks, that means a lot, I said, knowing this was my one chance to ask more about what he knew. You were with her pretty much all the time. Any ideas who the murderer could have been? 
I held my breath, waiting for his response. It could go either way. He could tell me everything he knew or lead me to another dead end. It could be anyone. She seemed to bring out the worst in people, including me, he said. I'm sorry. I thought that too. Did you see her after she returned from the spa? I asked. If he could establish a motive for the murder, maybe everything he said was true and he wasn't the murderer. We went out to dinner at the new Italian restaurant down by the wharf. She got into an argument with some woman I never saw before. And then she said she wanted to get up early for the baking contest. So I dropped her off at her place at nine. I wasn't tired, so I went out to grab a drink with Mother and the next day, well, you know, he said, letting his voice trail off. He could have been lying, but the police probably already corroborated his alibi with some credit card receipts from the bar, which was probably the reason I was still their prime suspect. Do you think the woman she was arguing with killed her? I asked. Francine was always arguing with someone, so maybe he didn't think anything of it. I told the police about the fight, but who knows if it even really happened. They were supposedly arguing in the ladies' room at the restaurant. Mother and I remained at the table, and I only heard about it after the fact, when Francine came out and told us. Looking back, she probably just made it up so she wouldn't have to spend any more time with me, he said. I cringed when he mentioned bringing his mother to dinner on his date with Francine. I didn't blame her. Pretending to get into a fight was a good excuse to get away from a weirdo who insisted on his mother's intrusion of every single date. Poor Niles. How could he not see that his mother was the source of all of his failures in romantic relationships? I was actually worried about you after you fled after the will reading. Did you go home or to your mother's place right after that? I asked. Or did you by chance go to Frosted and trash it to get all of your frustration out? Honestly, I didn't know what I should do. I was so mad. Mother was waiting for me outside. I went with her to Bangor to cancel the tuxedo and some other wedding preparations. He said. Maybe he wasn't that great of a catch after all. The mommy and me time would really annoy me. I thanked him and went to retrieve Lucky from Chloe. Anytime you need me to watch him, just let me know, she said, giving me her card. She kissed Lucky before handing him back over. Thanks for the offer. I'll let you know if I need a cat sitter, I said. I almost told her that it wasn't necessary, since I was the complete opposite of Francine, and took Lucky with me everywhere but I realized that could make me sound like one of those crazy spinster cat ladies and stopped myself. Instead, I dropped Lucky back in his kitty Bjorn and zipped up my jacket around him before leaving. Chapter 17 The receptionist from the night before recognized me right away and waved me up to Ruby's penthouse office. I was dying to tell someone about everything I learned today. When I exited the elevator, I found her doing yoga poses in the main penthouse vestibule overlooking the town square fountain. She had a really nice view, as far as views from a height of four floors went. Lucky immediately jumped on top of her and started his own set of cute kitty poses. Oh my gosh, I have huge news, I said, snapping Ruby out of her half-moon pose. You're dating Officer McHottie? she asked. That was a weird guess. No, and you'll have to stop calling him that. But I did give Gwendolyn the green light to start setting me up on blind dates. I said. That is big news. I'm so proud of you. She said, encircling me in one of her signature bear hugs. Thanks, but my real news has nothing to do with boys. I found some new suspects that are not me. I said, pointing both thumbs at myself for emphasis. I quickly brought her up to speed on the discovery that the recipe book was really a blackmail log. Melinda was probably the vandal, and possibly the killer, and Francine and Grant erroneously thought Lucky was a priceless diamond or a piece of rare jewelry. So, just to be clear, this is you taking my advice and letting the police handle the investigation of the murder? She asked, her arms folded in annoyance. 
I thought she'd be excited, but I guessed wrong. I wasn't really investigating anything as much as simply running my usual errands. Lucky wanted to visit his original home. Did you know he had a yellow lab for a mom? That's why he acts more like a dog than a cat. I said. As if coming to my rescue, Lucky crawled up Ruby's yoga pants and into her arms for cuddling. Grandpa Lockwood depends on me for his morning cupcakes. The best person to repair the broken furniture would obviously be the person who both built it and broke it. Checking on Niles to give my condolences was a neighborly thing to do, I said. Perfectly valid reasons for me to be talking to each of those people. Lucky really laid on the charm and started licking Ruby's face, which made her laugh from the tickling sandpaper tongue. Do not mistake my kitty weakness as confirmation that I'm not mad at you. If one of them really did do it, they might kill you if they think you figured it out. This is very dangerous and I don't approve, she said. That was easy for her to say. She wasn't the one facing jail time. Well, it's obvious what needs to be done next, I said. I was already running down the hallway to the conference room with Ruby and Lucky following close behind. I flicked on the lights and opened my arms like a big L in front of a huge whiteboard in the back before grabbing some dry erase markers and starting to write out my suspect names. We can solve this ourselves. If it's not safe for me to do it alone, then you'll have to help me, I said. That's the worst logic I've ever heard, she said. I'm sure Officer Lockwood is looking at everyone. You said he comes from an entire lineage of police officers. He's probably a good detective and he seems like a really nice guy, she said. He was a nice guy. If it weren't for him, I wouldn't have Lucky. It wasn't his fault that all the evidence kept pointing back to me. I'd think I was the murderer too, if I were him. Especially if I were up for the one and only detective slot on the police force. And he's really hot, she added. I wasn't sure what that had to do with anything, but I just nodded my head in agreement. I've seen enough episodes of every police show that's ever been made to be a detective myself. We can do this, I said. Once we write down all the information on this board, the murderer will instantly appear to us. Plus, you owe me. Owe you for what? She asked. Brittany Westerhide, I said. Fine, but I want it noted for the record that I'm participating under duress. She said, taking a seat at the conference table. Duly noted, I said. Until that moment, I didn't realize I was the solution to my own problem. Who needed the Lockwoods? I could solve the whole case myself. I could totally do this. I spent my entire career doing forensic accounting. How different could this be? Someone lied to cover up a crime, so I simply needed to establish a motive, gather a pool of suspects, and find their biggest mistake in committing the crime. Anything I couldn't figure out? I could simply YouTube or Google along the way. Easy peasy. I wrote out all the details of the murder and then the possible suspects, their motives, their alibis, and their relationship to Francine. Then we printed up recent photos of each suspect and taped them on the whiteboard. We had five suspects in all. First was Claire, who obviously wanted Frosted for herself, but was supposedly attending a wedding during the murder. Then came Grant, but he had no motive. He wanted to sell Frosted, but at the will reading, he not only gave me his copy of the store keys, but he also told me I deserved them. He didn't seem surprised nor upset about it. Grant already was much wealthier than Francine. He inherited the entire luxury car dealership with all the inventory, while Francine got the bakery. Grant also received the main Donovan estate, whereas Francine got the smaller house. Growing up lower middle class, it was a mansion to me. But to someone like Grant, he would have sold it to buy a few more Ferraris and add to his net worth with the cash. I had no idea about Grant's alibi, but it seems like Francine would have gained more if the situation were reversed and Grant died. She would have inherited everything. Next was Natalia, 
who was unhappy at being blackmailed by the recipe book, but already paid Francine off with Lucky. Plus, she was out of town, although her sister could have done it for her, thereby leaving Natalia's alibi perfectly intact. I made a note to ask Gwendolyn about Clover Creek Town's secrets. There would be no reason to blackmail anyone poor, so someone in the Clover Leafs was probably in the blackmail book. Next was the eccentric interior decorator, Melinda. She resented the bad reviews, but kept gushing on and on about how they drew in more business for her. Melinda could have been angry enough to kill Francine after she refused to remove the bad online reviews. She could have had enough time after her blind date to kill Francine, but she didn't seem like someone who risked even breaking a nail. Last was Niles, the jilted fiancé. The only problem was his motive didn't surface until after Francine died. He had no idea he was being played. The look of surprise and indignation on his face at the will reading was real, if I ever saw one. He was supposed to be drinking at a bar, but in theory, could have gone out to Frosted, killed Francine and returned to the bar to finish drinking, and continue his credit card receipt paper trail. But he had zero motive at the time of her murder. He didn't cancel any of the wedding preparations until after the will reading, because he was probably genuinely grieving over her death. Like Natalia, he did have a crazy family member that could have done it. Niles' mother was jealous that he loved another woman and could have killed her. She and Niles needed to commit the murder together in that case, since they were each other's alibis. I was now at an impasse. I had no idea what to do next. I really don't think Grant did it, said Ruby. He's one of our top clients and doing quite well. He has no financial reason to kill her, and if he murdered her out of spider hatred, he could have done it sometime during the last 40 years, since they've been step-siblings. She had a good point, but we still didn't know where Grant was at the time of the murder. Great, so you'll ask him about his alibi? I asked. I most certainly will not. Plus, my dad still handles his accounts for him, she said. He's just that important. Wonderful, so we'll ask your dad to check on his alibi for us? I asked. She gave me a look that said, not a chance. Don't you think the police must have already checked out his alibi? Maybe, but they might have missed something, I said. And it was my job to find it. This was standard accounting practice. Someone made a journal entry, another person verified it during an account reconciliation, and then an auditor came by to check for errors. It was classic accounting 101. I may not have been a police detective, but I was a trained forensic accountant. All right, what would that character Aurora Tea Garden from that Hallmark mystery movie you like do next? Asked Ruby, trying to change the subject. That was good thinking. I knew exactly what she'd do. Aside from confronting Grant to verify his alibi herself, the next thing she'd do is look for clues at the murder scene. You mean the cupcake truck that is currently sitting in the police evidence warehouse and which we don't have access to? She asked. Exactly. Let's go. Maybe that's where the missing recipe book is. I said, already throwing on my coat and shoes. That blackmail book had every single suspect listed in it. Wait, what about Lucky? This office is not kitty-proofed, she said, pointing to the glass vase in the corner he broke earlier. We can take him with us, I said, slinging the kitty Bjorn back on. But it's his dinner time, she said. He's fine. I have a stash of emergency kitty kibble in the car, I said. All right, but what about our dinner time? She asked. She did have a good point. That double salted caramel coffee ice cream sandwich from Claire's seemed like a millennia ago. My stomach was already grumbling from all the thinking. I couldn't believe I would suggest this, but I really wanted to get to that warehouse and check out the cupcake truck. Don't you have ingredients in the office to make us spirulina shakes? She instantly perked up. Yes, I do. This is my office, of course. I have everything here that I like. Let's take them to go. 
It's been so cold out lately, they should easily stay smoothie level temperatures on the drive over, I said. Chapter 18 We parked two blocks away from the evidence warehouse, which was down in Furniture Row with all the other warehouses. There weren't any cameras in the vicinity that I could see, but you never knew. I was a complete amateur when it came to anything shady. I cracked under pressure. My palms were already sweating despite the frigid temperatures outside. The police won't allow us to inspect the cupcake truck because we asked, she said, stating the obvious. All right, negative Nancy. Enough with the excuses. We're going. I have a plan, I said, already out the door while she still struggled to wrap her scarf on. Let me guess. It's from an Aurora Tea Garden mystery episode? She asked. I popped open the trunk and grabbed the roadside assistance duffel bag that was filled with a drill, a crowbar, spray paint, and other tools I knew my dad kept in here for winter emergencies. Who are you? She asked. I remembered seeing the inside of Ruby's trunk. It was filled with yoga mats, yoga blocks, an eyeshadow palette, a tube of lipstick, some dry shampoo, and maybe even some essential oils and a diffuser. Those were her ideas for filling an emergency kit. A girl should always be prepared for anything. Plus, these are the basics that any good detective keeps in their trunk, I said. That makes sense. She said, with as much sarcasm as whispering in twenty below frigid winds could muster. Do we have a plan? She asked, following me towards the warehouse. In every FBI task force, they name the Operation Plan, kind of like Mission Impossible. But we shouldn't name our investigation that, since it sounds kind of negative and makes you think that you'll never succeed. I said. How about the Prove Ava Innocent mission? She asked, opting for the name-it-like-you-see-it kind of nomenclature. That's too obvious. It has to be a secret code word, I said. Her forehead scrunched into tight worry lines when she was deep in thought, and she always looked up to the sky. It's a full moon. We could call it Operation Full Moon, she said. That wasn't a bad idea. The moon was so bright... We didn't even need street lights. It was also bright enough that anyone with a halfway decent cell phone camera could have easily captured us in high definition. That's genius. Let's call it Operation Mercury Retrograde. Our plan will be to let the universe guide us. And since the moon is in Mercury Retrograde, that means we should do the opposite of whatever first comes to mind. So tell me, what are you thinking? I asked that this is a mistake and we should go back home, she said, which was kind of how I felt, but I was fighting it. Lucky me out his agreement or annoyance. I wasn't sure which one. Perfect, then we'll stay put and forge ahead, I said. It reminded me of moving back home to Clover Creek in the first place. If I had done the opposite of everything that first crossed my mind, I might still be in San Diego right now relaxing on a gorgeous sandy beach, applying sunscreen between windsurfing outings. If the universe didn't want us to break into the warehouse, would it really have equipped us with a crowbar in the trunk? I asked. Do you justify everything with that kind of backward logic? She asked. Not everything, but most things lately. We looked both ways before crossing the street. The snow started to pack and the freezing temperatures made it harden. Our feet crunched over it with each step. The great thing about snow-covered sidewalks was how the perfect footprints were soon engulfed in more snow, thereby covering up any evidence that you were ever there. However, frozen icy snow was more like a clay or pressable foam surface that created permanent imprints of your feet. The forecast tomorrow was even colder than today, which meant there was no chance our prints would melt anytime soon. I started to tiptoe like a ballerina, hoping it would be harder to detect later. Unfortunately, my boots were from the Jessica Simpson line. She liked putting her name everywhere, 
including the gold-plated toe that imprinted the script font with her name into the snow. Now there would be no mistaking those footprints were definitely mine. Before I had more time to try out another failed method, we arrived at the warehouse door. Ruby pulled out the crowbar and pried the door open. Or at least, she tried. We both tried. Hold on, I said, pulling out my phone and googling, how to crowbar a deadbolt. While I was scrolling through a blog post, the door opened from the inside. We both screamed in surprise. Two strong hands reached out and pulled us both inside before we could even think to run away. The hand then grabbed my phone, which was midway through the blog post. Are you kidding me? asked the voice attached to the hand, which I very much recognized as Officer Lockwood. Wesley? I asked. Yes, and you're lucky it was me who found you and not someone else, he said. What do the two of you think you're doing here? Part of me was relieved it was Wesley since he knew me, and the other part was worried about going back to jail since it was his job to uphold the law, which we were clearly breaking. The lights were off, but the huge garage doors in the front were glass blocks, so plenty of moonlight streamed in. Between that and the glass rooftop, it was pretty bright in the huge mega room that was probably 40,000 square feet of open concrete space. The police warehouse had a huge floor in the middle, flanked by two wooden staircases leading to the upper level, and open wooden balconies with more storage in them. It was like a hoarder's delight. There were so many random things. Trucks, bikes, a slip and slide, a doghouse, plants and tons of bins. Each upper level looked down into the center. I could have sworn I came here once in high school for a rave and stood up on the balcony level looking down on a concert. Operation Mercury Retrograde? I half asked, half answered. He gave me a look that was not a good one. I wasn't sure what he meant by it, but I doubted it was one of approval. The cute code name we gave to our escapade sounded so much funnier in my head than when I said it out loud to Wesley. Excuse me, I just need to talk to Ava for a second, Wesley said to Ruby, who simply gave him a thumbs up in response. Once we were out of hearing distance from Ruby, I started talking first before he had a chance to chastise me again. What are you doing here? Didn't your shift end hours ago? I asked. As you might recall, I promised my grandfather I'd look into helping you out. He's convinced you're innocent. I did some research and even though all the evidence points to you, I think you're being set up, he said. Thank you, Boston Cream Stuffed Cupcakes. If I ever doubted my pastry skills before, I wouldn't do it again. Thank God for small miracles. I brought him up to speed on everything I learned today, just like I did with Ruby earlier. I'd like to say I'm impressed, but I don't want to encourage you, he said. Great, so you'll help me find the real killer? I asked. First of all, we, he pointed to me and Ruby, are not going to investigate anything together. That's police work. Second, this is very dangerous. There's a real killer out there. He said, Sounds like someone should start teaching me self-defense lessons. I said, Did you hear me? What if the killer has a gun? He asked, How are you going to dodge a bullet? That's not his M.O. He stabs people with knives. I said. Before he could answer, Ruby got antsy and came over. That's exactly what I was telling her. This is dangerous work that should be left entirely to you said Ruby. Way to have my back, Ruby. If you agree with me, then why did you let her come here? He asked. And why are you helping her? Brittany Westerhide. We both answered at once. Who? He asked. It doesn't matter, and it's a long story, I said. So we are going to be arrested? Asked Ruby. She did a double step back, already prepared and ready to sprint towards the door. 
I'm not going to arrest you, but I can confirm breaking into an official police evidence warehouse was a very bad idea. He said, giving me that look reserved for all school teachers that shows extreme disappointment. Well, technically, we didn't break in. You opened the door and let us in, I said. He closed his eyes, held his head with his hands, and shook it side to side. I told you Officer McCotty likes you, whispered Ruby into my ear as she elbowed me in the side. I heard that, said Wesley. We both cleared our throats and stood straight up with perfect posture, as if that might exonerate our whispering. Has anyone ever told you that your whispering skills are kind of loud? Like, loudspeaker megaphone loud? Asked Wesley. Lucky chose that moment to emit a big roaring meow. He would make a terrible cat burglary companion. You brought a cat to a breaking and entering? He asked. He likes running my errands with me. I told you, he's an emotional support animal, without any of the official paperwork or training. I said. But he had a good point. That was not my smartest move. I might have to start leaving Lucky at home for future errands and investigating. More like a criminal support animal, whispered Ruby, laughing under her breath. I heard that too, said Wesley. We both straightened our postures again, even though it had zero effect the last time. Here, take this said Wesley, handing us both his card. The next time you think of something related to the case, call me first. This has my cell number and the number of the police station on it. If I had called, would you let me see the delivery truck? I asked. If you're here to inspect the delivery truck, I can assure you there's nothing there. I checked it myself, he said. I was actually on my way out, which is why the lights were off. Maybe you missed something? I asked. I was the one who loaded the cupcake truck, so if something were out of place or missing, I would know. He seemed to ponder this over before he agreed. The evidence warehouse was so cluttered with stuff that it looked more like a flea market than a warehouse. There were large overhead signs hanging down from the rafters that notated the aisle and row for each item. Aisles were letters and rows were numbers. The cupcake truck was in the back, near the big garage door under the sign Z5. I didn't need my keys. It was unlocked. Everything looked exactly as before, aside from the body chalk outline. All the baking pans, bowls, and ingredients I packed up the day before were still in the truck, along with the muffin pans, liners, and frosting bags. The tablecloth, frosted signage, paper tasting plates and napkins were all neatly stacked in a small box and ready to go. The cupcake racks were also in the back, sans some of the cupcakes. My prize-winning apple pie streusel's stuffed cupcakes were missing, but the rest of the cupcake samples were still intact. Do police normally eat evidence? I asked. Why? What's missing? Asked Wesley. We weren't sure what could win, so I went with our top three bestsellers. The apple pie streusel that Grant and Wendy go crazy over, the Boston cream cupcakes your grandfather is in love with, and the caramel pecan stuffed turtle cheesecake ones that Ruby loves. Everything is here except the apple pie streusels, I said. Wesley seemed to mull that over. I suppose it's possible someone got hungry and figured no one would notice, but why not take all the cupcakes, he asked. I love cupcakes just as much as the next person, but you'd probably go into a sugar coma if just one person ate all of them. In fact, they should all be thrown out today. They're going bad, even with the frigid temperatures in this warehouse. It'll start to smell, and considering I'm now the new owner of Frosted, they'll eventually have to give me this delivery truck back, so I'd like to sell it mold-free, I said. Judging by the 1980s VHS player I saw in one of the piles we walked past on our way in, it was possible that returning evidence wasn't high on the Clover Creek Police Department priority list. You don't want to keep it? asked Ruby. No way. It's cursed. 
I'll have to drive it somewhere no one has ever heard of Clover Creek or Frosted and sell it there, I said. All of the bad juju from this truck couldn't be washed away with any amount of bleach, not even one of Ruby's chakra cleansings. I hoped I didn't have to disclose the murder that occurred in the truck, like you do with real estate. That would make it pretty much unsellable, and I'd have to pay the scrapyard to take it. Lucky jumped out of my jacket and began to explore. He must have recognized the truck, because he didn't seem scared at all. Making a beeline to the empty cardboard box in the corner, he hopped in. It held the extra frosting supplies. It was there when I loaded the truck. There was barely enough room for a small kitten to fit. What are you doing? He's going to contaminate the crime scene even more than we already are, said Wesley. Aren't you forgetting? He was part of the crime scene. He was in the truck with the body, possibly the entire night, I said. Considering how little time Francine spent with Lucky, he probably wasn't as traumatized as he could have been. Or maybe because he was so little, he didn't remember. I continued to look around the truck, checking drawers, boxes, labels, and cartons. Not really sure what to look for, but I figured I would know when I saw it. Ruby saw it too. I think Lucky found a clue, said Ruby pointing to the cardboard box he was still inside. He was pushing a small jewel of some sort around the box like a hockey puck. I reached in and picked it up. It was a crystal-encrusted press-on nail. I know exactly who this belongs to. I practically squealed. We found the murderer. She was Melinda. Could it really be that easy? Chapter 19 it was not really that easy. Melinda's alibi was airtight. Her date, Philip Avery, was arrested, which accounted for most of the time during which the murder occurred. Then her rideshare took forever, got lost, and by the time she finally arrived home, Francine would have been dead already. I was back to the drawing board, or rather, the Hardison Insurance Conference room whiteboard. I camped out at Ruby's office for most of the morning with Lucky, until I left to meet Charles. His office was located in Glendale, the next town over. It took a little more than twenty minutes to get there. Ava? asked Charles when he came into the foyer to greet me. Yes, you said to come by today to sign the inheritance paperwork, right? I asked. We didn't set up a specific time, but he said the morning was good. Yes, I thought maybe you were my girlfriend, Angie. Someone mentioned there was a woman with a cat in here, he said. Angie travels with her cat? I asked. More often than you think, he said. Despite my initial disappointment when I found out that Charles had a girlfriend, the more I learned about her, the cooler she sounded. Maybe running errands around town with your cat was the new normal in the Blueberry Bay area. Possibly a new trend. I followed Charles back to his office and he pulled out the papers. I unzipped Lucky and let him explore. Upon seeing Charles, he immediately ran over and nestled against his neck. He's quite the affectionate kitten, huh? Asked Charles, petting Lucky back. He has a really good memory. I ran into his previous cat sitter, Chloe Lockwood. And he went crazy when he saw her, I said. Cat sitter? he asked. I told him all about my visit with Niles, the receptionist, and the evidence warehouse pseudo break-in. If there were ever someone you could safely share your illegal activities with, it had to be your lawyer. That all happened in the last 24 hours since I spoke to you? he asked. I nodded my head. As your lawyer, I am obligated to tell you that you should try to refrain from any further illegal activities, given your current situation, he said in what sounded like his most serious adult voice. I nodded, duly noted. I have some news, too. Not quite as exciting as yours, but Francine's lawyer, Wendy Roberts, emailed me the wrong version of the ownership transfer documents. I don't think she meant to 
but it looks like Francine originally willed both Frosted and her house to her alma mater, some super fancy private boarding school in Switzerland, he said. It could be nothing, but it seemed a little odd. That confirmed it. Francine came from money, money, money. She did talk about her time in Switzerland on a few occasions, but mostly as a way to insult the rest of us. Like, you're nothing compared to my sophisticated and worldly friends in Switzerland. Or outranking everyone else with her ski vacation in the Swiss Alps with her boarding school friends. If I loved Switzerland that much, I would have just sold everything and moved there. But then she'd have no one to brag to about how much better she was than everyone else. Does this mean there was a mistake in the will, and I'm not getting the house in the bakery? I asked. Easy come, easy go. I couldn't get upset about something I really didn't deserve. Wendy sent over the correct documents as soon as I told her, he said, pushing a stack of papers my way. Francine loved to brag to anyone who would listen how superior her friends and time in Switzerland were compared to Clover Creek, I said. Should I not sign these yet? I picked them up and perused them. I tried to read a few pages, but as I suspected, they were filled with undecipherable legalese. Everything looks legit. The only stipulation is that you leave the bakery open. You can't change the name. It has to remain frosted forever, and you must continue to sell cupcakes. You can sell other things as well, but cupcakes must remain on the menu, he said. I could do that. I loved cupcakes, and what did I care what it was named? Frosted was a historical staple. I could probably even get it added to the official Blueberry Bay historical tour, like the big red shoe the veterinary office had. That would no doubt help with business. That seems more than fair, I said, flipping through the pages. Charles carefully added little yellow sign here arrows stickers for me throughout the document. There were a million different places to initial and sign my name. I checked local records and there are no liens on the properties, but the bank account is empty. Once you sign this, you'll own everything outright, including the empty bank account, he said, handing me a fancy-looking fountain pen, which seemed fitting for the documents I was signing. And there it was, the cloud to the silver lining. It sounded like I might need to sell it or the house after all. How is the bank account empty? I asked. I had zero idea about the profitability of selling cupcakes, but the ingredients were cheap and we bought them in bulk. The cupcake display case was sold out every day since I'd been there. She owned the building outright, so there was no rent to pay, just property taxes and the usual utilities. Where was all the money going? Considering I had a master's degree in forensic accounting, and it was my old job, that was definitely an expense I could save on. Do you think she had a secret Swiss bank account? I asked before signing. Since she attended boarding school there, she might have continued the same account from college. Rich people liked to hide their money overseas in an offshore bank accounts. Part of me was still super elated about the inheritance, and the other part worried that accepting it would be followed by something bad happening. Like finding a magic lamp that granted you all the wishes you asked for, but they all backfired on you. Trust me, I've seen crazier surprises during will readings. At least she didn't leave everything to the cat, he said. That one actually made sense to me. I would leave everything to Lucky with the stipulation that Ruby had to take care of him so that Lucky could enjoy his current state of kitty happiness if I left the earth. I skimmed through all the paperwork as I signed and initialed everywhere, except the last page. Why was Grant's name on the papers? Do I have to share the house and frosted with Grant? Is that what this means? I asked. Charles took the papers I handed back to him and read through it quickly. No, everything is yours free and clear once you sign these papers. I think the lawyer added this as a just-in-case type of clause, he said. Just in case of what? I asked. Would I need to maintain a certain level of revenue or number of customers to keep everything? 
Charles handed the papers back to me and pointed out the paragraph I was worried about. It simply says if you're convicted of killing Francine, that everything reverts to her closest living relative, meaning her brother Grant, he said. I guessed that made sense, but it seemed kind of odd to add to a contract. Is that normally included in an inheritance? I asked. It's common law that a murderer cannot keep property willfully gained as a direct result of the victim, but it is a little odd that she wrote out Grant's name. She's probably the family lawyer, and since you are still a prime suspect, she figured it was easier to add that in, thereby skipping probate court and such, he said. I already knew that. I was working on a plan to find the real killer, so the contract could say whatever it wanted to about me going to jail because I intended to make sure that didn't happen. I finished signing the rest of the papers and handed them back to Charles, who flipped through to verify I signed and initialed everywhere he indicated. Congratulations, he said, shaking my hand. You're now both a business and a homeowner. I'll get these filed right away. This was really happening. I couldn't wait to move into the new house especially since it came with a gate code and an alarm system, more so to escape another ten minutes with Tessa's surprise attack than anything else. How do I get the keys to Francine's house? I asked. Francine was always home when I delivered her dry cleaning or paperwork to her house, so I never needed a set of keys. In fact, I wasn't sure if I remembered where it was or the gate code to get inside. You can pick those up from Wendy this afternoon. She said to come by at 3 p.m. today. Chapter 20 My excitement over inheriting Francine's wardrobe was short-lived as soon as my conscious brain remembered she was a good six inches shorter than me. If micro miniskirts ever came back into fashion, I could totally rock that scene. Ruby would have a field day. She was exactly the same size as Francine. Lucky polished off his kitty lunch in two seconds, while I peeked out the window to see if anyone was there. I had an eerie feeling that I was being watched ever since I left Charles's office in Glendale. That was a good thirty-minute drive of paranoia. I was only half-joking when I requested self-defense classes from Wesley, and I committed it to my future to-do list. No one was in the house, behind it, underneath it, around it, Nearby it. I checked everywhere. It was just my paranoia and me. The front suddenly crashed open and I screamed at the top of my lungs. When I saw it was just Ruby, I remembered that she was staying with me for the week, and I stopped. What was that? she asked. I was reading a horror novel. You scared me when you came in, I said. But you're not holding a book. She said. What was this? The Spanish Book Club Inquisition? I was holding the cat that I somehow scooped up for protection during my mini freakout. I totally should have accepted Natalia's offer to take one of the Labrador puppies. The dog, at least, would have barked to let me know someone was approaching the front door. Fine. You caught me. I was scared. It's your fault for all that talk about a killer being out there. I said. I told you to stop investigating, she said. Now you're going to have nightmares. What are you doing here in the middle of the day? I asked. We used up all of my spirulina smoothie ingredients last night, so I came back here to eat a quick lunch and return afterwards, she said. Did everything go okay at Charles's office? More than okay. You are now looking at the official owner of Frosted and the second biggest mansion in Clover Creek. I said, doing a small twirl for effect. Yes! hollered Ruby, giving me a high five. Let's celebrate with some afternoon desserts! Heck yes! I said, running to the front door to add the deadbolt and the hook to the chain. You could never be too safe. When I came back to the kitchen, Ruby had already set up the Vitamix blender and was mixing spirulina protein powder and almond milk. When she said desserts, I was thinking a big milkshake at the Little Dog Diner, a Snickers Blizzard from Dairy Queen, 
or one of Claire's ice cream sandwiches when I screamed yes. I made a mental note to clarify the definition of the word dessert the next time it came up. Lucky came over to investigate my smoothie, gave it one sniff, made a face and walked away. So much for passing it off to Lucky to drink for me. I bet the yellow lab puppy would have lapped it up. I heard dogs eat anything. It looked like cats possessed a more discerning palate. Lucky would not save me from this. I suppose these are investigation cupcakes, she asked, opening up the box of apple streusel cupcakes I made for Wendy. They're for Wendy when I pick up the keys from her today, I said. Those are her favorite. Plus, I didn't want anything to go wrong this afternoon. The sooner I could get into that new gated house with its fancy alarm system, the better. Should we swing by Claire's and get an ice cream sandwich? I asked, once we got closer to Town Square. I had a sudden need for an ice cream sandwich. Or maybe it was a new daily need. The only problem was Claire. If Ruby went in and ordered instead of me, the ice cream sandwich should definitely cost less than her previous asking price of $5,000. Not that I thought Claire would try the same thing twice, but she didn't seem very happy to see me in her store last time. I'm still so full from that spirulina smoothie, I couldn't possibly eat another bite of anything, she said. Two minutes later, I dropped off Ruby and Lucky at Ruby's office before heading over to Wendy's law office solo. I even put on a new coat and total change of clothes so I could be completely cat hair free and would not set off Wendy's allergies. I pulled out the 12-pack carton of our favorite apple streusel cupcakes and marched inside. All the office doors were open and it didn't look like there was anyone else in the office today, just Wendy. I found her office at the very back. It was even larger than the conference room. It had its own private bathroom and a separate back entrance. It wasn't nearly as nice as Niles' sleek and modern decor, but it was just as big. Are these for me? asked Wendy, seeing the distinct cupcake box I was holding. Yes, and anyone else who's in the office, I said. It's just me. Everyone went to a boring divorce law seminar, said Wendy. You didn't want to join? I heard those can be quite lucrative, I said. They were extremely popular in San Diego with all of its cursed romances. Too much drama for me. I'd rather stick with defending really rich criminals. Are these apple streusel? She asked, eagerly picking one up and biting into it. Yes, I hope that flavor's okay. I can whip something else up for you next time if you want to change, I said. You're an angel. I love anything apple. In fact, maybe you could make one that tastes like apple fritters, or have apple crumble topping on the inside, or apple cobbler, or those apple pie pastries you can buy at the Stop and Shop, she suggested. Who knew Wendy was such an apple aficionado? Well, those are actually really good ideas. Do you care if I write them down? I asked, poking through my purse for a pen and paper that didn't exist. I really needed to carry those. Here, use mine, she said, handing me her yellow legal pad and pen. Did you ever suggest these to Francine? I asked. I loved apple pie just as much as the next person, but I never really took my apple dessert ideas beyond that. I was too busy concocting other caramel and chocolate-based combinations. But these were perfect ideas for someone who loved fruit-based desserts like Wendy. She said my ideas were stupid and I should stick to what I knew, the law, and leave the baking to her, she said. That sounded about right. Why not insult your lawyer along with the rest of the town? Well, I for one think your ideas are brilliant and love that you shared them with me, I said. Wendy smiled, which was the first time I ever saw her so happy. I'd only seen her a total of maybe five times, including today, but each time she seemed sad, worried, or annoyed. I ripped off the top page of her legal pad and tucked it away in my purse before handing the pad back to her. Here are your keys, said Wendy. 
I've emailed your lawyer all of the bank insurance and vendor financials for the business. And here's everything you need for the house. I've already transferred all the utilities and title into your name. I registered your information with the security company. The alarm passcode for the house is your birthday. And here's their customer service line so you can reset it tomorrow to something a little less obvious. Yikes! This was really happening. I did a little squeak on the inside. Thanks for everything. This is the best thing that's ever happened to me, I said. And just for the record, I swear I didn't kill Francine. I know, she said, which was surprising. Aside from Ruby and Grandpa Lockwood, finding people who believed in my innocence was in short supply. Did Francine ever mention a family recipe book? I asked. It was a long shot that Francine shared her extortion and bribery schemes with her lawyer. But you never knew. It didn't hurt to ask. Recipe book detailing how to make frosted cupcakes? She asked. Kind of. It was missing right before she died and pretty important to her. It was given to her by her grandmother. I said. Wendy shook her head no. If she didn't know that, then maybe she at least had some insight into why Francine left me her most expensive possessions. Why do you think Francine left me everything? That's so odd considering she barely knew me. It sounds like she wanted to leave it to her Swiss boarding school as an alumni gift. As her lawyer, why didn't you try to talk her out of leaving everything to a complete stranger? I asked. It was now or never to interrogate Wendy. She had to know more than she was letting on. She shrugged her shoulders. It's not my job to question a client's wishes. And even if I had an opinion, Francine was always the last one who wanted to hear it. Did Grant find it odd? I'd hate to think he had any hard feelings and I didn't do anything about it. Maybe I should just hand over the business and the house to him, since he's her real family and I barely even know her. I asked. The thought crossed my mind multiple times. What if Francine were delirious when she wrote up the will? What if she were multitasking like she normally did and never meant to write my name down in the will at all? Wouldn't abdicating everything back to Grant be the right thing to do? Wendy tensed up when I mentioned Grant. Why? Did he say something to you? She asked. No, he was actually super friendly about it. But maybe he was just being polite, and you had the inside scoop on the truth? I asked. I don't have the inside scoop on anything, so you can stop interrogating me, she said. Oops. It looks like I offended her, which was too bad. It seemed like I was starting to make some progress. Maybe if she knew me better, or I could loosen her up in a less stuffy and formal environment, she'd be more open to chatting. Hey, Ruby and I are going to get a drink to celebrate tonight. Why don't you come and join us? I asked. Another plus was, I needed all the friends I could get. Having another lawyer on my side couldn't hurt, especially since Wendy probably had answers to questions I didn't even know I had yet regarding Frosted and the new house. But most of all, because she looked just as lonely as I felt when I first moved back here. It wasn't easy making friends as an adult. Oh, that's very nice of you, she said, clearly in shock. Well, I, um, I don't think I can. I have a late night meeting. I'm not sure if I can move. And there it was again, another smile. I waited for an answer, but there was just more stammering of excuses, followed by maybes, ending in no. If you change your mind, we'll be at Lava Lounge which is the only bar in all of Clover Creek, so it should be easy to remember, I said before turning to leave. I was almost out the door when Wendy chased after me. Hey, Ava, there's something I should tell you. Yes, I asked, turning around. She was about to talk until she saw something in the distance that seemed to change her mind. I just wanted to say good luck with everything, she said. She gave me a weak smile and headed back to her office. Chapter 21 Pulling up to Francine's house was like pulling up to a castle, 
surrounded by a moat of the world's most intricate landscaping ever. Would I have to hire a gardener? Would he be a hot gardener that Ruby would hit on every day, who'd report me for employee sexual harassment? Ruby let out a small whistle of appreciation. This place could be on that reality TV show about rich people, she said when we reached the front gates. I can't believe you own it. Unless I go to prison for murder, I said. I hadn't heard from Wesley since this morning, which could mean nothing. But since he hadn't called to give me the all-clear sign on the murder charges, that meant I was still their prime suspect. I pulled out the clicker from the envelope Wendy gave me and hit it. Like a fairy tale, the gate slowly opened like two French double doors. The magic ended as soon as Tessa popped out of the bushes with her cameraman and lighting equipment. How did that news reporter always seem to know where to find me? We're live with Ava Decker tonight in Clover Creek. Ava just came from Wendy Roberts' law office, presumably to sign the final inheritance papers and get the keys that would make all of this opulent luxury hers. Miss Decker, she said, pushing the microphone towards the car window that I kept closed. Did you kill Francine Donovan so that you could take over her life and have this beautiful house all to yourself? I looked but did not see Wesley coming to my rescue. No comment, yelled Ruby at the camera. We saw you going into Wendy's office, Tessa said while Ruby leaned over and rolled up the driver's side window, cutting Tessa off. Tessa pulled out a cell phone, held it up to the front window and played a clip of me going inside Wendy's office with a timestamp on the bottom right. Still no comment, Tessa asked. I rolled down the window and let her put the mic in front of me. I was sick of always being on the defensive and running. You know what, Tessa? I do have a comment. About you. I'm really disappointed in you. I thought you were a good investigative reporter. I didn't kill Francine and instead of finding other clues or possible suspects, you just keep harassing me for a confession. You know what they call that? I'll tell you. Lazy reporting. Quit being so lazy, Tessa, and do your job right, or don't do it at all. I said as I rolled up the window before she could answer. Tessa gasped and stepped back. The cameraman was still standing in front of the car, blocking our way. I reached down and honked the horn, which startled him so he finally moved. I drove forward and the gates closed behind us, locking them out. Who needed Wesley when you had yourself? Where did that come from? Ruby asked once we were clear of them. On the Hallmark Mystery Channel, Aurora Tea Garden's best friend is the reporter covering the murder. The reporter is supposed to help in the investigation, not waste time throwing around useless accusations, I said. Got it. So you're like a mystery movie director? Just letting Tessa know she wasn't playing her role correctly? She asked. I bet Tessa helped solve the case with us, I said. That might have been a stretch, but at least it got Tessa off my trail for a minute. We drove up the semi-circular driveway to the main doors. The front door had one of those fake front doors. They led to a small pond with some concrete steps before the real front door to the house. Francine said she saw it in a Hollywood celebrity home tour last year and had one added to her house as soon as she returned. When we got to the second door, I almost rang the doorbell out of habit. It had one of those fancy electronic locks that worked with magnets. I held it up and heard the lock slide to the side as I turned the handle. I'd been here before, but opening it for the first time as my own place felt completely different. Ruby immediately ran from room to room exclaiming, Oh my gosh! In each one. Lucky was a little more cautious, but still eager to explore. I pulled up the Zillow listing for the house, having only ever been in the foyer in Francine's bedroom. According to Zillow, it had five bedrooms, eight bathrooms, a study, an exercise room, and a full outdoor patio and kitchen for entertaining. At 10,000 square feet, this place was bigger than some of the motels I stayed at. 
And who would clean all of those rooms? About 30 seconds after entering, a loud alarm went off and the lights started rapidly blinking on and off. No, it's just the alarm. I forgot to enter the code, I said, running over to the front door. The alarm code panel looked pretty straightforward. I entered my birthday, but nothing happened. My birthday was on the 5th, so maybe 5 was a 2-digit code instead of a 1-digit code? I couldn't remember if Wendy mentioned how many total digits it was. I tried, but nothing seemed to work. Ruby was behind me now. Why isn't it turning off? She screamed, with her hands over her ears. I don't know. Wendy said the code was my birthday, but I entered it and nothing happened. It just keeps saying incorrect code, try again. I replied, pointing to the display screen that seemed to be mocking me. Here, let me try, said Ruby. November 5th, I said. I've been celebrating your birthday with you for almost 30 years now. I know when your birthday is, she said. She typed it in as a four-digit code of 1105 and a three-digit code of 115. Neither worked for her either. Maybe it's one of those fancy European alarms where you put the date in first and then the month? She asked, typing it in that way with both the four-digit and the three-digit formats. Hold on, Wendy gave me the phone number for the alarm company, I said. I'll call them now. I searched through the documents she gave me for the house. There were so many. It was just paper after paper of random information. I was halfway through the stack and still couldn't find it. Lucky was totally freaking out. For the first time ever, he voluntarily jumped back into his carrier and had his little head tucked underneath his paws. Between the surprise attack interview from Tessa to the ceaseless alarm, it didn't seem like a good start to my inheriting the house. Maybe we should just leave and fix this tomorrow, suggested Ruby. She zipped up Lucky's carrier and grabbed her purse. I wasn't sure what else to do and grabbed mine and the papers as I followed her out. We got into the car just as Grant pulled up. What's going on? asked Grant. The alarm company called me when they couldn't reach you. I'm still listed as the backup contact. We can't get the alarm to turn off. Wendy said it was my birthday, but maybe it wasn't reset correctly? I yelled. The alarm was still blaring outside. All right, I'll try the old code and see if that works, said Grant, already barreling inside. We left Lucky in the car and followed behind him. Grant punched in a few numbers and the alarm went off. I'd never been so happy to hear silence. We all heaved a collective sigh of relief. I slumped down on the couch and kicked my Uggs off. That was so stressful. Maybe I'd get the alarm taken out altogether. Looks like there was a screw-up at the security company in updating the code, he said, shrugging his shoulders. Thanks for coming over. We were just about to leave, said Ruby, slumping down into the opposite chair from mine. Hey, how did you get here so quickly? Isn't your place all the way on the opposite side of town? I asked. Not that I wasn't grateful, but even his dealership was a good 15 minutes away. The alarm only went off for five minutes at most before we packed up to leave. Even with zero traffic, it still would have taken him at least 15 minutes to get here. Do not interrogate my number one client, Ruby interjected. Interrogate? Grant asked. Against my better judgment, Ava has taken it upon herself to investigate your sister's murder, said Ruby. Please tell her it's dangerous and she should be more like you and let the police handle it. Oh my gosh, I forgot about Lucky. He's still in the back of the car, I said, sitting up to put my Uggs back on. Who's Lucky? asked Grant. Your sister's cat. She inherited him too, said Ruby. Grant jumped up right away. Stay, relax. I can go get the cat for you, he said. Maybe chivalry wasn't dead. I could see what Claire saw in Grant. He was very attentive and kind, but also a potential murder suspect. What are you doing? He's on the whiteboard as a suspect, 
I whispered to Ruby. And I already told you that he's loaded. There's no reason for him to murder his sister, she said. Half-sister? And we don't know if it was money-related, I said. Here you go, said Grant, dropping Lucky's carrier off in the foyer. The maid was here yesterday. I had her clean the entire house and change all the sheets for you so it's fresh and ready for occupancy. I could not afford a maid, especially not one who could clean something of this magnitude. Suddenly, I felt like I didn't belong here. That was very thoughtful of you. I'm so sorry. I feel like I should be doing things for you. Your sister died and here you are helping me. The person who basically took what should rightfully be yours away from you. I said, if you want the bakery in the house, you can have them. I feel weird taking them anyway. There, I said it. A selfish part of me wanted to keep everything and sum it up to cosmic karma. I could easily justify the universe owing it to me, but Grant did nothing wrong and this should have been his. I was an only child and my parents were poor, but if we were loaded and I had a brother who died, I want to make sure I got everything especially from someone accused of being the murderer. Don't be silly. I loved my sister very much, and if her last dying wish was for you to have the house and carry on her bakery, then that's what I want too, he said. Tears were welling up in my eyes and threatening to spill over. I was about to hug him when he announced, I'm going to be late for dinner with Claire, so I'll talk to you later. Ugh, Claire the ice cream maker whose ice cream cookies I couldn't stop eating. I wished she didn't have it out for me. I couldn't go back to grocery store ice cream now even if I wanted to. It would pale in comparison to the greatness of Claire's ice cream cookie concoctions. I don't think Claire likes me, I said, hoping that Grant would elaborate. You can ignore her. Claire's been off her meds lately, he said. Meds? I said. Oh, I thought Francine told you, said Grant. Francine did say Claire was crazy, but I thought she meant in the general sense, not an actual psychologically dependent upon drugs kind of crazy. She's bipolar and when she gets off her meds, it can get scary. Please don't tell her that I told you, he said. That explained a lot. I hope she's back on them, I asked. Yes, it's a condition I had for dating her. We've been very on and off again lately. She's not a bad person, but when she's not on them, it can be hard to find her lovable, he said. Maybe Grant was the best catch in all of Clover Creek. He did own the biggest mansion in the entire town, as well as the only luxury sports car dealership in all of Blueberry Bay. I was surprised Ruby and her boy craziness didn't try to make a move on him all these years especially if she knew how large his financial portfolio was. Well, it sounds like she's lucky to have you. Hey, before you go, I meant to ask you about the recipe book that her grandmother handed down to Francine. I think that's what might have gotten her killed, I said. Grant started laughing. She and my grandmother wished it possessed that kind of power. It was a meaningless book of silly woman's gossip. Just stupid stuff like the mailman likes to read everyone's magazines during his lunch break before delivering them, or that our neighbor is going gray and covers it up with cheap home hair dye. It was more of a memento of what a busybody your grandmother was, he said. That's odd. The person I spoke to seemed pretty worked up over it. They thought it possessed the deepest dark secrets, I said. Not to mention, Francine herself seemed pretty upset over not being able to find it. The look on the cat breeder's face when I told her I didn't have the recipe book was that of sheer panic. Natalia wanted that book secured and fast. Francine was willing to fight Claire to the death over it. It was more sentimental than anything else to Francine. Our grandmother died in this house when it caught on fire. Everything she owned was reduced to ashes. The only thing that survived was the recipe book. Francine had it with her at the bakery. That's all she had to remember her grandmother and why Francine wanted to keep this house, he said. She rebuilt it all from scratch. That made sense now why the exterior of the mansion looked so outdated. 
but the interior was sleek and modern, like Niles' law office. Part of me was happy knowing the outside still looked like it fit the rest of the neighborhood, with its 1950s brick and wrought iron gate out front. Chapter 22 like most of my let's party it up plans, tonight's lost out to our desire for sleep. Exploring the house was an adventure all of its own. Instead of going out to the lava lounge, we ordered a pizza and fell asleep at the house. The room I picked had an actual veranda attached to it that overlooked the backyard. I'd only ever seen views like that in movies. It even had a secret safe in it, hidden behind a painting. Lucky helped knock down the painting, otherwise I would have never found it. I made a note to ask Wendy or Grant about it the next day. Ruby and I were all set to sleep there for the night until we remembered that Lucky's litter box was still back at the house, as well as all of our belongings, toothbrushes, and everything else we needed for living. So we headed back after picking out our favorite rooms. Ruby insisted on having her own designated guest room for sleepovers. Instead of sleeping in, I sprang up at 6 a.m. with Ruby for her morning run, which, based on my fitness level, was more of a walk, with a little bit of running interspersed. Today would be a fabulous day. First, I held the title of my own house, and not just any house, but a local mansion with a moat around the front door. Second, Wesley texted late last night, that they had Melinda in custody based on new information, and I should come down to the station. And third, the handyman was finishing up all the repairs today and had new keys waiting for me at the bakery. Today was destined to be the beginning of my amazing new life. I didn't even mind having to endure another spirulina smoothie. After secretly tossing the second half of my smoothie down the garbage disposal, I stopped by the deli for a cheesy egg sandwich and some hash browns. Then I took off for Wendy's office. I tried out one of her new apple cupcake suggestions this morning and was excited to share it with her. Plus, she might know what was in the safe, even if she didn't know the combination. Just like yesterday, all the doors in Wendy's office were closed except for hers. It looked like the divorce law seminar was still in progress and she was the only one holding down the fort. Hey, Wendy, it's Ava. I hope you didn't end up going to the lava lounge last night. Ruby and I totally crashed early and didn't go out at all. I called out. There was no response. Maybe she was in the bathroom? I walked into her office, but it was empty. The cupcakes I brought to her yesterday were still in their box on her desk. She really should have put those in the fridge. I failed to mention that to her. They would last longer that way, especially since they were fruit-based. Wendy? I asked, once I saw what looked like her leg peeking out from the side of her desk on the ground. Please don't be dead, I said more to myself than anyone. I was afraid to look, but I couldn't stop myself. Plus, what if she was just hurt and needed help? As I rounded the corner... The chances of that were even slimmer than before. She was staring straight at the ceiling, eyes and mouth wide open. I checked her pulse anyway, just to be safe. Nope. No pulse. I jumped back away from the desk, as if death might be contagious. I felt dizzy, like I was going to faint, and I sat in the hallway. I waited for the white spots to go away before finally gathering myself enough to pull out my phone and call Wesley. It's Ava. You need to get down to Wendy's office right away. She's been hurt. Who's Wendy? He asked. You know, Wendy Roberts, Francine's attorney. I came here to give her a cupcake. It was a new recipe she suggested I check out, and I also had a question about the safe. So I'm here and I think she's dead. I said in a really fast jumble of words. Go outside and wait for me. I'll be right there, he said. I was already moving towards the front door. Being here alone with a dead body was too much for me. If Wendy weren't allergic to cats, I'd at least have brought Lucky with me. But he was still back home. And Ava? 
he asked. Yes, I asked. Should I send an ambulance or the coroner? He asked. I took a deep breath and said, The coroner. Chapter 23 Three hours later, I was sitting in the same interrogation room as before when Francine's body was discovered, but this time without a lawyer or Charles. I told him everything I knew and relayed my steps for the last 24 hours back to them. So it looks like Melinda is a serial killer? I asked. Did two murders qualify someone to serial killer status? He took a big inhale and held his breath before answering. We got the toxicology report back. Wendy was poisoned. All of those cupcakes you gave her came back positive for the same poison that killed her, he said. That's impossible. I don't even own poison, I said. Plus, I ate one of those cupcakes myself. All right, maybe I ate two. Or three. The point is, I wouldn't poison myself. I'm still alive. So you put the poison in afterwards, he said. But why would I kill her? She gave me the keys to my new dream house and frosted, I said. I was really grateful and happy with her. Why would I kill someone who was so nice to me? Exactly. She was no longer any use to you, so you decided to offer, he said. Someone is definitely setting me up, I said. But who? I was barely back home long enough to annoy anyone, much less have them hate me so much to go to all this trouble. He laughed. I've never heard that one before. But what about Melinda? I asked. I think she killed Francine and now Wendy. Melinda has been in police custody since noon yesterday, so it couldn't have been her, said Wesley. She admitted trashing Frosted, so we're booking her for breaking and entering, property damage and vandalism. After I filed the insurance claim, I forgot all about the vandalism. Ruby made sure that everything was covered and then some. Can you let her go? I'm going to drop the charges, I said. Why would you do that? He asked. Francine was unfairly trying to coerce Melinda into giving her a huge discount for the work she did. I would have done the same thing if I were Melinda. Please just let her go, I said. I knew evil and Melinda wasn't evil. In fact, she was actually very sweet and meant well. I was still confused on how her nail decor ended up in the cupcake truck if she weren't the murderer. As if reading the frown furrow lines on my forehead, Wesley interjected with an answer. Did you know that Melinda and Francine got into a physical altercation earlier that night? Apparently that's what cut her blind date short. She lost a nail fighting with Francine, and her nail must have been stuck in Francine's hair or her clothes at the time of the murder, and that's how it ended up in the cupcake truck. Will you tell Melinda she's free to go? I asked. Of course, if that's what you want, said Wesley. But she did confess to the vandalism. It was done long before Francine was dead. I already called Ruby, who called you a lawyer, who's working on bail for you right now. We have an ironclad case against you for this murder, which only makes you look even guiltier for the other murder, Wesley said. Just when I thought things couldn't get any worse. Chapter 24 after thanking Charles profusely for getting me out of jail for the second time in less than a week, Ruby and I returned to the drawing board, which was the suspect whiteboard back at her office. We crossed off Melinda, Wendy, and Natalia from the suspect list. That only left us with Grant, Niles and his mother, and Claire. With me as the lead suspect for the second murder, it didn't look like any police resources would be used for investigating Wendy's death. I took a picture of the whiteboard and then erased it. Are you giving up already? Ruby asked. Not at all. There was this episode on murder she wrote where she thought she solved the case until a second body turned up, just like ours. Melinda was in custody when Wendy was killed, so Melinda couldn't have been the killer unless she had an accomplice. 
We need to recreate the suspect whiteboard from scratch for the second victim, Wendy. We have to assume these two murders were connected. And wherever the overlap is, that's our killer or killers, I said. That was easier said than done. I knew even less about Wendy than I did about Francine. We barely know anything about Wendy, Ruby said. We both sat down at the conference room table and scrunched our foreheads in deep thought. Maybe the husband did it? Her firm is Roberts and Roberts Esquire. Maybe her husband wanted to offer and keep all the clients and money to himself? She said. The second Roberts on the law firm name is her brother, and he was away with the rest of the legal team at the divorce law seminar. I said. I sighed and started petting Lucky. Did I have it in me to start an entire murder investigation from scratch again? This was starting to feel hopeless. All right, I'm ready, said Ruby, standing up and putting on her coat. Ready for what? I asked. You know, to see what Grant's alibi really is, she said. If it comes down to keeping our most valuable client or keeping my best friend out of jail, I obviously choose you. Now it was my turn to give Ruby one of her signature bear hugs. I threw on my coat, tucked Lucky into his kitty yarn, and we headed out to Grant's dealership. Grant's dealership was on the edge of town. It wasn't like most dealerships with a huge lot of cars in a parking lot. Instead, it was a massively large showroom encased in all glass from floor to ceiling. I never drove by this part of town and never had the slightest urge to purchase a luxury vehicle of any kind, so this was all new to me. Many of the cars were on elevated, round display turntables, floating in the sky or at eye level. I brought three cases of all different cupcake flavors with me. There were plenty of men dressed in what looked like expensive Italian suits, asking us what car we were interested in. Ruby took all of their cards. Are you in the market for a sports car? I asked. It would match her office and new house interior. No, but none of them are wearing wedding rings, and they're all very handsome. I'm going to ask Gwendolyn to look into doing some matchmaking for me, she said. Gwendolyn would love that. She left two voicemails on my phone telling me she found someone, but with everything going on, I didn't call her back yet. Ladies, can I interest you in this year's new Ferrari? It comes in cherry red and yellow, asked a fourth salesman. I held out the cupcake boxes. Is there somewhere I can put these? I brought all of Grant's favorite cupcakes and a few others. I think he puts them on display for customers. He motioned over towards a large table full of car brochure information near the entrance. Grant is pulling up right now if you want to talk to him he said. I ran up to greet him at the front door, hoping he would be happy to see me. He got out and flashed his normal Hollywood smile. Ouch, that dent looks pretty wicked, I said, pointing to the unseemly crinkle in the passenger side door of the car. Yes, it's the new transport company we started using earlier this year. They claim they arrived from the factory in Italy like that but I think it was the transport company's fault. You'd think they'd be more careful, right? He asked. I knew nothing about cars, except that men seemed to be obsessed with them. Can you return it? Or do you get a price break for damaged cars? I asked. Meh, he said, shrugging his shoulders. It's covered by insurance. Oh, that's good, I said. Duh, Ava. Everyone has car insurance, especially car dealers. He's insured through Hardison Insurance, Ruby interjected. Of course, they're the best insurance agency around, he said. I wouldn't go anywhere else. All of those expensive sports car claims must have been killing her business. I was surprised she was doing so well. It was a real shame to have a big, unseemly dent like that in such a pretty car. Not that I wanted one, but I could definitely see the appeal. Cars for men were probably like shoes for women. 
Something pretty and stylish to make you feel prettier when you went out and about during the day. This one even had a cute horse symbol on it. Grant caught me checking out the car. Do you like? I can give you a special deal since it's damaged, he offered. Like the special deal you gave to Wendy? I asked. Yes, like that. It's awful what happened to her. I heard you found the body, he said, turning somber. Yes, it was pretty terrible. Were you two dating in between when you were dating Claire? I asked. He shook his head no. Poor Wendy. She had a crush on me and I didn't want to hurt her feelings, so I offered to fix the dent in her car for free, and she mistook that as a Valentine's Day gift. That was interesting. Wendy didn't strike me as someone delusional or slightly off. Not like Claire. A little haughty, perhaps, but not someone who would fabricate an entire relationship. Plus, she was gorgeous. She could have had any guy she wanted. Did you see Wendy yesterday? I asked. I haven't seen her since the will reading. She was supposed to drop her car off at the shop today, he said. I shared with him what I found out about Melinda and the vandalism. Did you know that Melinda might have been the last person to see Francine alive that night? I asked. I had no idea, he said with a shrug. She didn't try to call or contact you? If I had just been attacked, I might want to call my brother for help, I said. Were you not available that night? I knew he wasn't with Claire because she was serving ice cream at a wedding. I was here at the dealership. We'd just gotten another shipment of damaged cars, and I was arguing with the transport company over it, he said. Ruby pointed to the surveillance cameras all over the dealership. Of course he had a time-stamped alibi, just like everyone else. Chapter 25 We headed back to Francine's house to look for clues. Unfortunately, the cleaning crew Grant hired did such a great job. Even if there were a clue in here, it was gone now. I hadn't noticed before, but the entire house smelled of bleach. There was a weird beeping coming from the front door. Is that the alarm system again? Asked Ruby, already covering her ears and bracing for the worst. No, I think that's a doorbell. I said, running over to the front. A screen lit up next to the alarm pad and showed the front gate. There was a big van at the front with the words, Goldie Locks, written across the side. Ruby came up and looked over my shoulder. That's the locksmith. Let her in. I asked her to swing by here to see if she could open that safe for us, she said. I hit the only button that said open and hoped it would work. All three of us stood at the front door to greet her. Lucky missed his calling as a puppy. He ran right up to her and started sniffing when she exited her van. Goldilocks was the perfect name for her business. She had curly, bright blonde hair and looked more like a supermodel than a locksmith. Thanks so much for making a house call, said Ruby, stepping back to let her pass. She had a small suitcase on wheels that she brought in with her. No problem. You said you could pay double, right? She asked. Of course. Look at the house we live in. We can pay triple, said Ruby. I gave her a look, and she quickly corrected herself. But since we already agreed to double, we'll just limit it to that, she said, giving the locksmith the thumbs up. Has anyone ever told you that you don't really look like a locksmith? I asked. She whipped a can out of her right pocket. I have mace, and I'm not afraid to use it, she said. I threw both hands in the air. She probably got hit on a lot. This wasn't a problem I had often in life, or ever. The safe is right up here, I said, tiptoeing past her as quickly as possible to lead her up the stairs. She took one look at the safe and laughed. I can't open this, she said. It's a Von Bursten Fortress safe. It's programmed to self-destruct if anyone tries to open it. Self-destruct? Like that movie with the spies? It's just a box. It can't be that hard to break into. That's impossible, 
It's just a steel box. Can't you take a saw or something to slice the door off? I asked. I could feel the recipe book inside there, calling to me. This is a special German-built safe. It has 360-degree pressure sensors all around it. If they are tampered with in any way, a small explosion goes off inside the safe, possibly destroying all of the contents. If you have diamonds or jewelry, they will probably survive the explosion. Do you still want me to open it? She asked. Ruby shook her head no. No, I think there are papers in there, so no, that wouldn't help. I said. We walked her out to the front, where she handed us a bill for $300. But you didn't open the safe, I protested, holding the bill up trying to give it back to her. Standard house visits are 150 You said you'd pay double, she said, holding up her mace bottle. It seemed wrong, but I guessed, technically, she did drive out here. And did I really want to make a mace-toting locksmith angry? Cash or credit? I asked. Chapter 26 I pulled Chloe's card out of my purse and called her for help. I only just met her, so I felt weird asking for a favor, but I was desperate now. Ruby went back to the office, so it was just Lucky and me. Hey, Chloe, it's Ava from the other day with the cat Lucky. Oh, do you need a cat sitter? She asked. No, I need a locksmith. Any chance you know how to break into a safe? I can break into anything, she said with complete confidence. But it's a special Von Bursten Fortress super safe that's booby-trapped to explode the contents if it's forced open. I ran upstairs and texted her back a picture of the logo on the front. I've always wanted to break into one of those. Do you know how bored I've been since I moved back to Clover Creek? Between the Clover Leaf afternoon tea outings, working the receptionist's desk for Niles and his mother, I could use a little explosion in my life, she said. That's great! I can pay you. Are you kidding? I should be paying you for saving me from another boring day. Send me the address and I'll be right over. I closed my eyes and gave the universe a grateful high five. The day started out pretty terrible, but at least it was finally starting to turn. If that recipe blackmail book was in the safe, this could change everything. In normal clothes, Chloe looked like a thief. She wore black skinny jeans, black boots, a black jacket, and matching black gloves and a scarf. When she took off her jacket, she had a black turtleneck underneath. She saw me checking out her outfit as she took it off in the foyer. I like to get into character when I break into safes, like I'm a superhero locksmith, she said. Who was I to judge? It was a cute outfit, and if it helped her break into the safe faster, then even better. I like it. It's a good look for you, I said. Wearing those stuffy suits every day is not me. Nona was so excited about shopping for my new wardrobe. I thought we'd never leave the mall in Bangor, she said. You can always wear whatever you want around me. Thanks so much for coming over to do this. You have no idea how much I appreciate it, I said. Don't worry, I know you're innocent. Anyone who loves kittens can't be guilty. Animal lovers just don't kill people, she said. I had no idea where that logic came from, but it sounded good to me. If only she could convince her Uncle Wesley of that. She let out a loud whistle as I walked her up to Francine's master bedroom where the safe was. This is like a palace. It doesn't look that big from the outside. It was built into a hill, so it looked like a modest two-story house from the front, but was at least five stories from the back. Yes, I can't believe she left it to me. I've never owned anything this nice, I said. Chloe glided up the stairs two steps at a time, while I held onto the railing for dear life. The clear glass staircase still freaked me out. Being afraid of heights my whole life, this wasn't helping. They were made of thick glass and held in place by suspension cables. 
It was supposed to look like a floating staircase, but it felt more like I was walking on nothing but air. Chloe opened her bag and pulled out a stethoscope, electric drills, a saw, and some other tools I didn't recognize. Lucky jumped into her arms and started purring. I'd love to hang out with you anytime, but the purring will throw off my work, she said, gently placing him on the ground. I scooped him up. How about a latte? I asked. She nodded. Sounds great. Regular 2% milk okay? I asked. She gave me the thumbs up. I closed the door and left her to her work while I brought Lucky downstairs to help me steam the milk. Ruby and I picked up a few things at the stop and shop on our way back from Grant's dealership. I just finished steaming the lattes and was about to add some froth when Chloe came bounding down the stairs, holding a big leather-bound journal in her hands. I did it, she said, placing it down in front of me. That was amazing. You're a locksmith genius, I said. I ran over and gave her one of Ruby's signature bear hugs, never more grateful to have so much help. Oh yeah, it was no biggie. I haven't met a lock or a safe I couldn't break into yet, she said. I put the milk back in the fridge, which somehow knew how much I used. Francine, would you like me to order more milk for you? asked Bixby. Who? Who was that? asked Chloe. I am Bixby, your smart refrigerator, it answered. It took me a while to get used to it, too. I have no idea how to shut it off or reprogram it, I said. I hadn't even tried to look for the owner's manual. I was sure it was online somewhere, but it wasn't a priority. Hearing it call you Francine is a little creepy, said Chloe. Do you think it's listening to us? Are you listening to us, Bixby? I asked. I record all sounds and store them to your cloud, Bixby replied. Wonderful, I said. That was embarrassing. There were probably hours and hours of sound clips of me talking to Lucky. I was mortified just thinking about it. Who's a cute little bitty kitty? You are. I handed her one of the lattes and pulled up a chair at Francine's Island. I couldn't believe I was finally holding it. A super old journal with the pages practically falling out. The front read in fancy calligraphy, Donovan's Secret Recipe Book. I flipped it open and just like Grant said, it was filled with silly small town gossip. Lots of cheating scandals and secret friendships. It even had some pictures to accompany the stories. It was started in the 1980s when her grandmother must have been in her heyday of small town surveillance. I skipped ahead to the last few pages. Those would have the murder suspects on them. The last three entries were dated a week ago, right before Francine died. They said, Natalia Sabine is a fake. She always makes sure to sleep with the cat show judges the night before the contest to help increase her chances of winning. Her Abyssinian cats haven't been show quality in years. When she needs a show quality cat, she has to buy it from another breeder. Wendy has a crush on Grant. She thinks I don't know, but she's clearly jealous of his on-again, off-again relationship with Claire. She's so in love with him, she's even helping him with his insurance fraud. He's in cahoots with the transport company. They purposely damage the cars during shipment, and then he files a claim and Wendy helps cover it up for him. Grant has an elaborate insurance fraud scam going. Luxury car sales haven't been doing all that well in Tiny Clover Creek. Why he thought anyone here could afford them is beyond me. He wants me to sell Frosted to help fund his car obsessions. He thinks I owe it to him because Francine was his grandmother too. But he never once came to visit her while she was alive. He only cares about the money. I read it twice and passed it over to Chloe to read. No wonder Francine was dying to get her hands on the recipe book. I snapped a picture of the entry and texted it to Wesley with the message, I've cracked the case. Chapter 27 
Chloe offered to stay behind and watch Lucky while I took the book to Wesley. She wanted to see if she could find the cloud storage recordings Bixby was talking about. Bixby might have recorded Francine's murder. I was certain she was murdered here in her own house. It would be the only explanation why Grant would clean and bleach an entire house out of the goodness of his heart. Tessa and her camera crew were waiting for me outside the gate. This time, I did stop and talk to her. I suppose you're here to accuse me of murder again for the third time in a row? I asked. No, I took your advice and did some research on my own. First, why did you drop the charges against Melinda Interior Design for vandalizing Frosted? She asked, shoving the mic in my face. Melinda was a victim of Francine's overzealous attempts to get an unfair discount for the excellent interior design work that Melinda did for the bakery. Her work was Instagram-worthy and absolutely stunning, and I look forward to seeing it all reinstated back to its original glory when we reopen, I said. It felt nice to help undo some of the damage that Francine caused. That's very benevolent of you. And what about Wendy dying from your poisoned cupcakes? Do you think people will be afraid to come to Frosted because of that? She asked. Just when I thought Tessa made a turn for the positive. While you were busy not doing your job, I discovered who the real murderer is. I said, holding up Francine's recipe book. My phone rang. I looked down. It was Wesley. Now's not a really good time, I said instead of hello. Yes, I can see that. You're live on the news right now, said Wesley. We're live? I asked Tessa. Yes, and waiting for your explanation on why you'd kill Wendy Roberts, your lawyer, said Tessa, reaching across and pushing the mic into my face again. First, stop revealing key murder investigation details on TV. Second, tell her to get out of your car, remind her that this is private property, and come down to the police station. I don't understand why you stopped, said Wesley. It's not my fault. She started out nice, I said. Stop talking to me and get yourself off live news, said Wesley before hanging up. What is that book you have there? Is that a confession from the murderer? asked Tessa. Pretty much, I said as I rolled up my window and drove away. My phone rang again. I did what you said and drove away from Tessa, I said. This is Grant. My heart leapt into my throat. Hearing his voice on the speaker in the car scared me. It was like he was right next to me. Hey, Grant, long time no see. What's shaking, Bacon? Even as I said the words... I knew they held no humorous value at all, but I was so nervous I couldn't stop myself. Ruby and I saw you on the news, he said. Darned Tessa and her stupid live news camera crew? Why did I open my big mouth? Now he knew. Unless you want me to kill your friend, you better bring that recipe book straight here, he said. Please don't hurt her. I'll be right there, I said. And don't try calling the police for help, or she's dead, he said. How come the one time that I was speeding and didn't want to get caught, I got pulled over by Wesley on my way to the baking contest? Then the only time I want to get pulled over for speeding, there's not a single cop in sight. I was doing 60 in a 30. I parked illegally on the curb in front of Ruby's building. If I couldn't get a ticket for speeding... Maybe someone would at least come inside and ask why my car was parked on the curb. For the first time ever, the receptionist was gone for the night. It was pretty late, but he was usually always there. I went up to the fourth floor penthouse where I found Grant, holding a gun on Ruby. He had her tied up and duct taped to her office chair. You're finally here, he said, redirecting the gun towards me. We don't all drive Ferraris, I said, putting my hands in the air. My go-to response for danger was always to make light of the situation. I didn't seem to amuse anyone with my stand-up routine. Is that the recipe book? 
he asked, looking down at my hands. If you're referring to the book that implicates you for insurance fraud and using Wendy to help you cover it all up, then yes, this is it, I said. Well, there's no reason to be rude about it, he said. I did have Wendy bequeath you the bakery in the house. You could show a little more gratitude. As if. What kind of delusional narcissist was he? The bakery that you told Claire you would give to her once you framed me for murder? I asked. And the house that you'd get anyway once I was in jail? Minor details, he said with a casual shrug. Hand it over. I retreated with each step he took forward. What's your big plan? Kill us both and destroy the recipe book? Something like that, he said, advancing on me. I was almost back to the elevator. You're not going to get away with this, I said, although it was totally possible he could. Claire should be here any minute. She's a very jealous girlfriend, and without her meds, who's to say she won't go crazy and kill both of you for flirting with me, he said. If you want the book, go get it, I said, throwing it over to the far side of the room. When he ran to retrieve it, I ran over and untied Ruby. Ouch, 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 she shrieked as I ripped the duct tape off. On the plus side, you won't have to get waxed this month, I replied. Doesn't everyone wax in concentric circles around their ankles, wrists, and mouth? Yes, so excited about all the money I just saved, she said, rubbing the irritated skin from where I just ripped off the tape. This really puts a damper on solving Operation Mercury Retrograde, I said. Finding the killer wasn't as great as I envisioned it to be. I could already hear Ruby getting ready to give me a big I told you so lecture about how dangerous this was. You know the first rule of Operation Mercury Retrograde, right? asked Ruby. That we only use the code name when talking to other people? I asked. I had no idea what she was getting at. Grant had the book and was coming closer to us. Well, my first thought was to just sit here and not try anything to fight our future killer, said Ruby. Oh, right. We should do the opposite of our first inclination, which was to be cowardly and wait for the bullet to kill us. Ruby was getting down low. Her goal was to attack from below, so I should attack from high. I took a big inhale, hoping she would understand that was the cue, and rushed towards Grant. Ruby caught on quickly and joined me in pinning down Grant. The gun went off in his hands. I squeezed my eyes shut for some reason, like that might hide me from the bullet. I looked down and saw blood. Was it mine? Was I dead and looking down from above like an angel? I didn't feel hurt. Right then the elevator door burst open and Wesley came bounding through the door with his own gun. Freeze! Police! You're under arrest, Grant Donovan, for the murder of Francine Donovan and Wendy Roberts, said Wesley. Four more police officers trailed behind him. One of them picked up Grant's gun. What are you doing here? I asked. My job, he said. Ladies, it's safe now. You can get off him, he said. The officers each grabbed one of us and lifted us off Grant. Oh no! Ruby's been shot! I screamed. Chapter 28 I've only been to a hospital twice before in my life. The first time was when Ruby and I were playing chicken in the woods. There was a huge ravine and she dared me to jump it even though the current in the river below was crazy strong. We were only ten at the time, so any current was like a tsunami to us. I made it across. Ruby didn't. Luckily, I was already pretty tall by then, and a strong swimmer. I jumped in after her and saved her, but I cracked my head open in the process, and to this day, I still have a cowlick there where no hair ever grew again. The second time was the Brittany Westerhide incident. Brittany was Clover Creek High's golden girl. She was prom queen, captain of the cheerleading squad, and the original mean girl. Our senior year, she targeted Ruby as her next victim and made her life miserable. 
That was pretty much the theme of our entire senior year. When Brittany was unable to get Ruby cut from the cheerleading squad, she decided to take her out for medical reasons. At one of our practices, Brittany told everyone to purposely not catch Ruby from her pyramid double-tuck jump. While everyone backed out, I was the only one to break Ruby's fall, thereby breaking my collarbone, elbow, and wrist. This was the first time Ruby was the patient and I the panicked bystander outside. Ruby had a shoulder wound, which, according to every single Hallmark Mystery Channel show, meant it was not life-threatening. I'd never seen so many Hardison employees in my life. Everyone from the second, third, and fourth floor was there, including the receptionist. I wondered which one was her late-night takeout dinner companion. I was sitting with Mr. and Mrs. Hardison in the waiting room when the doctor came out. She's going to be okay. It was a clean shot that went straight through. I stitched her up and she's in recovery right now. You should all go home. She won't be allowed any visitors until tomorrow. Everyone heaved a collective sigh of relief and started hugging each other. Even Wesley showed up in the corner. Wesley came over and pulled me aside. Did you come over here for a big I told you so? I asked. No, I'm pretty sure Ruby has that waiting for you when she wakes up, he said. That was so true. Is the bad guy behind bars? I asked. It felt nice knowing it wasn't me for once. He totally doctored those security cameras, didn't he? That's why his alibi checked out. Yes, he thought he deserved half of Frosted, but it was barely breaking even as a cupcake shop, so he wanted Francine to sell it so we could finally get what was his, he said. At last, it was over. And what about Wendy? I asked. Grant told Wendy to alter Francine's will, to announce you the new beneficiary of everything, thereby making you look even guiltier. You were just in the wrong place at the wrong time when you got pulled over with the dead body, so Grant figured he'd pin the whole murder on you. Wendy grew a conscience and planned to confess, so Grant killed her and pinned it on you again, said Wesley. Isn't it funny? The other Lockwood saved me. Not you, but Chloe. If she hadn't cracked that safe and found the book, Grant would have gotten away with it, I said. Yes, we Lockwoods are pretty amazing, said Wesley. How did you know to come to Ruby's office with all of those other police officers? I asked. Or at all. It was a miracle that he showed up when he did. I got that court order to track Claire's phone GPS, and I already had yours. So when you didn't come to the police station right after we hung up, I saw that you were at Ruby's, and Claire was en route to Ruby's too. It seemed like too weird of a coincidence. I called in the cavalry, and that was that, he said. Well, I've never been so happy to be under police surveillance, I said. It didn't seem like you really needed me. I'm very impressed that you managed to save yourself, he said. Yep, even without those self-defense lessons you promised me, I said. I never promised to give you self-defense lessons, he said. Well, maybe you should have, I said. I could have escaped sooner. I had no idea why, but I burst out crying. So much for my tough girl demeanor. It was all too much. The stress of being arrested for murder, not once, but twice and then all of the accusations from the reporter and the hidden safe and the talking appliances, not to mention Ruby and I almost dying. Wesley pulled me into his arms and held me. It wasn't the same signature bear hugs that Ruby gave, but it felt just as nice. He smelled like the original sandalwood I remembered from when he first pulled me over, and like I suspected earlier, he was built like a tank. It was like hugging a rock. It's all over now, he whispered, patting my head. He wanted to give you a ticket for parking illegally on the curb tonight, but I wouldn't let him, said Grandpa Lockwood. He was there with Gwendolyn. We both giggled at that. I let go of Wesley and both Gwendolyn and Grandpa Lockwood gave me a small hug. Well, thank you for that. 
I wonder how I could repay you? I asked, already planning on the cupcake batch I would whip up tomorrow. I told you she was innocent, said Gwendolyn. And when you're feeling up to it, I have some blind dates for you. She probably shouldn't be dating right away. She's been through quite an ordeal, said Wesley. He liked me. Right, and I'm going to be so busy with reopening Frosted and getting settled into the new house and training the cat. I said, nodding my head in agreement. And I promised you some self-defense lessons, which are very important to master before going on any dates, said Wesley. Gwendolyn squinted her eyes, focusing on us. I see, she said. But I know someone who's excited to go on blind dates right away, I said, motioning towards Ruby's hospital room. Chapter 29 One month later. I couldn't believe the day finally arrived when we were ready to reopen Frosted under its new name, Frosted Misfortunes. Lucky was cruising around the booths, making sure everything was in order. I registered Frosted Misfortunes as an official cat cafe, so I wouldn't violate any health codes by bringing him to work with me. The Lockwood ladies were my first customers of the day. Chloe and her grandmother Gwendolyn came in as soon as I opened. Good morning, ladies, I said. This place looks great. I love what you've done with it, said Gwendolyn. That was a huge compliment coming from Gwendolyn. She had extremely conservative taste, as did all of the clover leaves. But luckily, Gwendolyn declared Frosted Misfortunes as the official and exclusive bakery for all clover leaf sponsored events, which pretty much included all the events, as far as this town went. This kind of reminds me of the decor inside my old job at Whitaker Real Estate Offices, said Chloe. I hired Niles' mother to redecorate the entire bakery, so that was an accurate guess. It now had a nice, simple, modern look to it. Soft pastels were added to brighten it up and make it more inviting. She also brought in a ton of plants to imbue it with more of a Hanging Gardens of Babylon vibe. Her domineering take-charge attitude was just what I needed for dealing with vendors and contractors. She actually turned out to be a real asset at helping me get price breaks and deals on everything. Plus, I think it secretly made her happy to wipe out all of Francine's previous handiwork and recreate it into her own vision. Melinda moved into my old apartment in San Diego and set up shop there, where her business was already flourishing with her eccentric taste. I decided to stay in Clover Creek and make it my home. Old job! Are you returning to San Diego? I asked. No, I've decided to stay. I start my new apprenticeship with a local locksmith named Goldilocks on Monday, she said. I swore Lucky could understand English. As soon as Chloe said that, he came bouncing out from behind the display case and crawled up her leg and nuzzled against her cheek. Oh, I said half in surprise and half in question. The last time we talked, Gwendolyn was adamantly against that. Well, in my spare time... I'll be training to take over the clover leaves, she said, and Gwendolyn nodded in agreement. Ah, that sounded like a fair compromise. Lucky stood up on Chloe's shoulder like a parrot. I think you'd make a fabulous clover leaf leader, I said. I handed them both a cupcake and grabbed one myself. Here's to new beginnings in Clover Creek, I said, holding my cupcake up for a toast. Gwendolyn and Chloe tapped their cupcakes against mine, and we all ate in celebration. The door to Frosted opened and Ruby came in. Don't you dare toast to anything without me, she said, her arm still in a sling. Just in time, said Gwendolyn. As the new head of the Cloverleafs, it's important that Chloe take over all my important skills, especially matchmaking. After Grant went to jail... All of his dealership assets were liquidated, and Ruby received most of the cash due to the fraudulent insurance claims she had to pay out. 
we decided to go into business together, with Ruby as a silent partner. She used all of the cash to invest in Frosted, since Francine's bank accounts were all zeroed out. Another consequence of the dealership shutting down was losing all the handsome salesmen she collected business cards from. They moved away to work at other dealerships in different parts of the country. I have some prospects I'll text you later today, said Chloe. What about your late night takeout guy at the office? I asked. She was so gaga crazy over him. Didn't you hear? He was in cahoots with Grant. That's why he was staying in the office so late every night. It wasn't to flirt with me, but to file incorrect paperwork on Grant's behalf, she said. Ouch! I knew exactly how she felt being duped. Sorry to hear that. I know you really liked him, I said, handing her a turtle cheesecake pecan stuffed cupcake. Well, now that the clover leaves are on the job, that'll never happen again, said Gwendolyn. From now on, everyone gets vetted by the clover leaves before we even think about letting them open a door for us, I said. Tessa came through with her camera crew in huge spotlights. Hi, everyone. You're live on 10 Minutes with Tessa, and we're here today to celebrate the grand reopening of Frosted Misfortunes, previously known as Frosted. As a new owner, are there many changes that you'll be making, Ava? Asked Tessa, passing the mic in front of me. Three cupcakes for all men in blue and our favorite reporters, I said. We also host bridal showers, baby showers, corporate events, and more in our fishbowl. I pointed towards the all-glass enclosed side room. The apologies from Tessa were overwhelming after Grant was arrested. She was still more of a frenemy than true ally, but she did have her moments, and she promised to cover the grand reopening. And is it true that Frosted and Francine's house were originally gifted to her alma mater, a Swiss boarding school? So technically none of this was ever intended to go to you? She asked. Yes, that is true. However, the Swiss boarding school said they received an anonymous donation that specified the only requirement was to keep both Frosted and the house. It was weird. Like, really weird. I wanted to look further into it, but Ruby made me promise not to. She used the I Got Shot card. I think her exact words were, The last time you looked into something, I ended up in the hospital with a bullet wound. Plus, she was afraid I might jinx it. In the end, I had too much work to do to get Frosted ready for the reopening. Charles checked everything out and said it was all on the up and up. I was finally the owner, free and clear, of both Frosted and the mansion. Well, I have great news for you, said Tessa, practically beaming. What's that? I asked. I found your mystery beneficiary. It's your ex-fiancé, Ben. We all dropped our mouths open at that. I knew it was wrong to shoot the messenger, but there was nothing I wanted more than to throw some cupcakes at Tessa's smug face. She got me. She got me good, right on national TV. Do you have any comment? Asked Tessa, practically smirking. Just that we're closing up early today so that I'm not late for my daily self-defense classes. So make sure to get here before 3 p.m. today if you'd like to enjoy some stuffed cupcakes from the new Frosted Misfortunes. This has been Cupcakes and Chaos, Frosted Misfortunes Book 1. Written by Lisa Seifert. Narrated by Trista Shea. Copyright 2020 by Lisa Seifert. Production Copyright 2021 by Lisa Seifert and Whiskered Mysteries.